Side 15, Phantom, by Terry Goodkind. Continuing on page 458. The way I figure it, there is probably no better way to ferret out men who can see you than to have you walk by them, showing them all you have to offer. His gaze roamed the length of her before returning to her eyes. Believe me, if they can see you, there is no chance they will fail to make themselves known. We have no doubt whatsoever that if they can see you, like that innkeeper or that girl could see you, and they see you like this, then they will drop whatever they're doing and come out to pay you a kindly greeting. He laughed heartily at his own joke. No one else in the tent so much as cracked a smile, but he didn't seem to care. Finally, his fit of laughter died out. With all the men we have, I would bet that we are bound to net us a few who can see you. Among this many men, there are bound to be more anomalies, as Ulyssia put it. He cocked his head toward her. Then we will have guards that you can't sneak up on or sneak past, the way you did the others. You see, darling... You made a tactical mistake. You should have kept that trick for a better chance to escape. Now you wasted it. She hadn't wasted it. She had done what she had done to save Jillian's life. Kaylin knew that she had no chance at freedom for herself, but at least she had given that gift to Jillian. There was no benefit to saying so, though, so she didn't dispute what he thought had gained him an advantage in the game he was playing with her. Kaylin could think of nothing to say that would talk him out of such a plan. Her only hope now was to remain invisible, but she didn't feel at all invisible. She suddenly felt as if, when she walked out of the Emperor's tent, every man in camp would be able to see her. She could already feel millions of lewd men leering at her. Jagang gestured. Ulyssia, Armina, you will go along, but hang back a goodly distance. If any man can see her, I don't want them to notice you two and go all shy before they have a good chance to make themselves known to us. I want any men who can see her to be eager enough and bold enough to drop whatever they're doing to come and investigate our fine young lady here. They both bowed and as one said, Yes, Excellency. Jagang lost his cheerful pretense and turned menacing. Now get going. Make a big circle to the right, through the camp, to that rock formation, and then continue the circle on around back to here. Move, woman. Kalen padded across the soft rugs to the carpet hanging over the doorway. She could feel his leering gaze on her. She pushed the carpet aside and slipped through the opening. Outside, facing the sprawling camp, she went stiff with dread. She forced herself, trembling every step, to walk among the hulking brutes near the Emperor's tent. Tears stung her eyes, she felt humiliated and completely naked to all the men in camp. She paused at the first defending ring of soldiers, terrified to go out among the men beyond. She wanted to scream with fury, with mortified embarrassment. She felt trapped by those who controlled her. She couldn't make her legs take another step. She looked back over her shoulder. Emperor Jagang was standing just outside his tent, holding by the hair the woman he had threatened to torture. She was in helpless tears. Kalin had done something hard to save Jillian's life. She decided that she would devote herself to doing this to save the life of the woman Jagang now held under such terrible threat. She, too, was a slave who had no choice in her life. Only Kalin could make a choice that would spare the woman terrible suffering. Kalin turned back to the pandemonium of the camp and started out. The ground was rough, and she had to step carefully to avoid not only rocks and bits of broken gear, but fresh manure as well. 
she reminded herself that none of these men could see her. She paused at another defensive line where Big Brute stood guard. She peeked up at the man beside her. He didn't notice her, but instead watched those out beyond. So far, none of the men could see her. She looked back and saw the sisters waiting for her to get farther away. Jagang was still holding the woman by the hair. Kalin understood the message and, without wasting a moment, started moving again. She saw horses nearby and briefly contemplated making a run for them. In her mind, she envisioned jumping up onto the back of a horse and galloping away, escaping out of the camp altogether. She knew it was only a fantasy. The sisters would unleash a torrent of pain through the collar and bring her down. What's more, the woman Jagang held would die. He was not a man to make idle threats. He carried them out, lest anyone ever think he was the kind to bluff. Kalin knew such an escape was impossible, but thinking about it took her mind off all the men so close all around her, off all the filthy hands she couldn't help staring at. She felt completely vulnerable and exposed, she stood out among the sprawling encampment like an alabaster water lily blossom stranded in the middle of a vast, reeking mud flat. She moved quickly, reasoning that the sooner she made the circuit, the sooner she would be back in the sheltering protection of the tent. It was a terrible thought, Jagang's tent being her protection. That terrible man, her security. At least she would be out of sight again, and right then, that was all she wanted. It became the focus of her thoughts. Make the distance to the rocks and make it back. The sooner she did it, the sooner she would be back inside. Unless there were men out in this mass of soldiers who could see her. It only made sense. She had run across two people who could see her, and that was among a small sampling of people. There were millions of men in this army. The chances were that she would run across men who would see her only too well. What would she do then? She glanced back over her shoulder. The sisters looked like they were way back across a river of men. What if a man grabbed her and pulled her down, dragged her away? The sisters finally started following after, but they were a long way back. Kalin worried about what would happen if men could see her and grabbed her. What if a whole group of men all could see her? Would the sisters be able to pull a whole mob off her? Besides, the sisters were a long way back. Kalin worried how far a rape would go before the sisters showed up. But the sisters could cast magic. Surely they would not allow men to ravish her. She wondered what made her have any such confidence. Jagang. He wanted her for himself. He was not the kind of man to let underlings have his prize of prizes. He would want to take her himself. The thought of him on top of her ran a shiver of icy dread through her. The immediate problem, though, was not Jagang. It was these men. In one fluid movement... As she passed a soldier with his back to her, she lifted a knife from the sheath at his hip. She made the motion fit in with the swing of her arms so that if the sisters were looking, they wouldn't have seen what she had done. The man glanced around, having felt something. Even though he looked directly at her for an instant, his gaze moved on and he went back to his conversation. The men she had been moving among were all still the outer rings of the many layers around the Emperor's compound, but she was now moving out beyond, in among the regular soldiers. They were drinking, laughing, gambling, and telling stories around fires. Horses were picketed among them. Wagons stood about at various places. Some men had already pitched crude tents, while others were content to cook over fires or sleep. She saw two women being taken into the tents. None went cheerfully. 
She saw other women emerge only to be snatched up by waiting men and dragged to the next tent. Kaylin remembered Jagang mentioning sending the sisters out to the tents as punishment. Hearing the women in those tents weeping made Kaylin sweat in dread of her own fate when she finally returned to Jagang's tent. As terrifying a circumstance as being taken into those tents with those men would be, Kaylin could not feel sorry for the sisters. If they ended up being raped by these men, it was not enough punishment to Kaylin's mind. They deserved far worse. One of the nearby men glanced up at her. Kalin could see recognition flash in his eyes, eyes that fixed on her. He saw her. His mouth fell open, thrilled with his luck at what sort of woman had just stumbled into his arms, so to speak. As he rose up, before he was fully erect, Kalin sliced his belly open from one side to the other as she swiftly continued to move past as if nothing had happened. The man, his face registering the shock of it, weakly tried to catch his guts as they spilled out in a heavy mass. He toppled over and crashed to the ground while making panicked grunts that weren't noticed as anything more than the other raucous noise all around. When he hit the ground, his insides spilled out. Men turned to look, some shocked, some laughing, all of them thinking the man had just lost a knife fight. Kaylin didn't slow or look back. She kept moving, without breaking her stride, reminding herself of her task. Get to the rock, get back to the tent, make the circuit, do as she had been told. As a man appeared out of the crowd and rushed up to her, she tightened her muscles and used his momentum to drive the knife up under his ribs, ripping his vital organs apart. The lifting cut, like a punch, along with his descending weight, drove her fist through the gash and into his warm insides. By the way he went down like a sack of sand without so much as a word, she was pretty sure that she had managed to cut open his heart. As a memento of the brief encounter, she now wore a glove of his blood. She wondered where she had learned to do such things. It felt like they came instinctively to her, the way emotions just came naturally without the need to summon them. She couldn't remember anything about herself, but she remembered how to use a weapon. She supposed that she should just be glad she could. In making her way out into the sea of men, she came to a dense island of activity. Men had all drawn back to leave an open field in the center of a low area, and teams of men were playing Jala there. Soldiers gathered all around in the tens of thousands, cheered on one team or the other. The game was a violent affair, with the point man encountering the worst of it from the other team. When he went down bloodied, half the men surrounding the field cheered wildly. Well, well, a man to her left said. Looks like a fine whore come to pay me a visit. As she began to turn toward him, another man to the right seized her wrist, twisted, and had her knife. In an instant, both men were on her, grabbing at her, pulling her back away from the crowd gathered to watch the Jala game. Kalin fought to get free, but they were a lot stronger and had taken her by surprise. She silently raged at herself for being caught unawares like that. None of the men around noticed anything at all. They couldn't see her. She was invisible to them. But not to these two, who pressed in tight to hide her from their fellow soldiers, lest they have to fight for their fresh prize. She might as well have been alone with these two. One of them shoved his hand between her legs. She gasped at the sudden violation. As he leaned in to grope her, she managed to get her wrist free. In an instant, she whipped her arm around and slammed her elbow into the center of his face, breaking his nose. He fell back screaming, blood gushing across his cheeks and eyes. The other man laughed, seeing it as his opportunity to have her for himself. He changed direction, 
pulling her along, holding both of her wrists together in one of his powerful hands as he used the other to explore the spoils. Kalin struggled and twisted, but he was far too big and husky for her. She couldn't get any leverage to break free of his grip. You're a feisty one, he said into her ear. What did you think, that you could avoid your sacred duty to the soldiers of the order? Think you're too good to serve in the tents? Well, you're not. Here's my tent, so it's time to do your duty. Kalin twisted around to try to bite him as he dragged her toward an empty tent not far away. He backhanded her. The blow stunned her. The noise of the encampment seemed to fade away. She couldn't make her muscles do as she wished, couldn't make them resist the grimy soldier as he pulled her toward the tent. Suddenly, Kalin saw Sister Ulysses' face. She had never before been glad to see one of the sisters, but she was now. The sister distracted the man's attention from Kalin for an instant, then pressed her fingers to the side of his forehead. Finally free, Kalin jumped back as her captor dropped to his knees, clutching his fists to his head as he cried out in pain. Get up, Sister Ulyssia told him, or I'll do worse by far. He stood on wobbly legs. You are ordered immediately to the Emperor's tent to serve as a special guard. The man looked confused. Special guard? That's right. You will be guarding this troublesome young lady for his excellency. The man gave Kalin a dangerous look. It would be my pleasure. Pleasure or not, get moving. That's an order from Emperor Jagang himself. She pointed a thumb back over her shoulder. That way. The soldier dipped his head in a bow, obviously fearful of her ability with magic. He regarded the sister with a kind of wary, if unspoken, loathing. These men obviously did not hold those with the gift in high regard. I'll be seeing more of you soon, the man promised Kalin before he ran off to do as he'd been ordered. Kalin saw Sister Armina giving the man with the broken nose the same instructions. She spoke in a voice that Kalin couldn't hear over the riot of cheering, but the man clearly heard her because he stiffened with fear, bowed to her, and ran off after the first man. Sister Ulyssia turned her attention back to Kalin. Tears won't do you any good. Now get going. Kalin didn't argue. The sooner it was over, the better. She started out at once, counting herself fortunate to have eliminated two of the four who had so far been able to see her. She had to skirt the Jala game that was working the crowd of men to a fever pitch of excitement. She paused at one point to rise up on her tiptoes and make sure where the rock was. Then she headed for it. By the time she had made it back to Jagang's tent, they had collected five men. All of them stood outside the tent awaiting orders, including the one nursing his broken nose. He glared at her as she walked past him, ushered through the tent's opening by the two sisters. Kalin had managed to quickly arm herself after Sister Ulyssia had rescued her the first time. This time, though, Kalin had seen to it that she secured two knives, one for each hand. She held the hilts to her fists, with the blades lying up against the insides of her wrists, so that the sisters, following her at a good distance, hadn't been able to see them. Kalin had managed to kill another six men who could see her without the sisters realizing what she had done. It hadn't been hard. They saw no threat coming from a naked woman. They were dead wrong. With their guard down, she had been able to thrust her weapons home quickly and without a fuss. There was so much noise, confusion, drinking, yelling, and fighting in the camp that the sisters never noticed the men Kalin had taken out. When she hadn't been able to dispatch the men who could see her, either because Sister Ulyssia or Armina were too close, or because they were watching closely and rushed in to rescue her and give the soldiers their new assignments as special guards, Kalin always let her knives slip to the ground and vanish under the throng of soldiers so that the sisters wouldn't suspect what she had been up to. 
Being invisible to almost all the men, it had been easy enough to get more knives throughout the long, nerve-wracking walk among the soldiers. Once she was inside the tent, Jagang threw Kalin's clothes at her. Get dressed. Rather than questioning his reasons for a command she hadn't expected, she wasted no time in complying with his orders. Under the unwavering dark gaze of the man, it was a huge relief to finally have her clothes back on. It didn't seem to lessen his obvious interest in what he had seen, though. His attention finally turned to the two sisters. I've instructed our new guards in their duties. He smiled in a way that made both sisters swallow in dread. What with some guards to take the load off your backs, you will have some free time to spend in the tents, being on your backs for a different duty. But, Excellency, Sister Armina said in a trembling voice, we have done everything you requested. We got the men. You think that because you do as you're told for a short time, I will forget the years you have been running around plotting and scheming to do me in? You think I will so easily forget your neglect of your duty to others, your obligations to the cause of the order, your moral responsibility to sacrifice your worldly wishes to the good of others? It wasn't that way, Excellency. Sister Armina dry washed her hands as she searched for words that might save her. Yes, we were shamefully selfish, I admit, but we had no direct thought to harm you. He snorted a laugh. You don't think freeing the keeper of the underworld would harm me? You don't think turning mankind over to the keeper of the dead would be against me, against the ways of the order, against the creator? Sister Armina fell silent. She knew she had no argument. Kalin had always thought of the sisters as vipers, but now they were writhing before someone with hide too tough to sink their fangs into. Sister Ulyssia and Armina were attractive women. Kalin had the feeling that their looks were only going to make it worse for them out among the animals that were the Imperial Order Army. I have control of the... Jagang caught himself, almost using her title, of Kalin, through the collar, through your ability. You don't need to be present for me to call upon that power if necessary. Just alive. I will instruct the men that I don't want you two murdered while they are enjoying your feminine charms. Thank you, Excellency, Sister Ulyssia managed in a small voice. She was gripping her skirts in white-knuckled fists. Now there are two men waiting outside who have been instructed in what they are to do with you both. Go with them. He grinned at them like death itself. Have a good night, ladies. You deserve it, and many more. As they left the tent, Kalin stood in the center, awaiting a similar fate. Jagang stepped closer to her. Kalin thought she might either faint from dread or be sick at the thought of what was about to happen to her. Chapter 45 Kalin stared at the pattern in the carpet on the ground at her feet. She didn't want to look defiantly into Jagang's black eyes. A show of bravery at the moment, she knew, would serve little purpose. When she had been made to walk while the sisters rode, she had always told herself that it would make her stronger for a time when she would need strength. In much the same way, she wouldn't now use her resolve for a useless show of defiance. Railing against her captor and what he was about to do to her when she knew that she could do nothing to stop it would only be squandering her strength. She wanted to save her hot rage until the time was right. And that time would come. She promised herself that such a time would come. Even if it was when she threw herself into the teeth of death itself, she would unleash her smoldering anger at those who did this to her and all the other innocent victims of the Imperial Order. She saw Jagang's boots appear right in front of her. She held her breath, expecting him to seize her. She didn't know what she would do when it actually happened, 
how she would be able to endure what she knew he was going to do. Her gaze lifted just a little, just enough to see where his knife was on his belt. He rested the heel of his hand on the knife handle. We're going out, he said. Kalin looked up with a frown. Out? For what purpose? Tonight is a night of Jala de Jin tournaments. Different units of our soldiers have teams. There are nights devoted to the tournaments. It lifts the hearts of our forces to have their emperor there to witness how they play the game. Men are also gathered from all over the conquered parts of the New World and given the chance to join in challenging other teams. It is a great opportunity for them to begin to fit into the new culture we bring to defeated lands, to become part of the fabric of the Order, to participate in our ways. The best players can sometimes become heroes. Women fight over such men. The men of my team are all such men, heroes who never lose. Crowds of women wait for these men after the games, eager to open their legs for them. Ja-la players have their pick of any woman. Kalin noted that while as Emperor Jagang probably had the pick of many women who would want to be close to such a man of authority and power, he would rather force himself on her. He would rather take what was not offered, have what he had not won as a result of merit. Tonight, some of those teams play for ranking. They all hope that one day they might have the chance to play my team in a grand contest for top honors. My team plays the best of the best once or twice a month. They never lose. There is always a burning hope among each new group of challengers that they will be the ones to defeat the best, the Emperor's team, and be crowned champions of the games. There would be many rewards for such a team, not the least of which would be the most beautiful of the women, who now are eager only to be with the men of my team. He seemed to enjoy telling her about the habits of such women, as if he were generalizing about all women and in so doing, telling her that he thought she was at heart the same. She would rather open a vein. She ignored the innuendo and asked him something else instead. If your team is not playing, why do you wish to watch? Surely a man such as you would not bestow your precious presence on the faithful on such a regular basis just to be generous. He peered at her with a puzzled look, as if it were a strange question. To see their strategy, of course, to learn the strengths, the weaknesses of those who will become the opponents of my team. His sly smile returned. That is what you do. Size up those who might be your opponents. And don't try to tell me that you don't. I see your gaze go to weapons, to the layout of rooms, to the position of men, cover, and escape routes. You are always searching for an opportunity, always watching, always thinking of how to defeat those who stand in your way. Jala Dijin is much the same way. It is a game of strategy. I've seen it played. I'd say that the strategy is secondary, that it's primarily a game of brutality. Well, if you don't enjoy the strategy, he said with a smirk, then you will no doubt enjoy watching men sweat, strain, and struggle against one another. That's why most women like to watch Ja La. Men enjoy it for the strategy, the give and take of the contest, the chance to cheer their team to victory, and to imagine being such men themselves. The women like to watch half-naked bodies and sweat-slicked muscles. They like to watch the strongest men prevail, dream of being the desire of conquering heroes, and then scheme of ways to make themselves available to such men. Both sound pointless to me, either brutality or meaningless rutting. He shrugged. In my tongue, Ja La Dijin means the game of life. Is not life a struggle, a brutal contest, a contest of men and of sexes, 
Life like Jala is a brutal struggle. Kalin knew that life could be brutal, but that such brutality did not define life or its purpose, and that the sexes were not rivals, but meant to share together in the work and joys of life. To those like you it is, she said. That's one difference between you and me. I use violence only as a last resort, only when it's necessary to defend my life, my right to exist. You use brutality as a tool of fulfilling your desires, even your ordinary desires, because except by force you have nothing worthwhile to offer to exchange for what you want or need, and that includes women. You take, you do not earn. I'm better than that. You don't value life or anything in it. I do. That's why you must crush anything good, because it puts the lie to your nothing of a life, shows by contrast how you do nothing but waste your existence. That's why you and those like you hate those like me, because I'm better than you and you know it. Such a belief is the mark of a sinner. To consider your own life meaningful is a crime against the Creator as well as your fellow man. When she only glared at him, he arched an eyebrow with an admonishing look as he leaned a little closer. He held up a thick finger, adorned with a plundered gold ring, before her face to mark an important point, as if lecturing a selfish, headstrong child who was within an inch of getting a well-deserved thrashing. The fellowship of order teaches us that to be better than someone is to be worse than everyone. Kalin could only stare at such a vulgar ideology. That pious statement of hollow conviction gave her a sudden true insight into the abyss of his savage nature and the vindictive character of the order itself. It was a concept that had abandoned the distant foundation upon which it had been built, that all life equally had the right to exist for its own sake in order to justify taking life for the order's own contrived notion of the common good. Within that simple-sounding framework of an irrational tenet, he had just unwittingly revealed everything. It explained the depravity of his whole cause and the determinant emotions driving the nature of those monstrous men massed outside, ready to kill anyone who would not submit to their creed. It was a dogma that shrank from civilization, praised savagery as a way of existence, and required constant brutality to crush any noble idea and the man who had it. It was a movement that drew to it thieves who wanted to think themselves righteous, murderers who wanted holy absolution for the blood of innocent victims that drenched their souls. It assigned any achievement not to the one who had created it, but instead to those who had not earned it and did not deserve it, precisely because they did not earn it and did not deserve it. It valued thievery, not accomplishment. It was anathema to individuality. At the same time, it was a frighteningly sad admission of a rotting core of weakness in the face of life, an inability to exist on any level except that of a primitive beast, always cowering in fear that someone else would be better. It was not simply a rejection of all that was good, a resentment of accomplishment. It was, in fact, far worse. It was an expression of a gnawing hatred for anything good, grown out of an inner unwillingness to strive for anything worthwhile. Like all irrational beliefs, it was also unworkable. To live... Those beliefs had to be ignored to accomplish goals of domination, which in themselves were a violation of the belief for which they were fighting. There were no equals among those of the order, the torchbearers of enforced equality. Whether a Jala player, the most professional of the soldiers, or an emperor, the best, were not simply needed but sought after and highly valued and so as a body they harbored an inner hatred of their failure to live up to their own teachings and a fear that they would be unmasked for it. 
as punishment for their inability to fulfill their sanctified beliefs through adherence to those teachings, they instead turned to the self-flagellation of proclaiming how unworthy all men were and vented their self-hatred on scapegoats. They blamed the victims. In the end, the belief was nothing more than fabricated divinity, unthinking nonsense repeated in a mantra in an attempt to give it credibility, to make it sound sacred. I've already seen the Jala games, Kalin said. She turned away from him. I have no desire to see more of it. He seized her upper arm, pulling her back around to face him. I know you're eager to have me bed you, but you can wait. Right now we are going to watch the Jala games. A lecherous smile oozed onto his face, like greasy muck bubbling up from his festering soul. If you don't enjoy watching the games for their strategy and competition, then you can let your eyes roam over the naked flesh of the rivals. I'm sure that such sights will make you eager for what comes later tonight. Try not to be too impatient. Kalin suddenly felt foolish for protesting any reason to avoid his bed, but the Jala game was out among the men, and she had no desire to go out there again. She also had no choice. She hated being among those vile men. She reminded herself to get a grip on her feelings. The soldiers couldn't see her. She was being silly. He pulled her toward the passageway of the tent, she went without resisting. This was not a time to resist. Outside, the five special guards waited. They all noticed that Kalin was dressed, but none of them spoke. They stood tall, straight, and attentive, looking ready to jump if told to do so. They were obviously on their best behavior before their emperor, wanting to impress him. Kalin guessed that to be better than someone was all right if you were the emperor, and that it wouldn't make him worse than everyone. He fought for a doctrine from which he exempted himself, as did each and every one of his men. Kalin knew better than to point it out. These are your new guards, Jigang told her. We'll not have a repeat of the last incident, since these men can see you. The men all looked pretty content with themselves and the apparently harmless nature of the woman they were to guard. Kalin took a quick but good look at the first man the sisters had brought to task, the partner of the one with the broken nose. With a glance, she evaluated the weapons he carried, a knife and a crudely made sword with two halves of a wooden hilt wired onto the tang, and how graceless he appeared in the way he wore them. In that glance, she knew that they were implements he no doubt used with bravado when slaughtering innocent women and children. She doubted that he had ever used them in combat with other men. He was a thug, nothing more. Intimidation was his weapon of choice. By his self-satisfied smile, he looked unimpressed with her. After all, he had already by himself nearly brought her to task and to his tent. In his mind, he had been only a few steps away from having her under him. You, she said, pointing right between his eyes. You I will kill first. The men all snickered. She swept an appraising gaze over them and their weapons, learning what there was to learn, she pointed at the man with the broken nose. You die second, after him. What about us three? One of the others asked, unable to suppress a chuckle. What order will you kill us in? Kalin shrugged. You will know just before I cut your throat. The men all laughed. Jagang didn't. You would be well advised to take her seriously, the emperor told them. The last time she got her hands on a knife, she killed my two most trusted bodyguards, men a lot better at soldiering than you, and a sister of the dark, all by herself, and all in a matter of a few brief moments. The laughter died away. 
You all will stay on your toes, Jigang said in a low growl, or I will gut you myself if I even think you are being inattentive to your duty. If she gets away under your watch, I will send you to the torture tents and command that your death take a month and a day, that your flesh rot and die before you do. There was no longer any doubt in the men's minds as to the seriousness of Jagang's orders or the value of his prize. A vast escort of hundreds, if not thousands, of the inner and most expert of the emperor's guards formed up around their leader as he strode purposefully away from his tent. The five special guards surrounded Kalin on every side except the side Jagang was on. They all moved out into the camp in a wedge of armor and drawn weapons. Kalin supposed that, as a leader, Jagang was just taking normal precautions against spies. But she thought it was more than that. He was better than everyone else. Chapter 46 By the time they returned to the Emperor's compound and his large tent after the Jala contests, Kalin's level of worry had risen. It wasn't just the obvious dread of being alone with such an unpredictable and dangerous man, or even her near panic over what she knew he intended to do to her. It was all of that, with a sinister undercurrent to his cruelty churning just beneath the surface. There was a flush to his face, a more assertive nature to his movements, an edgy quality to his short comments, a fierce intensity in his inky eyes. Watching the games had put Jagang in an even more violent mood than what she believed was his norm. The games had worked him up. They had excited him in every way. Back at the games, he'd felt that one of the teams had not played to their full potential, had not given it everything they had. He'd thought they were holding back and not putting their all into the contest. When they lost... He had them executed on the field. The crowd had cheered more at that than at the rather tedious play of the game itself. Jagang was hailed for putting the losers to death. The games that followed were played with considerably more passion and on ground soggy from the blood of the beheadings. Ja La was a game in which men ran, dodged, and darted past one another or blocked or chased the man with the heavy ball, the brock, trying to capture it, or attack with it, or score with it. Men often fell or were knocked from their feet. When they did, they rolled across the ground. In the summer heat, without shirts, they were soon slick, not just with sweat, but with blood. From what Kalin could see of the female camp followers watching from the sidelines, they weren't in the least put off by the blood. If anything, it made them only more eager to catch the attention of the players who were now whipping the crowd into a frenzy with their fast-paced, aggressive tactics. In all the rest of the games, after the one resulting in executions, as in the ones previous, the losing teams, since they had at least played with wild determination, were not put to death, but flogged. A terrible whip made up of a number of knotted cords bound together, was used for the penalty. Each of those cords was tipped with heavy nuggets of metal. The men were given one lash for each point by which they lost. Most losing teams lost by several points, but even one lash from that whip ripped open the naked flesh of a man's back. The crowd enthusiastically counted out each lash to each man on the losing team kneeling in the center of the field. The winners often cavorted around the perimeter of the field, showing off for the crowd, while the losers, with bowed heads, received their whipping. It had made Kalin sick to witness such a thing. It had excited Jagang. Kalin was relieved that the games were at last over. But now that she was back inside the Emperor's compound and about to enter his tent, a gnawing sense of dread was eating away at her insides. Jagang was in a temper provoked by violence and aroused by blood. 
Kalin could see in his eyes that he was in no mood to be denied anything. And the only thing left for him that night was her. As the special guards were just about to be posted outside the tent, she spotted a man running into the compound, being followed by a small group of men. Jagang paused in his instructions to Kalin's special guards as the rings of defenders parted to let the man and a gaggle of officers through. When the man came to a breathless halt, he announced himself as a messenger. What is it then? Jagang asked the messenger, scrutinizing the half-dozen men of rank with him. Jagang was not at all pleased to be bothered when he had his mind set on other things. Kalin knew that she was the focus of his brooding thoughts, and that he wanted to get her inside and alone. The time had come, and he was impatient to get at her. He had so far not touched her in any improper manner. He was saving it all up. In much the same way that any city in the path of his army had to wait in agonizing dread for the impending assault, she too felt the stranglehold of overpowering fear as she waited for what she knew was coming. She tried not to imagine what he was going to do to her and what it would be like, but she could not think of anything else any more than she could slow her galloping heart. The messenger handed over a leather tube. It made a hollow thunk when Jagang popped the lid off. With two fingers he extracted a rolled piece of paper. He broke the wax seal, unrolled it, and held it up to read it in the light of the torches, flanking the entrance to his tent. The rings he wore on each finger sparkled in the flickering torchlight. At first frowning, the emperor began to smile as he read. He finally laughed aloud as he looked up at his officers. The army of the Daharan Empire has fled the field of battle. Scouts and sisters alike have all reported the same thing that the Daharans were so terrified of the prospect of facing Jagang the Just and the Army of the Order that they all deserted and have scattered in every direction, proving what faithless cowards they really are. The forces of the Daharan Empire are no more. There is nothing standing between us and the people's palace. The officers cheered their emperor. Everyone was suddenly in a jovial mood, Jagang bestowed his congratulations on the officers for being a part of putting the enemy on the run. As she listened, standing off to the side, while the others all watched Jagang waving the paper and speaking of the end of the long war being at hand, Kalin slowly, carefully lifted a leg until her fingers found the hilt of the knife tucked into her right boot. Making as little movement as possible so as not to draw the attention of the five men who could see her, or Jagang himself, she worked the weapon up out of the boot and into her fist. As soon as it was securely in hand, she retrieved the second knife from the other boot. She tightly grasped the leather-wrapped handle of each well-made weapon, working her fingers to get a secure grip on the hilts. Having weapons in hand filled her with a sense of purpose, banishing her helpless dread at what was in store for her that night. She now had a way to strike at them. She knew that she might not be able to stop Jagang from what he would do to her, but it would not be without a fight. This was her chance to extract a price. She didn't move her head, only her eyes, as she took stock of where each man was standing. Jagang, unfortunately, was not close to her. He had stepped to the messenger and then closer to his officers. Kalin knew that he was far from stupid. If she were to walk up to his side, he would instantly be suspicious. He would know that she would not do such a thing willingly. She also knew that he was an experienced fighter. He would react before she could lunge at him. Having him closer probably wouldn't have done her much good anyway. There were better targets, a better chance for surprise. The five special guards were close to her left, the officers a little farther away to her right. 
The officers couldn't see her. Beyond was a camp of men who couldn't see her. But even though the officers couldn't see her, the five could. And as soon as she moved, she would have only an instant before they reacted. She knew that she could draw a lot of blood, but there was little chance she would escape. The alternative was to submit meekly to her impending rape. Kalin summoned her rage. She gripped the hilts of the knives tighter. This was a chance to strike back against her captors. With a straight-in, direct, and mighty thrust, she slammed the long knife in her left hand into the center of the chest of the special guard she had promised to kill first. Some dim part of her mind noted his stiff surprise. Just beyond him, the eyes of the man with the broken nose went wide as he, too, stiffened with shocked surprise. Kalin used the knife planted in the chest of the first man as an anchor for leverage. With that grip to help her, she spun around the man already stabbed. At the same time, she brought the knife in her right hand around with her in an arc. The blade slashed open the throat of the man with the broken nose. In two beats of her hammering heart, she had killed them both. Kalin drove her left boot into the first man as he fell in order to pull free the embedded knife and to spring herself in the opposite direction toward the officers. On the third beat of her heart, she hit the first officer like a jaw-la tackle. As she flew into him, she plunged the knife in her right hand deep into his belly, jerking up as she did so to rip him open. At the same time, she stabbed the other knife square into the throat of the man immediately to the side and a little behind the first officer. He had been the ranking officer and the one she was really targeting. She hit him with such force that the blade not only drove through the man's throat, but hitting the space between the vertebrae, pierced all the way through his neck. His spinal cord cut, his entire dead weight dropped straight down so fast that Kalin's grip on the knife twisted her off balance and pulled her with him. At the same time, before she could catch herself or yank the knife back, the power from the collar hit Kalin like a lightning bolt. At the same time, the other three special guards tackled her, taking her the rest of the way off her feet and ramming her face first into the soft ground. With the collar making her arms numb and useless and her legs unable to respond to her wishes, the men had no trouble disarming her. When Jagang shrieked the order, they hauled her to her feet. Kalin panted from the effort of the brief battle. Her heart still raced. Even if she had failed to escape, she wasn't entirely disappointed. She hadn't really thought that her chances of making it were that good to begin with. She had expected, though, to at least kill a couple of officers, and she had accomplished that. She was disappointed only that the special guards had not killed her rather than capture her. Jagang dismissed the confused officers, explaining that it was a bit of magic that had gotten loose. He assured them that he had everything well in hand. They were men used to violence and seemed to take the sudden death of two fellow officers by an invisible hand, if not in stride, at least with a level of self-control, reassured by the demeanor of their emperor. As they made their way out of the emperor's compound, they collected a number of men who rushed in to remove the bodies. The guards who came to see what the commotion was all about were dismayed to see such a murder within their layers of defenses. They all glanced to Jagang to gauge his mood, and seeing him calm, swiftly went about the business of carrying off the four dead men. Once they had departed, Jagang finally turned a glare on Kalin. I see that you were closely watching the games. You appear to have been paying more attention to the strategy than the bare flesh of muscular men. Kalin met the gazes of the three special guards holding her. Just keeping a promise? Jagang slowly let out a deep breath, as if trying to keep from murder himself. You are quite a remarkable woman and a formidable opponent. 
I'm the bringer of death, she told him. He glanced at the four bodies being carried out into the night. So you are. He turned his intense attention to the three men holding Kalin. Is there a reason that I should not send you three off to be tortured? The men, who had been smug about having taken her down, suddenly didn't seem so smug. They glanced nervously at one another. But, Excellency, one of them said, the two men who failed you paid with their lives. The three of us stopped her. We didn't let her escape. I am the one who stopped her he said through barely restrained rage. Oh, he stopped her with the collar she wears around her neck. He considered them silently for a moment, letting his flash of rage calm down a little. But I am called Jagang the Just for good reason. I will allow you three to live for the time being, but let this be a lesson to you. I warned you that she was dangerous. Now perhaps you can see that I know what I'm talking about. Yes, Excellency, the three said over one another. Jagang clasped his hands behind his back. Release her. He passed a withering glare over each man before taking Kalin's arm and leading her back toward the opening of the tent. She was still reeling from the shock of the collar. Her joints ached, her legs and arms burned from inside. She had wondered if Jagang had been telling the truth that he could use the collar without the sisters needing to be present. Now she knew. Without that collar, she might have stood a good chance of breaking free. With it, she didn't. She dared not take Jagang's ability lightly from now on. At least now she knew. Sometimes it was worse to wonder if something would have been possible. I want you three to guard outside my tent tonight. If she comes out without me, you had better stop her. The three soldiers bowed. Yes, Excellency. They no longer looked at all smug. They looked like what they were, men who had just escaped a death sentence. As the men took up their posts, Jagang turned a grim look on Kalin. The last time you only went for a walk among the men. It was a short walk. You saw only a small sampling of my army. Tomorrow, you are going to have a much better chance to see a great many more of my men. And a lot more of those men are bound to see you. I don't know what the anomaly is that Ulysses spoke of, or its cause, but it doesn't really matter to me. What matters is that, like in all things, I intend to use it to my advantage. I intend to see to it that you are well guarded. You will ride again tomorrow, and we will take a tour through the troops. But you are going to do it without your clothes. In that way, you will help find us a goodly supply of new special guards. It should be quite an exciting day. Kalin didn't offer an argument. None would have done any good. She could tell by the careful way in which he explained it that he meant for it to make her uncomfortable. She suspected that her humiliation was only just beginning. Emperor Jagang ushered her in through the opening of his tent as if she were royalty. He was mocking her, she knew. As she moved inside, she could feel the power of the collar release its grip on her. She could at last move her feet and arms on her own, the pain, thankfully, began to fade as well. Inside the tent, it was nearly dark, lit only by candles. They gave the tent a warm glow, making it feel cozy and safe, almost like a sacred place. It was anything but. She felt as if she were being led to her execution. Chapter 47 the slaves who had prepared a late-night sampling of light foods for the emperor were all dismissed. At seeing the look in his eyes, and after having heard the screams of dying men, everyone was only too happy to leave when he growled at them to get out. He watched as they all rushed out, 
and then with a thick finger pressed into the center of her back, Jagang silently steered Kalin past the table with mugs of wine, platters of meats, loaves of dark bread, bowls of nuts, and arrangements of fruits and sweets, escorting her beyond another tapestry hanging before an opening into an inner bedroom within the tent. The bedroom was isolated from the rest of the tent and from the outside by what looked to be padded panels, probably to make it quieter. The walls were also covered with hides and fabric hangings of material woven into muted patterns. The room was warmly decorated with exquisite carpets, a few small pieces of fine furniture, glass-fronted bookcases filled with books, and ornate silver and gold lamps. The bed, covered in furs and satin, had spiraled dark wooden posts at each corner. Kaylin hid her trembling fingers behind her back as she watched Jagang cross the room and remove his lamb's wool vest. He tossed it over a chair at a small writing desk. His naked chest and back were covered in dark, curly hair. He looked like a bear of a man in more ways than one. He looked like anything but a man who would have satin bed coverings. She suspected that he didn't really appreciate such things, but wanted them as a mark of his station. She guessed that he must have forgotten that no one was supposed to be better than anyone else in the order. She guessed that he never considered whether or not the men out in the grimy tents had satin blankets to sleep under. Jagang looked up at her. Well, woman, take off your clothes. Or would you rather I tear them off you? Your choice. Whether I take them off or you rip them off, it is still rape. He straightened and peered at her for a time in the silence within the tent. The camp outside had quieted down considerably, leaving only the muted sounds of distant words to melt together into a dull hum. The men were tired from the day's long march, as well as the excitement of the Jala games, and Jagang had decreed that each day's march would be equally swift until they reached the people's palace, so most of the men were no doubt in their tents sleeping. The only one not quieted down for the night was Jagang. If he was in an excited state after the games, then after her killing the four men, he was on the edge of a rampage. Kalin didn't really care. If he beat her senseless then she wouldn't have to be conscious for what else he was going to do to her. You are mine now, he said in a low, dangerous tone. You belong to me, to no one else, to me alone. I can do whatever I wish with you. If I choose to cut your throat, then it is your duty to bleed to death for me. If I give you to those three men who can see you, then you will submit to them whether you like it or not, whether you do so willingly or not. You belong to me now. Your fate is what I choose for you. You have no choice in what happens to you, none. Everything that happens to you is by my choice alone. It's still rape. He crossed the room in three angry strides and backhanded her, knocking her sprawling. He pulled her up by the hair and heaved her at the bed. The world spun as Kalin tumbled through the air. She only missed the wooden post by inches. Of course it's rape. That's what I want it to be. That's what you have coming. He charged to the bed like an enraged bull. His black eyes were filled with wild storms of shapes. Before she knew it, he was above her. Kalin had it all planned out. She wasn't going to try to stop him, to give him the satisfaction of having to use force to have her. But with him right there on top of her, straddling her hips, those thoughts were lost in the sudden panic of events that she desperately didn't want to happen. She forgot all her plans and desperately tried to push his hands away. But in such a mood, there was no stopping him. She had no strength to begin to match him. He didn't even bother to slap her to make her stop resisting. With one yank, 
he ripped her shirt open. Kalen went still as he stopped, her chest heaving from the effort. He stared down at her breasts. She used the sudden quiet to school herself. She had just killed four brutes. She could do this. This was nothing compared with having a collar around her neck, having her memory stripped away from her, losing her identity, losing who she was, becoming the helpless slave to sisters of the dark and an emperor of a mob of thugs. This was nothing. She was better than to fight him in such a foolish manner, like a schoolgirl trying to slap away the hands of a bully. She didn't fight like that. She wouldn't. She knew better. Yes, she was terrified, but she didn't have to surrender to panic. She was afraid when she'd killed those four men, but she had controlled her fear and acted. She was better than he was. He was only stronger. He could only have her by force. That knowledge gave her a thread of power over him, and he knew it. He could never have her willingly because she was better than he was, and she deserved better by far. He could never have a woman like her except by force because he was weak and worthless as a man. Is your prize of prizes satisfactory, Excellency? she mocked. Oh, yes. Jagang's wicked smile widened. Now take off those traveling pants. When she made no move to comply, he did it for her, opening the buttons one at a time, as if opening something valuable. She lay with her hands at her sides. He hooked his fingers over the waist of her pants, drew them down her legs, and pulled them inside out, getting them off over her feet. He threw them aside as he paused to take in the length of her nearly bare body. Kalin silently bit the inside of her cheek to keep from pushing his hand away in a panic as he glided his hand up her leg, feeling the softness of her thigh. Kalin fought back her tears. She would have given anything not to be there, to be anywhere else but at the mercy of this monster. Now the rest of it, he said in a thick whisper. Take off those underthings. She could tell that pulling her clothes off had only excited him even more, so she did as he told her to do, trying to make it look anything but seductive as she did so. As he watched her following his orders, he sat on the edge of the bed and pulled off his boots. He dropped his pants and kicked them off. As sickened as she was terrified by the sight of him naked, Kalin gave in to weakness and turned her eyes away from him. She wondered how she would ever be able to fall in love and let a man touch her after this. She reproached herself. She was never going to have the chance to fall in love. She was fretting over a problem she would never have. The bed moved under his weight as he climbed up beside her and lay down. He paused to stare at her, to run his hand over her belly. She'd expected it to be a rough touch, a harsh grabbing of her, but instead it was a furtive touch, a slow, measured evaluation of something quite valuable. She didn't expect his gentle approach to last much longer. You really are quite extraordinary, he said in a husky voice, almost more to himself than to her. Perceiving you through the eyes of others just wasn't the same. I can see that now. His tone had changed. The anger had melted away under the heat of his desire for her. He was on the brink of surrendering to uninhibited lust. It's not at all the same. I always knew you were exceptional. But now that I see you like this, you are a remarkable creature. Just remarkable. Kalin wondered what he meant when he'd said that he had perceived her through the eyes of others. She wondered if he meant that he had watched her through the eyes of the sisters. She was struck by an unexpected thought that rattled her. It was the thought of him having watched her undressing when she had thought that only a sister was there. 
It filled her with an icy rage at such a violation. He had been there then, watching her, planning this. But at the same time, she got the feeling that he was talking about something else, too. There was more to his words, more meaning in them, something hidden. Something in the way he'd said it made her think that he was talking about something in her life before the sisters, back before she had lost who she was. She was angry thinking about him watching her through the sisters, but thinking about him seeing her before, in her life that she couldn't remember, rattled her. He abruptly rolled over onto her. You can't imagine how long I've wanted to do this to you. Her breathing and her heartbeat had only just started to settle down. Now it was happening too fast. Her heart was again thumping against her ribs. She wanted to slow him down, to give herself time to think of a way to prevent him from doing this to her. At the feel of his flesh against hers, though, her mind went blank. She couldn't think of any way to stop him. She could only fixate on how badly she didn't want him to do this. She reminded herself of the promises she had made to herself. She was better than him. She should act like it. She said nothing. She stared past him, up at the roof of the tent, illuminated softly in the lamplight. You can't imagine how much I've wanted to do this to you, he said in a suddenly menacing voice. You can't imagine how much you have this coming to you. She shifted her gaze to meet his nightmare eyes. No, I can't. So just get on with it and spare me a speech that means nothing to me since I have no idea what you're talking about. She turned her eyes away to stare off once more. She wanted to show him only indifference. She freed her mind to wander. It wasn't easy with him pressing against her, about to have his way with her, but she did her best to ignore him, to think about other things. She didn't want to give him the satisfaction of a struggle she would only lose. She thought about the Jala game, not because it was something she wished to think about, but because it was fresh enough in her mind to be easy to recall in detail. He abruptly hooked his arms behind her knees and pulled her legs up almost to her chest. It was hard to breathe. It hurt her hip joints to be bent like that with her legs spread that way, but she swallowed back the scream and tried to ignore the way he was trying to control her, to dominate her as he took her. If he knew, this would kill him. Kaylin's eyes turned to him. She could only pull in half a breath against the weight of him. Who are you talking about? She thought that maybe it was her father, a father she didn't remember. Perhaps she had a father who was a commander in the army, and that was why she seemed to know how to fight with a knife. She couldn't imagine who else he would be talking about. She wanted to say something to deflate him, but she thought better of it and remained silent, indifferent. Jagang's mouth was on her ear. His rough stubble scraped painfully against her cheek and neck. His breathing was fast and ragged, he was lost to the lust he was about to unleash on her. If only you knew, this would kill you, he said, obviously and profoundly pleased with the thought. Even more puzzled, she remained silent, her worry building about what he could possibly mean. She thought he was about to resume his obviously lecherous need, but he rested there, holding her legs open, staring down at her. The length of his hairy body pressed against her, on the brink of his intent. With his weight on her, she could hardly get a breath, but she knew that any protest would only be met with disinterest in what discomfort he might be causing her. In a way, she wished he would just hurry up and get it over with. The waiting was making her crazy. She wanted to scream, but she refused to allow herself to. She couldn't help dreading how much he would hurt her 
how long it might last, how it would undoubtedly be repeated not just this night, but in the nights to come. Had not his bull weight been pressing her down into the bed, she would have been trembling in terrible anticipation. No, he said to himself. No, this is not what I want. Kalin was bewildered. She wasn't sure she had heard what she thought she'd heard. He let go of her legs, letting them slip down onto the bed as he pushed himself up on his hands. She wished he weren't lying between her legs so that she could draw them together. No, he repeated, not like this. You don't want this, but it would only be onerous. You would not like it, but nothing more. I want you to know who you are when I do this. I want you to know what I mean to you when I do this. I want you to hate this more than you have ever hated anything in your entire life. I want to be the one to do this to you both. I want to plant the memory of what it means to you in your mind when I plant my seed in you. I want that memory to haunt you for however long you might live, to haunt him forever, every time he looks at you. I want him to learn to hate you for it, to hate what you have come to represent to him, to hate your child, the child that I will give you. To do that, you have to know who you are first. If I do this to you now, it will only dull you to it, spoil the exquisite suffering it would cause you if you knew who you were when it happens to you. So then tell me, she said, almost willing to endure rape to know. A slow, sly smile came to him. Telling you is no good. Words would be hollow, without meaning, without emotion. You have to know. You have to remember who you are. You have to know everything, if this is to truly be rape. And I intend it to be the worst rape you can suffer, a rape that will give you a child that he will see as a reminder, as a monster. Staring down at her, he slowly shook his head with the self-satisfaction of the dimension of his intent. To be that, you have to be fully aware of who you are and everything this will mean to you, everything it will touch, everything it will harm, everything it will taint for all time. He abruptly rolled off her to the side. Kalin drew in a breath that was almost a gasp. He gritted his teeth and his big hand seized her right breast. Don't think you've escaped anything, darling. You'll not be going anywhere. I'm only seeing to it that it's a lot worse for you than this would have been tonight. He chuckled as he squeezed her breast. Worse for him as well. Kalin could not imagine how anything could make it worse than it would have been. She could only imagine that to him, rape cast guilt on the victim. That was the way he thought, the way the order thought that the victim was to blame. He abruptly shoved her out of the bed. She landed painfully on the floor, but at least her fall was broken by somewhat soft carpets. He looked down at her. You will sleep on the floor right there beside the bed. Later I will have you in my bed. He grinned. When your memory returns, when this will destroy you, then I will give you what you deserve, what only I can give you, what only I can do to ruin your life and his. Kalin lay on the floor, fearing to move, fearing that he might change his mind. She felt heady relief that this night she would not have to endure it. He leaned over the edge of the bed, closer to her, peering down at her with his disturbing black eyes. He shoved his big hand between her legs so unexpectedly that she cried out. He grinned at her. 
And if you get the idea of trying to think of a way to sneak away, or worse, to do me in while I sleep, you had better forget it right now. It won't work. All it will get you is time in the tents later on, after I've ruined everything for you. Or you'll see to it that all those men will have you right there where my fingers are. Do you understand? Kaylin nodded, feeling a tear run down her cheek. If you move off those carpets beside the bed tonight, then the power of that collar will stop you. Do you wish to test it? Kaylin shook her head, fearing her voice might fail her. He withdrew his hand. Good. She heard him turn over on his side, facing away from her. Kaylin lay perfectly still. She could hardly breathe. She wasn't sure what had happened this night or what it could all mean. She only knew that she felt more lonely than she had ever felt in her life, at least the part of her life that she could remember. In a strange way, she almost wished he had raped her. If he had, she would not now be trembling in fear of what he'd said, wondering what he'd meant. Now she would have to wake each morning not knowing if that was the day she recovered her memory. When she did, it was somehow going to make that rape all the worse, make everything worse, far worse. Kalen believed him. As eager as he had been to have her, and she knew very well how eager he had been, he would not have stopped at that point unless everything he'd said was true. Kaylin realized that she no longer wanted to know who she was. Her past had just become too dangerous to her for her to want to ever know who she was. If she knew, he would do the worst to her. Better that she remain in oblivion and safe from that. When she heard his even breathing and then his low, rumbling snore, she reached out and with trembling fingers pulled on her underthings and then the rest of her clothes. Despite it being summer, she was shaking with icy dread. She pulled a nearby carpet over her as she lay beside the bed, knowing better than to test his word about the consequences of any attempt to escape. There was no escape. This was her life. She now only hoped to keep the rest of it buried and forgotten. If she ever remembered who she was, then her life would get infinitely worse. She wouldn't let that happen. She would stay behind the dark shroud. This night she was a new person, separated from who she had been. That person had to remain forever dead. She wondered who the man could be that Jagang had talked about. She feared to imagine what Jagang was going to do to him through her that would so destroy him. She forced those thoughts away. That was the old her. That person was gone forever and would remain so. In the depths of loneliness and despair, Kaylin curled up in a ball and wept silently in racking sobs. Chapter 48 Richard walked in a daze, watching the ground before him lit by moonlight. Through that dark, hazy state, only one spark of anything seemed able to burn through. Kalen. He missed her so much. He was so tired of the struggle. He was so tired of trying. He was so tired of failing. He ached to have her back, to have his life with her back, to hold her just to hold her. He remembered the time years before in the spirit house when he had not known that she was the mother confessor and she had been feeling desperately lonely and overwhelmed by the crushing secrets she had to keep. She had asked him to hold her, just to hold her. He remembered the pain in her voice, the pain of needing to be held, comforted. He would give anything to do that now. Stop, a voice hissed at him. Wait. Richard halted. 
He had trouble trying to care what was going on, even though he knew he should. He could read the tension in her posture. She was like a bird of prey, cocking its head, lifting its wings the slightest bit. He couldn't seem to escape the thick lethargy that weighed him down so that he could think it through. Her deportment appeared to be the coiled potential for aggression, but underlying that he saw a hint of fear. He finally managed to summon the concern to try to understand. Then, in the moonlight, he saw what Six was watching, what looked like a vast encampment spread across a valley. Because it was the middle of the night, things were relatively quiet down below. Even through the numb miasma of her presence, Richard felt his level of concern rising. He saw something else, too. Past the valley encampment, he saw, up on the high ground beyond, a castle that he thought he recognized. Come on, Six hissed as she glided past him. Richard trudged after her, once more sinking back into the indifferent haze where all he could think about was Kalen. They walked for what seemed like hours through the countryside in the dead of night. Six was as quiet as a snake, moving, pausing, then moving again as she made her way along minor trails through thick woods. Richard felt comforted by the smell of balsam and fir trees. The moss and ferns delighted him with childhood memories. The delight of the woods evaporated when they walked along cobbled streets, among closed shops, past dark buildings. There were men in the shadows, pairs of them carrying pikes, Richard felt as if he were in a dream, watching it all pass before his mind's eye. He half expected that all he would have to do was imagine the woods again and they would appear. He imagined Kalen. She did not appear. Two men in polished metal armor rushed out of a side street. They fell to their knees before Six, kissing the hem of her black dress. She slowed only slightly for their groveling supplication. They followed along as she continued up the streets, becoming escorts for the night's shadow trailing darkness behind her. Side 16, Phantom, by Terry Goodkind. Continuing on page 491. It all felt so dreamy. Richard knew that he should fight it, but he couldn't make himself care. He cared only about doing as Six told him. He couldn't help himself. Seeing the flowing form of her charmed him. Looking into her eyes captivated him. Hearing her voice bewitched him. Without his gift, she filled that empty void within his soul. Her presence somehow completed him, filled him with purpose. The two guards with them gently rapped on an iron door in a great stone wall. A small door on the inside over a small slit in the iron door opened. Eyes peered out. They widened a little at seeing the pale shadow before them. Richard could hear men on the other side rushing to draw back a heavy bar. The door opened and Six slipped through with Richard in tow. He saw great stone walls in the moonlight, but paid them little heed. He was more fascinated by the snaking shape leading him through the silky night. Once they passed through great doors, men rushed about, opening yet more doors, shouting orders and bringing torches. This way, one man said as he led them into a stone stairwell. Down they went, spiraling and turning ever deeper. Richard felt as if they were being swallowed down the gullet of some great stone beast. As long as Six was taking him, though, he was content to be swallowed. At lower levels, in a dank corridor, the men led her into a gloomy place. Hay was scattered over the slimy floor. Water echoed as it dripped in the distance. Here is the place you requested a guard told her. The heavy doors squealed in rusty protest as he pulled it open. 
Inside, on a small table, he lit a candle with the torch. Your room for the night, Six told Richard. It will be light soon. I will be back then. Yes, mistress, he said. She leaned toward him a little, a thin smile slitting her bloodless face. If I know the queen, she will want to begin immediately. She's quite impatient to say nothing of being impulsive. She will no doubt bring the big men with whips. I expect that before the morning is over, she will have the flesh torn from your back. Richard stared. He couldn't make his mind grasp it all. Mistress? The queen is not only vicious, but vindictive. You are going to be the object of her venom. But not to worry, I still need you alive. You may suffer excruciating agony, but you will live. She turned with a billowing flourish and swept out the door, a shadow swallowed into the darkness. Men funneled out the door after her. The door banged closed. Richard heard the lock click home. Before he knew it, he was suddenly standing alone in a stone room, deserted, forsaken, forgotten. In the silence, terror began to seep into his bones. Why would a queen want to hurt him? What did Six need him alive for? Richard blinked. As the moments passed, he felt his mind working to understand. It felt as if the farther away Six went, the better he could think. After the torches were gone, it was a while before his eyes adjusted to the light of a single candle. He looked around at the stone room. There was only a chair and a table. The floor was stone. The walls were stone. The ceiling had heavy beams. It hit him like a thunderclap. Denna. This was the room where he had been taken when he had first been captured by Denna. He recognized the table. He remembered Denna sitting in that very chair. He looked up, and there, right where he remembered it being, he saw the iron peg. His wrists had been in iron manacles. Denna had hung the chain holding them together over that iron peg. He had hung from it as Denna tortured him with her aegeal. Horrifying images of the night Denna had broken him flashed through his mind. The night she had thought she had broken him anyway. He had partitioned his mind, but he remembered the things she had done to him that night and he remembered what had prompted her to such violence. He had been hanging there when Princess Violet had come in to watch. The princess had decided that she wanted to participate, to join in his torture. Denna gave the little monster her aegeal and showed her how to use it on him. Richard remembered Violet bragging about how she was going to have Kaelin raped tortured and finally killed. Richard had kicked Violet hard enough to shatter her jaw and sever her tongue. This was that room. Richard leaned back against the stone wall and slid down to sit and rest. He needed to think, to figure it out, to understand what was going on. He was leaning against his pack, so he pulled it off and set it in his lap. A thought struck him, and he looked through the pack, pushing his war wizard outfit and gold cape aside until he found the book Baracus had left for him. He thumbed through the pages. They were still blank. If only he hadn't lost his gift, he would have been able to read the book. If he knew how to use his ability, he would have been able to save himself. If only. He suddenly had a thought. He couldn't let them find this book. Six had the gift, some form of it anyway. He couldn't let her see this. Baracus had hidden it for three thousand years. It was meant for no eyes but his. He couldn't fail such a trust. 
he couldn't let anyone know about this book. He got up and paced around the room, searching for any place he could hide the book. There was no place. It was a simple stone room. There were no cubby holes, no niches, no loose stones. There was nowhere to hide anything. As Richard stood in the center of the room, thinking, he looked up and saw the iron peg. He moved through the room, inspecting the beams. There was one beam running parallel to one wall, without much room between the beam and the wall. The beam, like most in the ceiling, had long cracks from when the freshly cut beam had been hewn and then dried. An idea struck him. He immediately pulled the chair over and climbed up on top of it. It wasn't high enough. He pushed the chair out of the way and dragged over the table. After stepping from the chair to the top of the table, he at last was able to reach the iron peg. He wiggled it, but it was stuck tight. He needed that iron peg if he was to hide the book. He hooked his hands over the peg and used all his weight to spring up and down. At last, the peg began to loosen. Working swiftly and using all his muscle, he finally managed to get the peg to wiggle. He wiggled it back and forth until he was able to pull it free. Richard dragged the table over to the side of the room near the dark corner and got up on top. He inspected the crack in the beam, finding a place where it wandered toward the top near the cross planks overhead. He wedged the iron peg into the split in the beam, working it in until it was stuck fast. He retrieved the pack and crammed it up in the tight space between the beam and the wall. Once he had it as high and as flat as he could get it, he shoved it along the beam until it wedged above the iron peg. He tested the pack by tugging on it, but it was stuck tightly in place. It wasn't going anywhere. He hopped down and put the table and the chair back where they had been. The pack was a color similar to the aged oak of the beam, and it was in the shadows. Unless a person was looking for it, he didn't think anyone would notice the pack lodged up where he had put it. Besides, it was the best he could do. Satisfied that he had done everything he could to keep the book and the war wizard outfit from falling into the wrong hands, he lay down on the cold stone floor against the opposite wall and tried to get some sleep. He found it impossible to sleep thinking about what Six had promised him for the next day. Fear gnawed at him, making his mind race. He knew he needed to get some rest, but he just couldn't calm himself. He did feel a sense of relief to be away from Six. He'd lost all track of time since he had been with the Wisps, and Six had been there as he left the ancient trees. He couldn't think when he was with her, couldn't do anything. She consumed his entire mind. His entire mind. He remembered being in this room before with Denna. She had told him that he was to be her pet and that he would be broken to her will. He remembered telling himself that he would let her do what she would, but that he would save a piece of himself, put it away, and not allow anyone into that part, not even himself, until he needed to unlock that safe place and be himself again. He had to do that again. He couldn't allow Six to have all of his mind, the way she had since she had captured him. He could still feel the weight of her influence, the pull of her will. But now that he wasn't in her immediate presence, it seemed so much less by comparison that he felt free of her and able to think able to decide to a degree what he wanted. What he wanted was to be free of the witch woman. He created a place in his mind, as he had done so long ago in this very room, and he locked a part of himself away, a part of his strength, the core of his will, in much the same way he had hidden his pack away in a hidden corner where no one would find it. 
With his new ability to think and to plan, he felt a sense of relief. Even though he could still feel the witch woman's fangs in him, he felt that she no longer had the control she thought she did. He at last was able to relax a little. He thought then of Kalen. Her memory brought a sad smile. He made himself think of happy times with her. He thought about what it felt like to hold her, to kiss her, to be alone in the night with her whispering to him how much he meant to her. Thinking about Kalen, he drifted off to sleep. Chapter 49 Richard woke with a start when he heard the door being unlocked. It was a rude awakening, because Kalen had visited him in his dreams. He didn't remember his dreams, but he did know that those dreams involved her. He felt suffused with her presence, as if he had really been with her, only to be pulled away by being awake. Once he was awake, her essence immediately began draining away. The loss of even her dream presence to cold, empty consciousness was disheartening. The world seemed to have been much richer in his dreams. Even though he didn't remember them, those dreams seemed sweet like music in the distance. Just the feel of them was enough for him to know that he would rather not be in the waking world. Richard started to sit up, only to realize how much he ached from sleeping on the stone floor. Given how foggy his head felt, he doubted that he had more than a few hours sleep. When he saw guards spilling into the stone room, Richard staggered to his feet, trying to stretch his cramped muscles as he did so. Six swept into the room like an ill wind. Against her wiry black hair and flowing black robes, her skin looked ghost-like. Her blanched blue eyes fixed on him as if there was nothing else in her world but him. Richard felt that look come down on him as if it were the weight of a mountain. That look, her presence, crushed his will. He swam in the feeling inundating him. As she came closer, he fought to keep his head above the dark waters of abdication of his will. It felt like fighting for his life in a raging river whose powerful current was pulling him under. Come along. We have to get to the caves. We don't have much time. Rather than ask what she meant by not having much time, a question he doubted he would have been able to summon the strength to ask, he instead asked something else, something for which he had the strength, something still strong in his thoughts. Do you know where Kalen is? Six stopped and turned halfway back to peer at him. Of course. She is with Jagang. Jagang. Richard was stunned senseless. Six not only remembered Kalen, but knew where she was. She seemed pleased by the pain she had so obviously just caused him. Six turned and marched for the door. Now, come on. Hurry. Something was wrong. He didn't know what but he could feel it in her power over him. She held him under her spell of seductive influence like a balmy leash of iron strength, yet it was not the same as before. He could feel that something was different. There was a trace of distress in her demeanor. But that was hardly what concerned him. Jagang had Kalen. He could not imagine how Six even knew who Kalen was because he was so stunned by the meaning of those words, she is with Jagang. If not for the pull of Six dragging him along in her wake, Richard would surely have collapsed to the floor. He could not conceive of a worse nightmare than Jagang having Kalen. His thoughts tumbled in blind panic as he followed the witch woman through the dark twists and turns of the stone passageways. He had to do something. He had to help Kalen. Not only was she in the hands of Sisters of the Dark, but they were in collusion with Richard and Kalen's worst enemy. The thought uppermost in Richard's mind 
other than his fear for Kalin, was that he knew where Jagang was. The emperor was on his way up into Dahara toward the people's palace, and now Kalin was with him. So deep was he in thought that he found that they were outside before he even realized it. He understood at once what had Six so agitated. There were troops pouring into the grounds from every direction. These were the troops they had seen camped in the valley the night before. Six cursed under her breath as she looked for a way to escape the courtyard. At every entrance, soldiers flooded in. The passageway back into the castle, back to the stone room, was already closed off by a wall of men marching into the castle grounds. They were all grimy men, some wearing plate armor, some chain mail, but most wore dark leather for protection. Studded leather straps crossing their chests held leather pouches with supplies or sheathed knives at the ready. Hung on heavy leather belts, they carried axes, maces, flails, and swords. They were as menacing as any men Richard had ever seen. The guards in chain mail shirts covered with red tunics were not foolish enough to make an attempt to stop such men, especially not in such numbers. Richard knew without a doubt that these men pouring onto the grounds of the castle were Imperial Order troops. By agreement, a muscular man said as he strode up to six, we have come to see that Tamarang is secure for the cause of the Imperial Order. Yes, of course, Six said. But this is considerably earlier than you were supposed to arrive. The man rested a hand on the hilt of his sword as his dark eyes scrutinized the layout of the place. Richard recognized the quality of the weapons the man carried, how well made his armor was, and the way he immediately took charge. This was the commander of all these men. We made good time, he said. Some of the towns and cities along the way offered no resistance, so we were able to get here now, rather than after winter, as we had thought. Well, please accept our welcome on behalf of the Queen. Six said. I, well, I was just going to go look for her. The commander wore shoulder plates of formed leather along with a pressed leather breastplate embellished with designs. Looking to have served him well, the leather plate had cuts and scrapes from fending off weapons. He had rings lining the back of his left ear and a tattoo of scales down over the right half of his face, as if he were half man, half reptile. The Order operates for the good of the Order and our cause. Tamarang is now part of the Imperial Order. I trust all here are pleased to now be people of the Order. The sound of boots on stone covered the sound of birds singing at the impending sunrise. Men closed in all around, flowing into the courtyard walkway right up to Richard. Yes, of course, Six said to the commander. She seemed to be regaining her composure. The queen and I trust that you will honor the agreements made, that the castle is not to be entered by anyone from the order, that the castle itself is to be left to her majesty, her advisers and servants. The man stared into her eyes for a moment. Makes no difference to me. The castle is of no use to us. He blinked, as if somewhat surprised to hear himself agreeing to such a thing. He puffed up his chest, regaining some of his fire. But by our agreement, the rest of Tamarang is now a province of the Empire of the Imperial Order. Six bowed her head in acknowledgement. Her thin smile was back. By agreement. Richard noted, but hardly heard the conversation, he had been using the loosened grip Six had on him to slip out of it. He used her distraction like an iron bar to pry her invisible claws off of him. He had managed to pry open that grip just enough to let his mind slip out. It was time he did something for himself, for Kalin. 
Even though he had lost the gift and had lost the sword of truth, he had not lost the lessons mastered from that weapon, much less the lessons learned throughout his life. He might not have had the gift, but he remembered the meaning of the symbols. He knew the rhythm of the dance with death. He was still one with a blade. Now he needed only to get his hands on a blade. While Six and the officer decided the limits of where the men would go on the grounds, where they would stay out of, and what was theirs within the city itself, Richard glanced behind, noticing the wooden handles on the swords of the soldiers and the leather handle on the sword of the subordinate officer right behind, just a little to Richard's right. He smiled at the man as he pulled a copper penny from his pocket and casually rolled it across his knuckles. He let the penny slip and fall as if he were clumsy. He squatted down to pick it up, pressing one hand to the sandy dirt beside the path for balance as he reached out for the coin, letting grit stick to his palms and fingers. He scooped up the penny, getting as well a small amount of sandy dirt. The officer behind, watching his superior speaking to Six, glanced Richard's way only as Richard wiped the dirt off the penny and then returned it to a pocket. Six presented a much more captivating subject than an awkward nobody. Richard acted like he was idly brushing his hands, but he was really covering his palms and fingers with the grit. Once he began, he didn't want his hands slipping on leather. Without turning, he leaned back toward the lesser officer standing behind him. The man was intent on the bewitching figure of Six as she spun her web, telling the men what she would like them to do. Out of his peripheral vision, Richard could see the hilt of the weapon hanging at the man's hip. It was better made than the weapons carried by most of the men. As Six and the commander were talking, Richard turned a little, feigning a stretch. In an instant, his hand was on the sword. In another instant, the blade was free. Having a weapon, a sword in his hands, instantly flooded Richard with memories, forms, and skills he had spent long hours learning. The lessons might have in part come from other worldly sources, but the knowledge was not magic. It was the experience of countless seekers before Richard. Even though he didn't have that weapon with him, he still had that knowledge. The officer, apparently half thinking Richard was just being foolish, made a move to recover his weapon. Richard spun the sword and with a backward thrust ran him through. Other men sprang into action. Swords came free in the cool dawn air. Big men freed huge crescent battle axes from their belts along with maces and flails. Richard was suddenly in his element. The haze was gone from his mind. He had not expected the part of his mind that he had locked away for safekeeping to be called upon this soon, but the time had come, and he had to act. This was his chance. He knew where Kalin was, and he had to get to her. These men were in his way. Richard swung, taking off an arm, wielding an axe. The cry, the spray of blood, made the men nearby flinch. In that sliver of an instant, Richard made his move. He brought his sword up through another man, lifting his sword. The man died before he even had his arm fully cocked back. Richard spun out of the way of weapons coming for him. Despite the sudden cacophony of metal clanging, of men yelling, Richard was already in a silent world of purpose. He was in control. These men might have thought that they had an army against him, but in a way that was his advantage. He didn't fight an army. He fought individuals. They thought like a collective mass, a collective element, allowing one another to move, as if the soldiers were trying to be one big fighting centipede. That was a mistake. Richard used it to cut into them. While they hesitated, waiting for others to act, waiting for an opening, 
Richard was already moving through their lines, cutting them down. He let them swing and lunge, using strength and effort, while he floated through the onslaught of steel. Every time he thrust, he made contact. Every time he swung his weapon, he cut. It was like going through thick brush, slashing aside the branches that reached out at him. He let the momentum of the sword power the next strike, keeping it in continuous motion rather than using effort and precious time to draw it back. If he brought the blade down, slicing through the side of a man's neck, he continued the movement, bringing the weapon up behind to run a man through as he rushed in, and then as he pulled the blade out, he spun away as swords, axes, and flails came down where he had been only a moment before. It was a fluid dance, moving through the grunting, diving, jumping men. Slice, 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 letting the screams fill the morning air, letting the alarm of not being able to stop him cause others to hesitate in fear of what could be happening. At all times, Richard kept his objective in sight. He was heading for the opening out of the wall. Even though he charged, wove, and feigned his way through the onslaught of men, he headed relentlessly for that opening and his freedom. He had to get through, and then he could get to Kalen. Richard scythed down some of the men in his way while he spun past others. His object was not to kill as many as he could, but to get to his goal of that open doorway. Even though orders were being shouted, soldiers were screaming in rage for a chance to get at him, and men were shrieking in pain as they were slashed open, disemboweled, or stabbed, there was quiet purpose in Richard's mind. He cut from that void. He selected targets swiftly and cut them down just as swiftly. He didn't waste effort swinging, but cut with certainty. When he saw a leader among the men a man who moved with more skill, a man others looked to in the attack, Richard cut into that strength. As he moved toward the opening in the wall, he slipped through gaps in their guard all the time, cutting. He didn't allow himself to pause for an instant in his relentless advance. He didn't allow the enemy to catch their breath as he cut into them. He cut without mercy, taking any man he could, whether he looked fierce or afraid, Richard cut him down. They had expected him to be intimidated by their numbers, by their battle cries as they rushed him. He was not. He cut them down mercilessly. At last he made the door, beheading the man just to the left and then the one to the right. The opening was at last free of Imperial Order soldiers. Richard dashed through. Everything came to an abrupt halt. Beyond was a wall of archers, all with bows drawn, all aiming their arrows at him. Men with bows and men with crossbows were formed into a semicircle beyond the doorway, trapping him in that pocket of razor-sharp, steel-tipped arrows, all aimed at him. Richard knew all too well that he didn't stand a chance against the hundreds of arrows aimed at him, especially not at this close range. The commander appeared in the doorway. Very impressive. I've never seen the like of it. The man truly did sound amazed, but it was over. Richard heaved a sigh and tossed his sword down. The commander stepped closer, frowning as he appraised Richard, looking him up and down. Behind, Six appeared in the opening through the wall, a black silhouette against the sunrise. The commander folded his muscled arms. Do you know how to play Ja La De Jin? Richard thought it the oddest question he could imagine at that moment. In the background, beyond the rather small opening in the wall he had made it through, grievously injured men screamed, cried, and begged for help. Richard didn't shy away from the commander. Yes, I know how to play the game of life. The man smiled at Richard using the translation of Jala Dijin from the emperor's tongue. The commander, 
looking far from concerned about the numbers of his men Richard had cut down, smiled to himself as he shook his head in wonder. Richard wasn't concerned for the dead and injured either. They had chosen to be part of a conquering army, to plunder, rape, and murder people who had done them no wrong, people who had committed the sin of not believing in the ways of the order, people who had wished to live their own lives free. Six stalked up beside the commander. I appreciate your valiant efforts to apprehend this dangerous man. He is a condemned prisoner and my responsibility. His punishment is to be directed by the queen herself. The commander glanced over at her. He just killed a number of my men. He is my prisoner now. Six looked ready to spit fire. I'll not allow... Hundreds of arrows all lifted as one to point right at the woman. She froze still and silent, appraising the threat. Like Richard, she obviously knew that her talent was no match for this many masked men with weapons that could be released with a twitch. It would take only one twitch to end her life. This man is my prisoner, Six said to the commander in a quiet but firm voice. I was just taking him to the queen for... He's my prisoner now. Go back to the castle. The grounds belong to the order now. This is no longer the queen's or your dominion. This man is ours now. But I... You are dismissed. Or do you wish to break our agreement and have us slaughter the whole lot of you? Six's blanched blue eyes swept the hundreds of men aiming arrows at her. Of course, our agreement stands, Commander. She turned her intense eyes on the man. I have honored it, as agreed, and so will you. He tipped his head in a slight bow. Very well. Now leave us to our duty. As agreed, you, as well as those in charge here, may go about your business, go where you wish, and my men will not accost you, them, or the castle staff. With one final murderous look at Richard, she turned and stalked away. Along with the commander and all his men, Richard watched the witch woman glide through the opening in the wall and up the bloody path among the dead and dying, not giving them so much as a second look as she headed for the entrance to the castle. Men parted for her, letting her through. The commander turned back to Richard. What is your name? Richard knew that he couldn't give his real name. He couldn't even give the name he grew up with, Richard Cipher. If he did, he was liable to be recognized for who he really was. His mind raced as he tried to think of another name he could use. The name Zed liked to use when he needed to disguise his identity popped into his head. I'm Reuben Ribnick. Well, Reuben, I will give you a choice. We could skin you alive, stake you out, slit open your belly, and let you watch as the vultures pull your intestines out and fight over them. Richard knew he wouldn't have to face such a fate, because all he would have to do was attack and the archers would kill him. Still, he didn't want to die. He couldn't help Kalin if he was dead. I don't much like that choice. You have another? A sly smile spread on the man's face, befitting the reptilian half with the scale tattoos. Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. You see, the different divisions of the army have Jala teams. Ours is made up of a mix of my men and the very best of those we have come across. Men blessed by the Creator with exceptional talent. It was quite impressive the way you made your way through all those men into the opening in the wall, like you were making your way toward a goal. You continued on toward that goal without allowing yourself to be stopped, no matter what the men threw at you. Well, you're a natural point man. Dangerous position, being the point man. The commander shrugged. That is the game of life. We are absent a point man right now. He died in the last game. 
As he was evading a blocking man, he missed a catch and the brock stove in his ribs. They punctured his lungs. It was a messy, painful death. That doesn't sound like a very tempting job. The commander's eyes gleamed with menace. If you would rather, you can take your chances without your skin, watching the vultures fight over your bowels. Would I get the chance to play the Emperor's team? The Emperor's team, the commander repeated. He stared at Richard for a moment, interested that he would have asked such a question. You really are a competitive sort, he finally nodded. All sanctioned Jala teams dream of having a chance to face the Emperor's team. If you show your worth and help us win tournaments with your skill as point man, then yes, you might very well get the chance to play the Emperor's team. If you survive that long, then I'd like to join. The commander smiled. You are thinking of being a hero? Is that it? A Jala player who is cheered... A player of renown? Perhaps. The commander leaned a little closer. Oh, I think you are dreaming of the women such a victory would earn you. The looks in the eyes of beautiful females. The smiles of attractive women. Richard thought of Kaylin's beautiful green eyes. Her smile. Yes, that thought had crossed my mind. Crossed your mind? The man snorted a laugh. Well, Reuben, banish the thought. You are not a player who has come to join. You are a captive, and a dangerous one at that. We have provisions for players of your kind. You will be put in a cage and taken by a wagon. You will be let out to play or to practice. But otherwise, you will be no more than a caged animal. During practice sessions, you will have to work hard to learn to work with the rest of the team, to learn their strengths and weaknesses. After all, you are the point man. But even so, you will not be one man alone. Richard didn't see an alternative. I understand. The commander took a deep breath as he hooked his thumbs in his weapons belt. Good. If you play well... If you do your best in every game, and if we should happen to beat the Emperor's team, I will allow you to have your choice of the women who will be gathered eager to lie with the players. With the victors, Richard corrected. The commander nodded. With the victors. He lifted a finger. Make one wrong step in the meantime and you will be killed. Bargain struck. Richard said. You have your new point man. The commander lifted an arm, signaling other officers closer. They came to attention before the commander. Have the wagon brought up, the one with the iron box, for our new point man here. I think you already know how dangerous he is. Handle him as such. I want to unleash his talent against our opponents. The officer gave Richard an appraising glance. It would be nice to win more than on occasion. The commander nodded as he started reeling off orders. Post guards near the castle and in town, enough to ensure that there will be no trouble from the people of Tamarang. Then have all the laborers start setting up the stations for our supply trains. You'll first have to find a place big enough. Look just outside the city near the river. Summer is waning. Winter will be here before you know it, and the supply trains soon coming up through here will be large and often. All our troops in the New World will be needing supplies to last them the coming winter. The city of Tamarang will provide what our men will need for the construction. There is a port on the river where the lumber is to be brought in, so you will need to make provisions for roads to the new site and for the barracks for all the men who will eventually be billeted here. One of the officers nodded. We have all the plans ready. Richard could only assume that the order intended to use the city of Tamarang for help in all the construction for the depot. He had seen them do such things before. It was easier to deal with places that were eager to join in the order than to destroy everything and then just have to build it up again. 
I will be leaving at once with our troops and this supply train, the commander told the officers. Jagang wants all the men he can get for the assault on the Daharan Empire. The leader of the Daharan Empire stood quietly, listening to the plans for the final assault on the people of the New World, for the slaughter of those who believed in freedom, for the battle that he had made sure would never happen. Chapter 50 Rachel woke when she heard Violet padding around the bedroom. Through the little slit in the door of her iron box, Rachel could see the tall window across the room. Even though the heavy royal blue drapes were drawn, she could tell by the color of the light coming in the narrow gap between them that it was just dawn. Queen Violet did not ordinarily get up this early. Rachel listened, trying to hear what Violet was doing. She heard a long yawn, and then the sounds of the cave queen getting dressed. Rachel's legs were cramped from being in the box all night. She wanted to get out and stretch. That was not a desire she dared to voice, though. At least they hadn't put the tongue clamp on her the night before. Sometimes Violet didn't feel like bothering. All of a sudden there was a bang, bang, bang that made Rachel jump, made her heart race. It was Violet beating the heel of her shoe on the top of the iron box. Wake up! Violet said. Big day. A messenger slipped a note under the door in the night. Six returned. A few hours before dawn. The queen whistled as she went about dressing. That in itself was a little unusual, because the queen usually called in her attendants to get out her clothes and dress her. Now she was dressing herself and whistling while she did it. Rachel had rarely heard Violet whistle, it was pretty clear that she was in a good mood because of Six returning. Rachel's heart sank at all that meant. What little light came into the sleeping box darkened as Violet's eyes appeared just outside the slit in the door. She has Richard with her. The spells I drew all worked. Today is going to be the worst day of his life. I will see to that. Today... He begins to pay for his crimes against me. Violet's face vanished. The whistling started in again as the queen crossed the room, finished getting dressed, and drew on stockings and laced boots. In a few moments she returned and leaned close again. I'm going to let you watch while the men whip him. She cocked her head. What do you have to say? In the back corner of her box, Rachel swallowed. Thank you, Queen Violet. Violet snickered as she straightened. He won't have an inch of flesh left on his back by the time the sun sets today. She went a short distance to the desk in the corner and then returned. Rachel heard the key turn in the lock. The lock made a metallic clang as it popped open, banging against the iron door. Violet pulled the lock off the hasp. And that's only the beginning of what I will have done to him. I'll... There was an urgent knock at the door. A muffled voice demanded that the door be opened. It was Six's voice. Hold on, I'm coming, Violet shouted across the room. Rachel moved a little closer to the slit and saw Violet hurriedly hook the lock back through the hasp. She pushed it to lock it again just as Six banged on the door. All right, all right, Violet said as she let go of the lock and rushed across the room. She turned the latch on the big heavy door and almost immediately it burst open. Six swept into the room all dark and towering like a thunderhead. You have him, right? He's here, locked up where I told you to put him? Violet asked her voice filled with trembling excitement as Six closed the big door. We can start punishing him immediately. I will have the guards assemble. The army took him. Rachel moved closer to the iron door and cautiously peered out the slit. Six was standing just inside the door. The queen's back was to Rachel. 
Violet stood in a white satin dress with a deep blue belt and laced boots over her white stockings, staring up at the stark figure of the witch woman. What? Imperial Order troops appeared right before dawn. They're flooding into the city as I speak, into the grounds of the castle. There are thousands of them, tens of thousands of them, maybe hundreds of thousands of them for all I know. Violet looked confused, not wanting to believe what she was hearing as she searched for words. But that can't be. The message you sent said that he was locked up, just as I instructed, locked up in the cell where he hurt me. Was is the operative word. We arrived in the night, and I locked him up just as you wished. Then I sent you the message and saw to a few things, waiting for morning. I was bringing him with me just now. I was bringing him to face you when we encountered the occupying soldiers. It's one of those massive advance columns of reinforcements. Their purpose is not a slaughter and rampage. They want to establish a staging area in Tamarang for other supply trains coming up from the old world. They were open to my offers of... What about Richard? Six heaved a sigh. I was too late. There was nothing I could do. The troops were pouring in from every direction. Our men had no chance to stop them. Those who tried were swept aside. I thought that it was best to deal with the Order's men myself, to try to find a way to secure safety for you and your staff while I had the chance. While I was speaking to the commander, ensuring favorable terms for us in return for help in what they want to do with establishing supply routes, all of a sudden Richard came up with a sword. Violet planted her fists on her hips. What do you mean he came up with a sword? Her temper, along with her voice, was rising by the moment. You saw to it that he doesn't have his sword. No, it wasn't the Sword of Truth. It was another sword, just a plain sword. He must have grabbed it from a soldier when no one was looking. Plain though it may have been, he knew how to use it. All of a sudden, a war broke out. Richard was like death itself unleashed. He was killing Imperial Order troops by the dozens. It was madness. The men thought they were facing a major battle. Everyone went into combat without even knowing what they were up against. Things just went crazy in an instant. I can't control pandemonium on that level. There were too many men. There was too much violence. I would have needed some time to gain control, and there was no time. Richard made it out through the wall. He escaped? After all this, he escaped? No. Outside the wall waited hundreds of archers. They had him trapped. He was captured. Violet sighed in relief. Good. For a moment, I thought. No, not good. The commander would not release him. Because Richard had killed so many of his men, the commander wanted Richard as a prisoner. They probably intend to execute him. I doubt he will live to see tomorrow. Once in the castle on the way up here, I looked out a window and saw them put Richard in an iron box in a wagon. They took him away with the column of troops heading north. Violet blinked indignation. You let him get away? You let those filthy nobodies take him? take my prize? In the sudden quiet, Rachel saw Six's glare darken. She had never seen the witch woman give the queen such a look before, and she thought that Violet would do well to be a little more prudent. I had no choice, Six said with an icy inflection to her words. There were hundreds of archers pointing arrows at me. They left me no choice in the matter. It's not like I wanted to give Richard over to them. A lot of work has gone into this. You should have stopped it. 
You have powers not enough for... You boneheaded moron! You stupid, stupid, worthless, no-good, dim-witted jackass! I trust you with an important task, and you don't even see it through for me. I'll have you whipped to within an inch of your life for this. You're no better than the rest of my worthless, no-good advisors. I'll have you whipped in Richard's place to teach you yours. Rachel flinched at the resounding sound of the slap. It knocked Violet from her feet. She landed on her bottom on the floor. How dare you touch me in that way, Violet said, comforting her cheek. I'll have you beheaded for this. Guards, I need you. Almost immediately there was a knock at the double doors. Six opened one of them. Two men with pikes looked at the queen sitting on the floor and then up into the blanched blue eyes of the woman holding the door handle. If you dare to knock on this door again, Six hissed, I will eat your raw livers for my breakfast and wash it down with your blood. The two men turned as white as Six. Sorry to bother you, mistress, one said. Yes, sorry, the other said, as they turned tail and ran off down the hall. With a growl of rage, Six grabbed Violet by her hair and lifted her to her feet. The witch woman unleashed a blow that sent Violet tumbling across the floor, leaving strings of blood across the carpets in her wake. You ungrateful little brat. I've had about all I can stomach of you. I've endured it long enough. From now on you will keep that tongue still, or I will rip out what I gave you back. Her long, bony fingers seized Violet by the hair and pulled her up again, then slammed the queen against the wall. Rachel could see Violet's arms hanging limp. She made no move to defend herself as Six struck her time after time. Blood ran from Violet's nose, from her mouth, and was splattered across the wall. A bib of blood stood out against the white satin of Violet's dress. When the tall witchwoman released the queen, she dropped into a heap on the floor and fell to helpless sobbing. Shut up, Six roared, her anger building. Stand. Stand up this instant or never stand again. Violet struggled to her feet, finally standing before Six, looking up at her, her eyes filled not only with tears but terror. Violet lifted her chin. She visibly pushed her fear aside and grasped at indignation instead. How dare you touch your queen in such a fashion? I will... Queen? Six sneered. You were never anything more than a puppet queen. Now you are no longer even that. You are no longer queen. As of this moment you resign. I am the queen now. Not like you, a pompous little twit who thinks herself important because of the extravagance of her tantrums, but a real queen. A queen with real power. Queen Six. Got it? When Violet started crying in angry resentment, Six slapped her hard enough to toss her head aside and throw yet more blood against the lacy powder-blue designs stenciled on the wall. Again, faced with an angry witch-woman, Violet didn't respond even to ward the assault. Six rested her fists on her knobby hips as she leaned down toward Violet. I asked if you got it. Violet, on the edge of ragged panic at hearing the deadly threat in Six's voice, nodded. Say it! Six slapped her again. Answer your queen properly! Violet's sobs grew louder, as if that alone would save her throne. Say it, or I'll have you boiled alive, chopped up, and fed to the hogs. Yes, Queen Six... Very good, Six hissed with a venomous smile. 
she straightened. Now, what good can you be to me? She looked up at the ceiling, touching a finger to her chin in royal contemplation. Should I even bother to keep you alive? Yes, I know. You will be the court artist, a petty member of my staff. Do your job properly and you live. Fail me in any way, and you will be boiled and fed to the hogs. Got it? Violet nodded at the glare that focused on her. Yes, Queen Six. Six smiled with grim pride at how quickly she had brought Violet to task. She seized the former queen's collar behind her neck. Now we have urgent business. We can still save this mess. But how, Violet whined, without Richard, I've clipped his fangs. His gift is mine for now, and he will remain cut off from it. I will decide when the time is right to deal with him. As for the rest of it, there is another way, but it is unfortunately more difficult. I only used Richard in the first place, because certain aspects of it were less complicated. It also kept you quiet and working without complaint while I pulled your strings. The other way is far more complex, because, unlike Richard, a number of other people are involved. So we must get started at once. What other way? Six flashed an affected smile. You will draw some more pictures for me. She opened the door with one hand, and with the other dragged Violet out into the hall. I need you to draw a woman. A woman with an iron collar around her neck. What woman are you talking about? Violet asked in a trembling voice. Rachel could just barely see them out in the hallway as Six reached for the doorknob. You don't remember her. It will be harder to do because of that, but I can instruct you in how to accomplish the elements that I will need. Still, it will be more difficult than anything you've done before. I'm afraid that it will test not only your ability, but your strength and endurance. If you don't want to end up in the trough as hog slop, you will put your all into it. Got it? Yes, Queen Six, Violet said in a voice choked with tears. As Six started to march away, dragging Violet along, she slammed the bedroom door closed behind her. In the sudden silence, Rachel held her breath, wondering if they would remember her and return. She waited, but then finally had to let the breath out. Violet had replaced the lock, so she probably wouldn't give Rachel a second thought. Violet had a lot bigger problems now than worrying about letting Rachel out. Rachel feared that she was going to die in the cursed box. Would anyone ever let her out? Would Six return and put Rachel to death? After all, Rachel had only been kept around for Violet's amusement. There was no longer any reason for Six to keep up the pretense. Six was in charge now. Rachel knew most of the people who worked in the castle. She knew that none of them would dare to say a word when Six told them that she was now the queen. Everyone was afraid of Violet because she had people punished and put to death. But everyone was more afraid of Six because she was the one who enforced Violet's whims. Besides, when Six said things to people, they just seemed to lose their ability to do anything but what she'd told them to do. Those who crossed Six seemed to vanish. It occurred to Rachel that the hogs looked well fed. Rachel thought again about how, when Six was slapping Violet, Violet didn't even make an attempt to protect herself with her hands. Rachel knew that Six was a witch woman. Witch women had a way of making people forget how to fight against what was happening. They just did as she said, no matter how much they didn't want to. Like the two guards, they saw the queen on the floor with a bloody nose calling for help, but they quickly chose to do as Six told them, not Violet. 
Chapter 51 Rachel sat in her iron box for a while, thinking, worrying, wondering what would become of her. And then she had a thought. Carefully, quietly, even though there was no one in the room and the door was closed, she pressed herself tight up against the door. She put one eye right up to the slit. First, she looked around, fearful that the witch woman might somehow be watching her. The witch woman sometimes came to her in the night, in her dreams. If six had materialized in the center of the room, Rachel wouldn't have been at all shocked. There were plenty of whispers among the staff of the strange things that had been happening at the castle since the woman had arrived. But the room was empty. There was no one there, no tall figure in black robes. Confident that she was alone, Rachel peered over at the lock. She had to stare a while because she wasn't sure that what she was seeing was real. The lock hanging in the hasp wasn't locked. Rachel remembered Violet pushing at it as Six knocked on the door, but in her haste, she must not have gotten it locked. If Rachel could get the lock out of the hasp, she could open the door. She could get out. Six had taken Violet to the cave. Violet and Six were gone. Rachel tried to reach through the slit to pull the lock off, but it was too far. She needed a stick or something to reach it. She cast about inside her sleeping box, but there was nothing. There was no stick just lying around. There were plenty of things outside the box that she could have used, but they were outside the box. As long as that lock was hooked through the loop of steel sticking out through the slot in the hasp, there was no way Rachel could push open the door. The lock might as well have been locked. She flopped back down on her blanket, dejected, her hope gone. She missed Chase. For a time, her life had been a dream. She had a family, a wonderful father who watched over her and taught her so many things. Rachel idly pulled on the loose end of the coarse thread that had been used to sew the edging on a blanket. Chase would be disappointed to see her giving up so easily, to see her moping, but what was she to do? There was nothing she had in her box that she could use to get the lock off. She had on a dress and boots. Her boots wouldn't fit through the slit. The only other thing she had was her sleeping blanket. Violet had taken everything away from her. She had nothing. As she pulled, more of the heavy thread unraveled. As Rachel looked down at the thread looped around the end of her finger, inspiration struck. She started pulling at the thread, pulling out the stitches, pulling more of it free. She soon had the entire end of the blanket undone, and she had a long length of thread. She doubled it over and rolled it between her palm and leg, twisting it into a heavier thread. It was long enough to make several layers, all rolled together into a sturdy string. She made a loop in the end and then went to the slit. Carefully, she cast out the string, trying to get the loop over the lock so that she could hook it and pull it up out of the hasp. It sounded a lot easier than it was. The string wasn't heavy enough to throw with any accuracy. Rachel tried several different ways of doing it, but it always fell short, or if it did get over the top loop of the lock, it just slid off over the side. It just didn't want to go down over the far side to hook the lock's shank. The string was too light to throw well, but at the same time it was too stiff to drape over the lock those times when it did land where she wanted it. Yet again, she managed to get the end of the string to land over the lock. The end, though, dangled out at an angle rather than lying down where she could slip it over the open shank of the lock. She brought the string back in and wet it with spit, then tried again. The wet string was a little heavier. 
she was able to throw it with a little more accuracy. Her hand was getting sore and tired from trying because she had to twist it sideways to cast the string. It seemed she had been at it all morning. The string kept getting dry. Rachel brought the string back in and wet it in her mouth, getting it good and soaked. She went to the slit and cast it. The first time it landed over the lock, the loop of the string was just below the end of the lock's shank. Rachel froze. This was as close as she'd ever gotten it. It was difficult to have her hand out of the slit and then to be able to see through the little space that was left over. She could see, though, that if she pulled, the string would be pulled up and not hook over the shank where she needed it to hook. The string, as wet as it was, was adhering to the long bar that latched when it was locked. Rachel had an idea. She carefully began to roll the string between her finger and thumb. With the string stuck with her spit to the metal, it rolled, sticking, until the end flopped over. Rachel blinked as she stared. It looked like the loop was right where she needed it to be. She was afraid to move afraid to make a mistake, afraid to lose her chance, afraid to make the wrong move because she hadn't thought it through well enough. Chase had always told her that she had to use her head, her judgment, he called it, and then act on that judgment. By every measure she could judge, the loop was in the right place. If she pulled, and the string stayed stuck with her spit to the shank of the lock, the loop would hook over the end of the bar. Her heart pounded in her chest. She realized that she was panting. Holding her breath, Rachel began ever so carefully to pull the string. The flat end of the metal caught the loop. If she pulled too hard, it might just pop off. She lowered her fingers to change the angle of the pull, to help it pull the loop over the end rather than slip off. The loop stretched tight, and then slipped over the end of the lock's shank. She could hardly believe it. Carefully, steadily, she pulled the string upward, sliding the lock up out of the hasp. When it was almost out of the loop of metal, the notched end of the bar on the lock caught the hasp. She tried, pulling just a little harder, but with the way it was caught, it only made the lock twist at an angle rather than lift. Rachel feared to pull too hard. She was afraid that the string would break. She had doubled the thread over several times, making the string several layers thick. She figured that it was probably pretty strong. The question she couldn't answer was how strong it was, and if it was strong enough if she pulled harder. She released some of the tension and let the lock lower, then jerked it a little twitching it rapidly up and down, trying to jiggle the shaft of the metal bar up through the hoop. Suddenly, the lock jumped up out of the hasp and fell. It dangled from the string, swinging back and forth beneath Rachel's hand, sticking out of the slit. She pushed, and the door squeaked open. With the backs of her hands, Rachel wiped the tears of relief from her cheeks. She had gotten herself free. If only Chase could have seen what she had accomplished. Now she had to escape the castle before Violet or Six returned. Rachel didn't know if Violet was aware that she hadn't latched the lock. If she knew she hadn't locked it, and she mentioned it to Six, they would be back. Rachel immediately headed for the big door, but then she remembered something important. She turned and ran to the desk in the corner. She pulled the angled lid down into the position Violet used when she wrote notes on who was to be punished or put to death. Rachel grabbed the gold knob on the bottom center drawer and pulled the drawer out. She set it aside, then reached her hand way into the back and felt around. Her fingers touched something metal. She brought it out. It was the key. Violet hadn't taken it out yet. It was still there where she kept it for the night. 
Relieved, Rachel slipped the key down into her boot and then replaced the door and shut the lid of the desk. Remembering her sleeping box, she closed the door and put the lock through the hasp. She pushed the lock, making sure it latched closed. She tugged, just to make sure that it was secure, something Violet had failed to do. If anyone came in the room, they might suspect that Rachel was still safely locked in her box. If she was lucky, Six or Violet wouldn't even look, and by then Rachel would be long gone. She ran to the big double doors and opened one just a sliver to peek out. She didn't see anyone in the hall. She slipped out the door, closing it quietly behind her. Checking around again, she made for the stairs, then raced up as quietly as she could. On the next floor, in a hallway of wood paneling without windows, Rachel headed for the room that would be locked. There were reflector lights still lit. They were kept lit throughout the night in case the queen ever wanted to go to her jewel room. As she hurried down the hall, she hopped on one foot as she reached down into her boot to retrieve the key. Key in hand, Rachel looked over her shoulder as she arrived at the door she was looking for. Just then she saw a man in the distance coming down the hall. He was one of the butlers. Rachel knew him by his face, but she didn't know his name. Mistress Rachel, he said, frowning as he reached her. Rachel nodded. Yes, what is it? Exactly, he glanced at the door. What is it? Chase had taught her to turn things around on people asking questions she didn't want to answer. He had also taught her how to turn suspicions around to make it look like the other person was up to no good. They'd often made it into a game at camp. She knew that she had to do that now. This time, though, it was not a game. It was deadly serious. She put on her best scowl. Chase had taught her how to do that, too. He'd said for her to just imagine that a boy wanted to kiss her. What does it look like it is? The man arched an eyebrow at her. It looks like you're about to go into the queen's jewel room. Do you intend to rob me of the queen's jewels I've been sent to get for her? Is that why you were lurking around the corner, waiting for someone to be sent to the queen's jewel room, so you can rob them? Lurking? Rob you? Why, no, of course not. I merely want to know. You want to know? Rachel put her hands on her hips. You want to know. Are you in charge of the jewels? Why don't you go ask Queen Violet what you want to know? I'm sure she won't mind a butler questioning her. Maybe she will only have you whipped and not beheaded. I'm on her business getting something for her. Do I need to go get some guards to protect me and the Queen's jewels I'm to take back to her? Guards? Why, of course not. Then what business have you with this business? She looked one way and then another, but saw no one. Guards, she yelled, but not too loudly. Guards, a thief is after the queen's jewels. The man panicked, trying to get her to be quiet, but then abandoned the attempt and rushed off without another word. He never even looked back. Rachel quickly unlocked the door, checked the hall again, and then slipped inside. She didn't think anyone had heard her, but she didn't want to take any more time than necessary. She didn't give the shiny, polished wall of little wooden drawers a second look. The dozens and dozens of little drawers were filled with necklaces, bracelets, brooches, tiaras, and rings. She immediately went instead to the fancy white marble pedestal that stood by itself in the opposite corner of the jewel room. Atop it had once stood Queen Melena's favorite object, the jeweled box she fawned over at every opportunity. Now in its place was a box that looked like it was made of the keeper's blackest thoughts. It was so black that the room filled with precious jewels seemed trivial in the presence of something so monumentally sinister. Rachel had hated touching Queen Melena's jeweled box of Orden. She hated the thought of touching this even more. She had to do it, though. 
She knew she had to hurry if she was to have any chance of getting away. There was no telling if Violet would remember that the iron sleeping box in her room hadn't been locked. She might tell Six, or Six might just read her thoughts. Rachel suspected that Six was capable of doing such things. If they knew Rachel wasn't locked in that box, they would come back. Rachel took the black box down off the white marble pedestal and stuffed it into the leather bag that was sitting against the wall. It was the same bag that Samuel had used to bring Six the box. On the way to the door, Rachel paused before the tall wood-framed mirror. She hated looking at herself in the mirror, hated seeing her hair the way that Violet had chopped it all off. When she had lived at the castle before, back when she had been Princess Violet's playmate, Rachel hadn't been allowed to let her hair grow because she was a nobody. As soon as Violet had Rachel back, one of the first things she did was take a big pair of shears and chop off Rachel's long, beautiful blonde hair. This was the first time she had really had a chance to get a good look at it, though, an up-close look. She wiped tears from her cheek. Chase had told her, when she first went with him, that if she wanted to be his daughter, she would have to let her hair grow. Her hair had grown long and lustrous over the last couple of years, and she felt as if she really had grown to be his daughter. She didn't look the same in the mirror now, as she had the last time she had stood in this room, looking at herself in the mirror when she had been helping Wizard Giller steal the jeweled box of Orden. Her features were different now, less childlike, less cute. Now she was starting the gangly phase, as Chase called it, before she would bloom into the beauty of being a woman that he promised she would one day. That day seemed an impossibly long way off. Besides, without Chase... No one would be there to see her grow up, or care. Now Chase was dead, and her hair was chopped off again. Violet had not simply chopped it off either, but had cut it in ragged cuts, bits and pieces, chunks and wads. It made her look like a cur dog that slept beside the midden heap. There was something else, though, that Rachel saw in that mirror. She saw the woman she would be one day, the woman Chase promised she would be. What would Chase think if he could see her now with her hair all chopped up? Rachel pushed her thoughts to the back of her mind and swung the leather bag held closed with a drawstring over her shoulder. She opened the door just enough to look down the hall, then opened it a little more to look the other way. Still all clear. She hurriedly went out into the hall and closed and locked the door. She remembered the halls and passageways of the castle as well as she remembered the curve of Chase's smile when she made him smile when he tried not to. She always liked that best when he laughed when he was trying to scowl at her. She took the servants' stairs so as to avoid the most guards. They stayed mostly to the main halls and such. People were going about their duties without pause. None of them yet knew that there was a new queen. She didn't know what people would think of such a thing. Rachel knew that people hated Violet, but they were terrified of six. Washwomen carrying bundles turned as they gossiped, watching Rachel run past. Men carrying supplies didn't pay her any attention. Rachel didn't meet the eyes of any of them, lest they ask her something. She reached the door out into a side hall that had a way out of the castle. She went around a corner and came face to face with two guards. They wore the red tunics over their chain mail and carried pikes with gleaming points. Swords hung from their belts. Rachel could clearly see that they had no intention of letting her pass without finding out what she was doing there and where she was going. You must get away, Rachel cried out at them. Hurry, she turned and pointed behind her. The Imperial Order troops are entering the castle back that way. 
One of the men gripped his pike with both hands and rested his weight on it. We have nothing to fear from those men. They're our allies. They intend to behead all the Queen's guards. I heard the commander giving them their orders. Behead them all, he said. More for us, he said. The soldiers all drew their big battle axes. They were told they could keep anything on the men they behead. Hurry, they're coming. Save yourselves. Both men's mouths fell open. That way, Rachel shouted, pointing toward the servant stairs. They won't think to look there. Hurry, I'll warn the others. The men nodded their thanks and headed for the door to the servant stairs. When they had vanished, Rachel started out once more, quickly making the door out of the castle. She took to the pathway that the servants used when going to town to get things they needed for the running of the castle. There were big soldiers, fearsome-looking men who were patrolling everywhere, but they didn't seem to be bothering the servants. So Rachel fell in with some carpenters and walked along beside the tall wheel of their hand cart. She hid her face behind the load of boards. The soldiers paid only casual interest to the servants going about their work, mostly watching the prettier women. Rachel kept her head down and kept walking. With her hair all chopped off, she looked like a nobody, and none of the soldiers stopped her. Once beyond the big stone wall, she kept walking along with the servants until they went through a patch of woods that was right up close to the path. She glanced back over her shoulder and didn't see any soldiers looking her way. Quick as a cat, Rachel slipped into the trees. As soon as she was in among the thick balsams and pines, she started running. She took deer paths through the bramble, following any she could find that went west or north. Once she was running, panic came out of nowhere and took control of her legs. All she could think about was getting away. This was her chance. She had to run. If the Imperial Order soldiers caught her out here, she knew that she would be in trouble. She wasn't sure what they would do to her, but she had a pretty good general idea. Chase had given her those lessons one dark night by the campfire. He told her something of what men like that would do to her. He told her not to let herself get caught by men like that. He told her that if she was facing such men and capture, she had to fight them with everything she had. Chase said that he hadn't meant to scare her, but hoped to keep her safe. Still, it made her cry, and she only felt better when he sheltered her under his big arm. She realized that she had nothing with which to fight. Her knives had all been taken away. She wished she had been smarter, and before she left the castle, had taken a quick look in Violet's room to see if she could find any of her knives. She was so eager to get away that she never thought of it. She should have at least gone through the kitchens when she'd been down in the service areas and gotten a knife. She was so busy congratulating herself over a piece of string and that she had gotten away that she had never thought about getting a weapon. Chase was probably angry enough to come back to life and scold her for being so thoughtless. Her face burned with shame. She stopped when she saw a stout branch lying on the ground. She picked it up and tested its strength. It seemed sound. She whacked it against a fir tree, and it made a solid sound. It was a little heavier than she would have wanted to carry, but at least she had something. She slowed to a trot and kept moving, trying to put as much distance between her and the castle as she could. She didn't know when they would discover her missing, and she didn't know if Six could track as well as she could do everything else. Rachel wondered if Six might be able to gaze into a bowl of water and see where Rachel was. That made her run faster again. By early afternoon, she came across a trail. It looked like it headed roughly north. She knew that Aiden Drill was somewhere to the north. She didn't know if she could find something that far away, but she couldn't think of anywhere else to go. If she could get back to the keep, back to Zed, he would help her. 
She was so deep in thought that she didn't even see the man until she almost ran into him. She looked up and realized that it was an Imperial Order soldier. Well, well, what have we here? As he started to reach down for her, Rachel swung the club with all her strength, whacking him across the knee. The man cried out and fell to the ground, clutching his knee, shouting curses at her. Side 17, Phantom, by Terry Goodkind. Continuing on page 523. Rachel tore off running. She took to the deer paths again because she was smaller and it was easier for her to negotiate them than it would be for big men. It sounded like there were suddenly a dozen men after her crashing through the brush. She could hear the man she had clubbed far back, still cursing up a storm, yelling at his fellows to get her. As she burst into a clearing, winded and nearly out of strength, she saw that there were men blocking the path ahead. They all started for her. Rachel ducked to the side and ran. It seemed like there were soldiers all around. She was in a panic, not knowing how to get away from them. She heard one man fall. She didn't look back, but kept running. She heard another fall, crying out briefly, then going silent. She wondered if, when running at breakneck speed... They were catching their feet in holes or twisting ankles on low vines. Another man let out a grunt. This time Rachel stopped and turned just long enough for a quick look. It had not been a fall or a twisted ankle. It had been a sound released in death. Rachel's eyes were wide as she stared. Another man shrieked like he was being skinned alive. Rachel wondered what kind of woods she was in, and what monsters were loose in them. She turned and ran. She had no chance if the men got her. She didn't know what else was about, but she first had to keep from getting caught, or they were liable to slit her throat for giving them a difficult time. Suddenly, three men charged out of the brush, roaring in rage. A little cry squeaked out as Rachel ran with all her strength and fear. The men, though, had longer legs and were catching her. One of them stopped suddenly. Rachel glanced back over a shoulder and saw the man arching his back as if in pain. She saw, then, a foot of steel jutting from his chest. The other two turned to the unexpected attack from behind. As the man who had been run through with a sword started to fall... Rachel's jaw fell open at what she saw behind him. It was Chase, big as life. She couldn't make sense of it. The two men charged him. Chase fought them with swift, powerful strikes, taking them both down as if doing no more than brushing aside pests. But at the same time, more men poured out of the woods around them. She saw at least a half dozen of the big Imperial Order soldiers to one side alone, charging the even bigger boundary warden. Rachel ran back as Chase fought all the men at once. When he killed a man to his side, a man to the other side used the opening to go for him. Rachel whacked the backs of his knees. His legs folded under him. Chase swung around and ran the man through, then met the fierce charge of yet more men, all of them grunting with the effort of trying to take down this one big man. They gritted their teeth as they growled and tried to grapple Chase's arms so other men could stab him. Rachel wailed away at them with all her strength, but to no avail. When one of the men fell dead, Rachel snatched the knife in a sheath at his belt and immediately stabbed the legs of a man going for Chase's back. He cried out and turned. Chase took him in an instant. All of a sudden, it was quiet, except for Rachel and Chase's labored breathing. All the men lay dead. Rachel stood staring up at Chase. She couldn't believe what she was seeing, couldn't believe her eyes. She feared that he might vanish like a phantom. He looked down at her, and that wonderful grin of his came over his face. 
Chase, what are you doing here? I came to see if you were all right. All right? I was held captive in the castle. I thought you were dead. I had to rescue myself. What took you so long? He shrugged. I wouldn't have wanted to spoil your accomplishment. Isn't it better that you did it on your own? Well, she said, a bit perplexed, I could have used some help. Is that so? He appeared unmoved by her complaint. You look to have managed. But you don't know. It was terrible. They locked me up in the box again, and they locked my tongue so that I couldn't talk. Chase eyed her askance. I don't suppose you brought that tongue lock with you, did you? It sounds like a useful device. Rachel grinned and hugged him around his waist. When she had at first met him, she had to hug his leg because that was all she could reach. She basked in the comfort of his big hand on her back. It felt like everything in the world was right again. I thought you were dead, she said as she started to cry. He ruffled her chopped-off hair. I wouldn't do that to you, little one. I promised to take care of you, and I meant it. I guess that I'm stuck with being your daughter. Guess so. Your hair is ugly, though. You'll have to grow it back if you want to stay with me. You can't keep chopping it off like that if you want to be my daughter. I told you that before. Rachel grinned through her tears. Chase was alive. Chapter 52 With Kara right on her heels, Nietzsche strode through the immense brass-clad doors covered in elaborate engraved symbols. A flickering flash of lightning came in through the dozen round-topped windows between the towering mahogany columns to illuminate row upon row of shelves all around the cavernous room. They had managed to patch only the worst of the damage to the two-story tall windows, enough, they hoped, that the room could be used for its intended purpose as a containment field. Some of the heavy dark green velvet draperies with gold fringe were getting wet as rain blew in the remaining holes on some of the stronger gusts. Seeing what was in the center of the room, floating above the large table Nietzsche had once floated above herself, she hoped that a bit of errant rain would be all that came in through those missing parts of the windows. Rushing to meet her, Zed gripped her shoulders. Desperation was clearly evident in his eyes. Did you find him? He's alive, isn't he? Is he all right? Nietzsche took a breath. Zed, he survived the events in the sliff. I at least found out that much. The Sliff had also already told them that much. Rika had been there guarding the well when the Sliff had unexpectedly returned. They were all surprised that the Sliff had returned at all, much less returned to tell them what had happened. The Silver Creature had abruptly been eager to talk, up to a point, to tell them what had happened to Richard. It wasn't because the Sliff wanted to tell where she had been with one of her travelers, but rather that Richard... Her master had told the Sliff to tell them that he was safe and where he had gone. She was eager to do his bidding. Unfortunately, the Sliff's nature was to be secretive, and they weren't able to get straight answers from her on much more of it. Zed had said that the Sliff wasn't being perverse. She simply couldn't help the way others had created her. She was being true to her nature. He said that they would just have to go along with the Sliff's way of revealing information and do their best to learn what they could from her. Zed had also detected on the Sliff the trace residue power left by a witch woman. They were pretty sure that it had to be Six. They weren't sure what Six was up to, but at least they knew from the Sliff that Richard had somehow escaped her clutches. But where is he? Did the Sliff take you there? Take you where she said she left him? She did. Nietzsche glanced at the moored Sith and then laid a hand on Zed's shoulder. After we got to the place where the Sliff had taken him, she then told us where he had gone, to the land of the Night Wisps. We still had to travel some distance to get there. 
Zed stared in astonishment. The Night Wisps! Yes, but Richard wasn't there. At least he's alive. It sounds like he was acting on his own volition and not that of a witch woman, Zed said, sounding a little relieved. What did they say? What were the wisps able to tell you? Nietzsche heaved a sigh. I wish you could travel so that you could have gone there, Zed. Maybe they would have told you more than they would tell us. They wouldn't even allow us to enter beyond this strange dead forest. Dead? Forest? What dead forest? Nietzsche lifted her hands. I don't know, Zed. I'm no expert in the outdoors. There was this vast area of oaks, but they were all dead. The oak wood is dead? Zed leaned closer to her. Are you serious? The oaks are dead? Nietzsche shrugged. I guess. They were oak trees. Richard taught me what an oak was. They were all dead, though. Zed glanced away as he scratched an eyebrow. Were there bones among these oaks? Yes, that's right, Kara said, nodding. There were bones scattered everywhere among those dead trees. Bags, Zed cursed under his breath. Why, Nietzsche asked, what is it? Zed looked up. But you talked to the wisps? Nietzsche nodded. Tam, he said his name was. Zed rubbed his chin as he stared off in thought. Tam, don't know him. There was another named Jass, Nietzsche added. Zed's mouth twisted as he considered the name. I'm afraid I don't know that one either. Jass said that Richard was looking for a woman that the wisps should know. That would have to be Kalen, Zed said with a knowing nod. That's what we figured too, Kara said. But why would he go to the wisps to look for her? His question sounded more for himself than for Nietzsche, but she answered it anyway. The Sliff wouldn't tell us about any of that part, only where she took him. Apparently Richard wasn't specific enough about what he instructed the Sliff to tell us. She won't go beyond her explicit instructions. Like you said, it's her nature. The Wisps wouldn't tell us why he had been there either. They said that his reasons for being there were his own, and were not necessarily for others to know. They said that they couldn't reveal such things on his behalf. Not for others, but... But... His voice ended in sputtering agitation. Zed looked back at both of them. But didn't they tell you anything about what Richard was doing there? Anything at all? We have to know why he would go to the Wisps. He was on his way here. And then something happened to cost him his gift while traveling. Probably something involving six. So he went to the Wisps? Why? What did they tell him? What happened when he was there? I'm sorry, Zed, Nietzsche said. We really weren't able to find out much. The Sliff did tell us some of it. What happened to Richard, where she took him, and that he went to the Wisps. But she either doesn't know anything more or she simply doesn't want to tell us the rest of it for some reason. Richard never returned to the Sliff, but because he can no longer travel, that only makes sense. It could be that the Sliff really doesn't know any more. Richard would probably have started out on foot. I imagine he would head back here to the keep. After all, that's where he was going when something went wrong in the Sliff. For some reason, he went to the Wisps, but that may have had more to do with geography than anything else. He was much closer to them than coming all the way back here, so he may have decided to make a quick stop there before heading back to us. It may be nothing more than that. As far as the wisps, they wouldn't tell us much either. They wouldn't let us go beyond the dead trees, into those huge ancient trees beyond. But there is some good news in it, we at least know for sure that Richard is alive and that he went to the land of the Wisps. That's what matters. Richard is alive. Knowing Richard, he will try to find a horse as soon as possible and will probably show up here before we know it. Zed squeezed her arm. You're right, my dear. It was a gesture that Nietzsche found comforting, 
almost as if it were a connection to Richard himself. It was the kind of reassurance Richard himself would have offered at such a troubling moment. Zed suddenly frowned. You said the wisps wouldn't let you into the big pines? Nietzsche nodded. That's right. They wouldn't let us proceed any farther than the dead oak woods, or allow us to see the other wisps. In a way, it makes sense. Zed ran a finger up along his temple as he considered. The wisps are secretive creatures, and don't generally allow anyone into their land. But it seems odd under the circumstances, and with word from me, that they wouldn't welcome you in. They're dying. Zed's eyes turned up at her. What? Tam said that the wisps were dying out, and that was why they didn't want us to enter. He said that it's a time of great strife among the wisps, great sadness and worry. They didn't want strangers among them right now. Dear spirits, Zed whispered, Richard was right. Nietzsche's insides tightened with anxiety. What are you talking about? Richard is right about what? The oaks dying. They protect the land of the wisps. The wisps are dying too. It's part of a cascade of events. Richard already told us why in this very room. As if I needed yet more reason to believe him. Yet more reason. What do you mean by that? He took Nietzsche's elbow and turned her toward the spell forms floating above the table. Look here. Zed, Nietzsche said in admonition, that's the chain fire verification web, and it looks suspiciously like an interior perspective. That's right. I know I'm right. The question is, what's going on? What are you up to? I found a way to ignite a kind of simulation of an interior perspective, one without you needing to be in it. It isn't the same in every respect, he said with a dismissive gesture, but for the purpose I had in mind, it was good enough. Nietzsche was astonished that he had been able to do such a thing. It was almost somewhat disquieting to again see the very thing that had almost taken her life but that wasn't at all what she found most disturbing. Why are there two of them? she asked. There is only one chain fire spell. Why are there two spell forms here? Zed flashed her a wry smile. Ah, there is the trick of it. You see, Richard claimed that the chimes had been present in the world of life. If that were true... Their presence would have contaminated the world of life, would have contaminated magic. And yet none of us has seen any evidence of it. That is the paradox of such contamination. It erodes your ability to detect its presence. I wanted to find a way to see if Richard was right. Richard Rawl is right. Zed shrugged one bony shoulder at her emphatic declaration. But I needed to see if I could actually find any evidence. I didn't understand all that emblem business Richard was going on about. I believe in him too, Nietzsche, but I don't understand how he can see language in symbols the way he does, how he was able to come to the conclusions that he does. I need to see proof I understand. Nietzsche folded her arms as she stared at the twin spell forms. I guess I know how you feel. I believe in him, and he makes sense, but I sometimes feel lost, like I used to as a novice, when there would be a test on things that were taught when I hadn't been in class. When Richard... Nietzsche fell silent. Her arms came unfolded. Zed, those two spell forms aren't the same. His smile grew sly. I know that. Nietzsche stepped closer to the table, closer to the two forms made of glowing lines. She inspected them more carefully. She pointed at one. That one is the chain fire spell. I recognize it. This other is identical, but it's not the same. It's a mirror image of the real spell. I know. He looked rather proud of himself. 
that's impossible. I thought so too, but then I remembered a book named The Book of Inversion and Duplex. Nietzsche rounded on the old wizard. You know where the Book of Inversion and Duplex is? Zed gestured vaguely. Well, yes, I managed to lay my hands on a copy. Nietzsche eyed him suspiciously. Lay your hands on a copy? Zed cleared his throat. The point is, he said, taking her arm and turning her back to the glowing lines and the subject at hand, I remembered from reading that book many, many years ago that it talked about techniques to duplex spell forms. It never made any sense to me at the time. Why would anyone want to duplex a spell form? But there was more. The book went on to give instructions on how to invert the spell form that had first been duplexed. Craziest thing I'd ever heard of. At the time, I dismissed the book and its obscure procedures. What could be the purpose of such a thing? Who would ever need to do such a thing? No one, I thought. He held up a finger. And then, when thinking about the possibility of contamination left by the chimes and trying to think of a way to prove Richard's theory, I suddenly remembered reading that book once, and it hit me. I knew why someone would want to duplicate and invert a spell form. Nietzsche was getting lost. All right, I give up. Why? Zed gestured excitedly to the two spell forms. This is why. Look, this one is the original, much like the one you were in, but without some of the more complex and unstable elements. Zed waved a hand, stressing that it was beside the point. We don't need them for this purpose. This one here is the exact same spell, duplicated and then inverted. It's a copy. I understand that much of it, Nietzsche said, but I still don't see what purpose it could serve to perform such a strange analysis. Smiling knowingly, Zed touched his fingers to the side of her shoulder. Flaws. Flaws? What about... Nietzsche gasped with comprehension. When you turn a spell inside out and backward, the flaw won't invert. That's right, Zed said with an impish twinkle and an instructive shake of his first finger. The flaw won't invert. It can't. The spell form is just a demonstration of the spell, a surrogate for something real. Therefore, it can be manipulated, inverted. It's not the real spell. You couldn't invert a real spell. But flaws are not subject to the influence of the magic in books of instruction. Only the specific target magic is. The flaw is real. The flaw resides whole. Zed turned solemn with the deadly serious nature of the material issue. When the spell form is activated, it carries with it the flaw, which is already embedded. When you duplicate the spell form, it carries the same flaw. But then when you invert it, the flaw can't invert because it's real, not a stand-in for something real like spell forms are. Don't forget that contamination was what nearly killed you. Nietzsche looked from Zed's intense hazel eyes to the two glowing spell forms. They were mirrored. She started searching the structure, seeing each line, each element, looking to the other spell form that was the same but flipped. And then she saw it. There, she breathed, pointing. That part there is identical in both. It's not flipped. It's not a mirror image like everything else. It's the same in both of these while everything else is inverted. Exactly, Zed said in triumph. Hence the purpose of the book of inversion and duplex, to discover flaws that can't otherwise be seen or detected. Nietzsche stared at the old man, seeing him in a new light. She had known of the book of inversion and duplex, but like everyone else who had studied it, she had never understood its purpose. 
There had been debate about it, of course, but no one could ever offer a purpose for such an esoteric book of magic. It defied the conventional wisdom on the functioning and purpose of magic. In the end, it had been dismissed as a mere curiosity from a time past. In fact, it had been presented in lectures as just that, an oddity, a relic of ancient times, useless but nonetheless an object of note simply because it had survived. Zed, like Richard, never dismissed any bit of knowledge. Like all knowledge collected, he kept it catalogued somewhere in the back of his mind in case it ever came up again. When he had trouble finding an answer, he would check his memory of forgotten things residing in an index in some dusty corner of his mind. Richard did the same thing. Knowledge, once acquired, remained in his arsenal. It enabled him to put things together in new ways, to come up with surprising solutions that often challenged old established ways of doing things. Many people found such a way of thinking, especially when it had to do with magic, treading dangerously close to heresy. Nietzsche saw its true value. Real answers to problems came from just such a process of thought logic, and reason, all based on what was known. It was the essence of a seeker, the foundation of what he did in his search for truth. It was also one of the central qualities about Richard that so captivated Nietzsche. He was a student without formal training who was able to intuitively grasp the most complex issues in a way no one else could. Zed leaned in, pulling Nietzsche with him. Look here. See this? Do you recognize it? The part that didn't invert? Nietzsche shook her head. No. What is it? It's the contamination left by the chimes. This I recognize. This is the spider in the web of magic. Nietzsche straightened. This proves that Richard was right then. The boy got it right, Zed agreed. I don't really understand how, but he had it exactly right. Once it's isolated like this, I recognize the corrosion left by the chimes, the same as I recognize the reddish-brown scale of rust. He was able to see it in the language of the lines, and he was right. The spell is contaminated. The source of that contamination was the chimes. This is the mechanism by which the chimes erode and destroy magic. If it has infected this spell, it has to have infected other things of magic as well. Is that what's killing the night wisps? Kara asked. I'm afraid it would seem that way, Zed told her. The oaks around their home place are also invested with protective magic. That both the oaks and the wisps are dying out together is suspicious in the extreme. Nietzsche walked to the windows, watching the indistinct fits of lightning through the opaque glass. Creatures of magic are dying out, just as Richard told us. She missed him so much that mournful anguish passed through her like the shadow of death itself darkening her soul. She felt like she would shrivel and die if she didn't see him soon. She felt like she could not survive if she never got the chance to see him again, see the life in his gray eyes. Zed, do you think he was right about the rest of it? Do you think that there really were dragons, and we've all forgotten that there were such things in the world? Do you think Richard was right that the world we knew is passing out of existence, vanishing into the realm of legend? Zed sighed. I don't know, my dear. I really don't. I'd like to think the boy is wrong in that much of it. But I learned a long time ago not to bet against Richard. Nietzsche smiled to herself. She had learned the same thing. Chapter 53 Nietzsche, Zed said, hesitating as he gestured vaguely, seeming to search for words, 
You are, well, someone who holds Richard in the same regard as I do, feels a similar passion and loyalty for him. In many ways, you almost seem like... He threw his hands up and let them flop back down at his sides. I don't know. Zed, you, Kara, me, we all love Richard, if that's what you're trying to say. I guess that's the core of it. I don't have any recollection at all of Kalen, but I imagine I must think of you in much the same way I can only imagine I must have thought of her, as more than just his confidant sharing the same struggle. Nietzsche felt as if she had just been hit by lightning. She dared not allow herself to even begin to consider the emotional charge in his words. With the greatest of difficulty, she managed to keep her composure and merely twitch her brow, finally asking, What are you getting at? Like Kara and Richard, I've come to think a great deal of you, especially considering what I thought of you in the beginning. I've come to trust you, like I say, as I would trust a daughter-in-law. Nietzsche swallowed, but didn't meet his gaze. Thank you, Zed. Considering where I came from, and what I thought of myself in the beginning, that means more to me than you could know. To have people actually, sincerely... She cleared her throat, and finally looked up at him. Despite how his words hit her, she didn't think that he meant them to have any meaning, but merely to preface something important. You want to tell me something? He nodded. I've learned some other things, greatly disturbing things. I would not tell anyone else such things, but, well... Other than Richard himself, there is no one I would trust more than you and Kara. You two have become more than friends in all of this. I'm only trying to find a way to express to you how much... When his words trailed away and he stared off into the distance, Nietzsche gently laid a hand on his shoulder. We'll get him back, Zed. I promise you that. But you're right in how we feel about him. Richard completely changed my life. If there's something you need to talk about, I would like to think that you can trust Kara and me almost as much as you would trust Richard. I think that's what you're getting at. We all feel the same about him and about our cause. I... Well... She tapped her fingertips together. You know what I mean. Fearing she'd already said too much, Nietzsche felt her face turning red. What I'm trying to say, Zed finally said, is that I need your help, and I want you to know what you both mean to me, that I do not now reveal these things lightly or capriciously. All my life I've kept secrets because they had to be kept, it's not the easiest thing to do, but that's just the way it is. Things have changed, though, and I can no longer keep certain knowledge to myself. There is so much more involved now than there ever was before. Nietzsche nodded and turned her full attention to the wizard. I understand. I'll do what I can to be worthy of your trust. Zed pursed his lips. That book... The Book of Inversion and Duplex was hidden in a place no one but me knows exists. It was in the catacombs beneath the keep. Nietzsche shared a look with Kara. Zed, she asked, are you saying that there are bones beneath the keep? And there are books there as well? Zed nodded. A lot of books. That was where I found the Book of Inversion and Duplex. He took a few steps away to stare at the windows flickering with light from the storm beyond the containment field. No one that I'm aware of ever knew the place of the bones was down there. I found it when I was a boy. I knew that no other person had been in there for ages, 
Not a single footprint had marred the dust on the floors in thousands of years. I was the first to make a mark in that dust of ages. I did not need to be told the significance of that fact. As a boy, it rather frightened me to find those ancient catacombs. I was already spooked because I was trying to find a way to sneak back into the keep. When I found the catacombs, I knew instinctively that it would not be hidden as it was unless there was a good reason. So, as much as I wanted to at times, I never told anyone about it. I almost felt as if the place had allowed me entry but in return required my silence. I not only took my attitude of responsibility seriously, I felt genuinely protective of such an undiscovered place. It contained, after all, the remains of a great many people, perhaps even my own ancestors. I knew that there were always those who would exploit such a find, and I didn't want that to happen to a place so clearly held in sacred regard by those who had hidden it. Added to that, I felt rather guilty for having disturbed such a burial place for the feeble reason of trying to sneak back in to avoid getting in trouble for having gone out without permission in the first place. I had slipped out of the keep to go to the market down in Aidendrill to look at all the exciting baubles being hawked there, it seemed so much more fascinating than the dry studies to which I was supposed to be devoting my time. After my chance discovery, I quietly asked veiled questions and found that not even the old wizards I knew had any knowledge of the place beneath the keep. Over time, I came to realize that such a place was not even suspected much less rumored to exist. As a boy, I had a lot of studies that took up nearly all my time. Back then, there were many people living in the keep, and with my assignments, I never had a chance to spend, in total, more than a couple of hours down there. I quickly found that there were many of the same books that we had up in the keep, so, as a boy, I came to believe that it wasn't as important a find as I had at first believed it to be. He smiled distantly. I fancied myself a great explorer, discovering ancient treasures. This treasure was mostly bones and books. There were endless dry books up here in the keep that I had to study, so yet more books wasn't exactly as exciting as thoughts of constructed spells encased in amber or jewel-encrusted curses. But there was none of that down there, just crumbling bones and old books. There are rooms upon rooms down in the catacombs filled with dusty old books. I never had much time to explore those rooms, I can't even begin to guess at the numbers of books hidden down there. I never had time to do more than look at a small sampling. As I said, many I'd seen before up in the keep, and of the ones I hadn't, at such a young age none of them impressed me enough to remember, except a few, such as the Book of Inversion and Duplex. When I grew up, I fell in love with the most wonderful woman, and soon she was my wife. She gave birth to the other light in my life, a daughter who grew up to be Richard's mother. As a young wizard working at the keep, there was always more to do than there were hours in the day. There was no time to spend down among old bones. And then the world was cast into a terrible war with Dahara. It was a dark time of terrible struggle. I had become first wizard. The battles were gruesome as battles always are. I had to send men to die. I had to look into the eyes of wizards, young and old, that I knew were not up to the challenges, and tell them to do their best, when I knew their best would not be good enough.
and they would likely die in the effort. I knew in my heart that if I were to do it myself, it would get done, and I could make it work. But there were a lot of those kinds of tasks that needed to be done, and only one of me. At times I found responsibility, knowledge, and ability were a curse. To look at all the innocent people counting on me as first wizard, and know that if I failed they would die, was almost more than I could endure. In that respect, I know exactly what Richard is going through. I have been in his place. I have carried the world on my shoulders. He gestured to dismiss his melancholy departure from the subject at hand. Anyway, with all my other responsibilities, the catacombs lay mostly forgotten, as they had for thousands of years before I ever came along. I simply had no time to look into what might be down there. From my limited search as a boy, I believed that there was nothing to be found but old and comparatively unimportant books buried along with forgotten bones. There seemed to be so many more pressing matters of life and death. To me, the most important thing about the catacombs was that they provided a secret passage for me to enter the keep. That passage came to be invaluable when the Sisters of the Dark took the wizard's keep. Back when I was younger, after the war in which my wife had died, the Council and I had a bitter dispute over the boxes of Orden. And then, Darken Rahl raped my daughter. So I left the Midlands, quit it for good, taking my daughter with me through the boundary to Westland. She was all I had left, and all that mattered to me. I thought I would live out all my days beyond the boundary in Westland. Then Richard was born. I watched him grow. My daughter was so proud of him. I secretly worried that he had the gift, and fretted that forces from beyond the boundaries would one day come for him. And then there was a fire, and all of a sudden my daughter, Richard's mother, was gone from my life, from Richard's life. I turned to Richard for solace. I gave him everything I could that would help him be all he could be. I had some of the best times of my life with him. Unbeknownst to me, as I did my best to forget the outside world, Anne and Nathan driven by prophecy, had helped George Cipher recover the Book of Counted Shadows from the Wizard's Keep. It had been stored in the First Wizard's private enclave, where I had left it for safekeeping. Wait a minute, Nietzsche said, stopping his story. You mean to tell me that the Book of Counted Shadows, one of the most important books in existence, was just lying around in the keep? Well, he said, not exactly lying around. Like I said, it was in the first wizard's enclave. That's more secure than the keep in general, and not exactly an easy place to breach. If it's so secure, Nietzsche reminded him, then how did Anne and Nathan and George Cipher get in to take the book? Zed sighed as he looked up at her from under his bushy eyebrows. Therein lies what has come to trouble me. The only copy of a book that important being that vulnerable. That's what Richard was going to tell you, Nietzsche said with a sudden flash of comprehension. That's why he was in such a hurry to get back here. He said he had to get to you right away. That was the reason. Zed frowned. What are you talking about? She stepped closer to the wizard and pulled the small book from her pocket. This is the book that Dark and Rawl used to put the boxes of Orden in play. It's what? This is the book that Dark and Rawl used to put the boxes of Orden in play, she repeated to the astonished wizard. We found it at the People's Palace. I promised Richard that I would study it and see if there was a way to undo what Sister Ulyssia had done see if there was a way to perhaps take the boxes of Orden back out of play. 
I tried to explain to Richard that magic doesn't work that way, but you know Richard. He doesn't so easily accept that something can't be done. Zed stared at the book she was holding up as if it were a viper that might bite someone. That boy has a way of turning over rocks and finding trouble. Zed, this warns that to use this book, the key must be used. Otherwise, without the key, everything that has come before, meaning what has been used from this book, will not only be sterile, but fatal. It says that within one full year, the key must be used to complete what has been wrought with this book. The key, Zed whispered, as if it were the end of the world. The boxes must be opened within one year of being put into play. You need the Book of Counted Shadows to open the boxes. That book has to be the key. I think so, too, Nietzsche said. The thing is, we found information from back at the time of the Great War, saying that some wizards had made five copies of the book that was never to be copied. And you think that the book that was never to be copied was the Book of Counted Shadows? Yes. There is a book of prophecy that says they will tremble in fear at what they have done and cast the shadow of the key among the bones. Zed was staring at her as if his world were crumbling apart. Dear spirits, that sounds like it's from Yankley's yarns. That's right. The thing is, Nietzsche said, all the copies but one were false copies. Five copies. Four false, one true copy. Zed pressed a hand to his forehead. Nietzsche noticed that his breathing was faster than normal. He looked on the verge of passing out. Zed, what is it? His fingers were trembling. You know what you said about the Book of Counted Shadows being too easy to steal? That was always my thought, too, but not something I consciously dwelled on. It was more one of those thoughts in the back of your mind that never fully surfaces. Yes. Nietzsche said, waiting patiently until he went on. Well, when I remembered the book of inversion and duplex, I finally remembered where I had seen it as a boy. The catacombs. I needed it to test this spell. So while you were gone with Richard to the people's palace, I went back into the catacombs and looked for the book of inversion and duplex. Nietzsche knew what he was going to say before he said it. And while I was searching for the Book of Inversion and Duplex, I found a copy of the Book of Counted Shadows. They will tremble in fear at what they have done and cast the shadow of the key among the bones, Nietzsche quoted again. Zed nodded. All my life I never knew there was a copy of that book. I had been taught that there were no other copies. I had been taught that there was only one copy. That alone told me how important that book was. But if it's so important, then why was it not in a safer place? That question was what always stuck in the back of my mind. That was one of the reasons I was so angry with the council for giving the boxes of Orden away as gifts or favors. I knew how dangerous those boxes were, but no one would believe me. They all thought that the things I told them were only ancient superstitions or children's tales. Part of the reason that no one believed the truth of the danger that the boxes represented was that the book that was needed to put the boxes in play had never been found. Without the book, the boxes were only a fanciful tale. He pointed at the book in Nietzsche's hand. In fact, no one ever knew the name of that book. The title looks to be in High Daharan. We'll need someone to translate it. I can read High Daharan, Nietzsche said. Of course you can, Zed said, as if nothing could surprise him any more. What is its name, then? The Book of Life. Zed turned nearly as white as his wavy hair. 
Apparently he was not yet beyond shock. The Book of Life, he repeated, as he wiped a hand wearily across his face. What an appropriate name, he said. The power of Orden is spawned from life itself. Open the correct box, and one gains the power of Orden, the essence of life itself, power over all things living and dead. They would have unchallenged power. Open the wrong box, and the magic would claim them. They're dead. But open the other wrong box, and every living thing in existence is incinerated into nothingness. It would be the end of all life. The magic of Orden is twin to the magic of life itself, and death is part of everything that lives. So the magic of Orden is tied to death as well as to life, and the key is the means to know which box is which. The person opening them can take a chance, but they would be foolish to do so without using the key first to be sure of which is which. Foolish, Nietzsche said, like sisters of the dark who don't necessarily care if they open the wrong box. Zed could only stare at her. So, you were saying that you found one of the copies, Kara finally said, when Zed had fallen silent for a time, lost in thought. Nietzsche was relieved that Kara was the one to prompt him when he looked so stricken by contemplation of events so terrible she probably couldn't even begin to imagine them. I'm afraid that's not even the worst of it, he said. You see, Richard memorized the book of Counted Shadows as a boy. George Cipher feared that the book would fall into the wrong hands, but he was wise enough that he didn't dare destroy the knowledge the book contained. So he had Richard memorize it. After Richard had learned every word, he and George Cipher, the man who had raised him, and who at the time Richard believed was his father, burned the Book of Counted Shadows. When Darken Rall captured Richard and was opening the boxes, he made Richard read out the instructions from the Book of Counted Shadows. I don't recall how, probably as a result of the chain fire spell. The point is, I was there. I remember that part quite well because I was so shocked. For two reasons. First, to learn that the book had been stolen from my enclave at the keep for Richard to memorize, and secondly, because it was a book of magic, and that fact meant that Richard could only memorize and speak the words because he was gifted. When I found the copy of the Book of Counted Shadows down in the catacombs, I was shaken to my core. I read it, and sure enough, it was word for word exactly what Richard had memorized. Nietzsche cocked her head. It was the same. Are you sure? Positive, Zed said emphatically. The two were identical. Nietzsche was beginning to feel sick herself. That can mean only one of two things. Either one was the original, and the other the one true copy of the key, or else they were both false keys, false copies. No, they couldn't be false, Zed insisted. When Richard read the book out, he left out an important element at the very end. It was by leaving out that one piece of the book that he defeated Dark and Rahl. He, in essence, turned it into a false copy, thus tricking Darken Rahl to defeat him. As I often told Richard, sometimes a trick is the best magic. Nietzsche laid the book on the table. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the true key and not the false. Look at this. She laid the book of life open and tapped a page in the very beginning that had only one thing all by itself on the page to emphasize how important, how central it was. This is the introductory statement to the Book of Life. I already translated it. It's a warning to anyone who would read this book. It says, Those who have come here to hate should leave now. 
for in their hatred they only betray themselves. Zed squinted at the words in Haidaharan all by themselves on the page. So you are saying what? That because Dark and Rahl turned to the boxes of Orden out of hate, he would have been destroyed by the true Book of Counted Shadows just the same as by a false one? That's one possibility, Nietzsche said. Zed shook his head. I don't believe that. Some magic works by reading intent. The Sword of Truth works that way. People who hate don't usually recognize that vile taint within themselves. They spew their hatred as righteous. That corruption is what makes them so evil and so dangerous. They are able to do the most despicable things and think themselves heroes for having done them. Then you are going to tell me that you believe that it was coincidence, luck, that both those books just happened to be the only true keys, and they just happened to be that close together? You think that the wizards who made the copies, sending them to distant, hidden places, would have put the one true copy here right near the only other true key? What would be the purpose of scattering the copies? Zed rubbed his chin with his fingertips as he thought it over. I see what you mean. With books like this, there has to be a way to confirm the copies, to validate them. There is, Zed told her. In the beginning of the Book of Counted Shadows, it says, Verification of the truth of the words of the Book of Counted Shadows, if spoken by another rather than read by the one who commands the boxes, can only be ensured by the use of a confessor. A copy constitutes spoken by another, he said. The person making the copy is, in essence, speaking it. The reader is not actually reading the original, unless it's the original key, and that original key is actually being read by the one who put the boxes in play. This forewarning invokes the necessity of verification. Kalen, Nietzsche said. The other two looked at her, and by the looks on their faces they understood her meaning. Zed, Nietzsche finally asked into the silence, none of us remembers Kalen. If we could find her, and if we could somehow fix this chain fire spell or something, is there a way to make her remember what she right now would not recall? Zed's gaze wandered to the glowing spell forms above the table. No. Nietzsche hadn't expected such certainty. Are you sure? About as sure as I can be. The spell destroys memory. It doesn't cover it over or block it from access. It destroys it. It doesn't make people forget. It actually erases the memory. To the person upon whom such a terrible thing was unleashed, their memory is gone. But there must be some way, Kara insisted. Some magic this or that that will restore her mind. Restore it with what? What none of us can recall? Memory is the stuff of life. Magic functions in specific ways, as do all things that exist. Magic is not some superintelligent consciousness behind a veil that knows what we want to accomplish and can pull a person's entire memory, their entire life, out of a pocket and hand it back just because we wish it. Kara didn't look convinced. But Kent, look at it this way. If I push that book off the table, it will fall to the floor. The invisible force of gravity makes it happen. Gravity functions in a specific way. I can't wave my arms and, by my wish, command gravity to go make me dinner. Same with magic and memory. The chain fire spell destroyed her memory. It can't be brought back. You can't restore what was and is no longer there. You just can't. What's gone is gone. Kara drew her hand down her long blonde braid then it sounds like we are in a lot of trouble. Trouble indeed, the wizard conceded. 
Nietzsche wanted to say that Richard's heart was in a lot of trouble, but she dared not say such a thing out loud. She felt despondent for him, for what he would one day have to face, but she didn't want to be the one to point it out. Then, if Richard finds her, Nietzsche asked in a weak voice, what is he to do? Zed, hands clasped behind his back, stared at her a moment before looking away. There's another way to confirm the true copy, Kara said. Zed and Nietzsche both frowned at her, both relieved to have a diversion. You can find the other copies, she said, and compare them. The one Richard memorized is gone. So, if you find the others, you can compare them. The one that's different has to be the one true copy. The other four that are all the same have to be the false keys. Zed arched an eyebrow. And what if the people who made the false keys were worried that one day a clever Mord Sith would think of that, and so they made all the copies different from one another, so that they couldn't be compared? Kara made a face. Oh. Nietzsche threw up her arms. How would he even go about finding the others anyway? I mean, they've been hidden for three thousand years. Not only that, Zed said, but Nathan told us that there were catacombs under the Palace of the Prophets, and that place was destroyed. I know, I set the light spell myself. There would be nothing left, and even if somehow a pocket of the catacombs survived, the palace was built on an island. After the island was destroyed, water would have flooded any underground room that hadn't already been ruined. That one copy, if one of them was there, has already been destroyed. Was it a true or a false key? What if, over all this time, others have been destroyed? The question remains. How to tell if the one Richard knows and the one I found are the only true keys? Nietzsche stared off. I'm afraid they might be false copies, the one Richard memorized and the one you found down in the catacombs. Zed began pacing. I don't know any way to be sure. There might be two ways, she said. The first I can't swear to yet. I've only just started translating the Book of Life. But there is material having to do with the mention of using the key. It says that if the person who put the boxes in play fails to use the key properly, the boxes will be destroyed along with the one who put them in play. Use the key properly, Zed said, deep in thought. That seems to me to say that if Dark and Rawl would have failed to use the true key properly, such as by leaving off the last part, as you said Richard did when reciting it back to him, he would have been destroyed. But so would the boxes of Orden. As we know, the boxes of Orden weren't destroyed. So that tells me Richard may very well have read him the false key and Dark and Rawl simply opened the wrong box and it destroyed him. It doesn't say that the boxes will be destroyed if a false key is used, because at the time this was written, there were no false keys yet. So that problem hadn't been taken into consideration when this material was all created. Zed frowned in thought. Are you sure of this? No, Nietzsche admitted. It's complex, and I've only just started to translate it. I scanned that part because it pertained to using the key to complete the required steps. It also has formulas that have to be taken into account. I'm only giving you my preliminary impression. Nietzsche ran her fingers back into her hair with one hand. She stood before the table with the open book on it, with her other hand on a hip. Do you see what I mean, though? She gestured down at the book. If Richard had corrupted the true key, making Dark and Rao pick the wrong box, this seems to indicate that the boxes would have been destroyed along with Dark and Rao. That seems to support the idea 
that Richard memorized a false key. Maybe. You said you weren't sure of that yet. Zed rubbed the back of his neck as he paced. Let's not make the error of jumping to conclusions. Nietzsche nodded. You said there was something else you were going on? Zed asked. Nietzsche nodded and then quoted the central prophecy, the one Nathan had told them. In the year of the cicadas, when the champion of sacrifice and suffering, under the banner of both mankind and the light, finally splits his swarm, thus shall be the sign that prophecy has been awakened and the final and deciding battle is upon us. Be cautioned, for all true forks and their derivatives are tangled in this mantic root. Only one trunk branches from this conjoined primal origin. If Fuergrisa Ostdrauka does not lead this final battle, then the world, already standing at the brink of darkness, will fall under that terrible shadow. Do you see? Nietzsche asked. The champion of sacrifice and suffering under the banner of both mankind and the light is Jagang and the Imperial Order. The next words say that when he finally splits his swarm, thus shall be the sign that prophecy has been awakened and the final and deciding battle is upon us. He has split his army. Half is holding the passes while the other half has gone around to come up through Dahara from the south. As it says, the final and deciding battle is upon us. As if to confirm what she had said, a fit of lightning flickered through the windows, accompanied by thunder rumbling the keep beneath their feet. Zed frowned. I'm not following your reasoning. Why did Anne and Nathan steal the book in the first place for Richard? Because they misinterpreted prophecy. They thought the final battle was dark and raw. They thought that Richard needed the Book of Counted Shadows to fight Dark and Rahl in the final battle. They found the only copy in existence. They thought. Don't you see? That was too easy. Richard was born to fight this battle now with Jagang. And with what the Sisters of the Dark have done by putting the Boxes of Orden in play. This now is an extension of the same final battle begun with Dark and Rahl. I think the prophecies may hint that Richard learned the wrong key. Be cautioned, for all true forks and their derivatives are tangled in this mantic root. All true forks, true keys, are on the prophetic root of this final battle. It says that the other forks are false. Maybe other forks contain the false keys. Couldn't it be said that the battle against Dark and Rahl was a false fork? Anne and Nathan didn't know enough at the time. Not enough events had unfolded. So they went down that fork, preparing Richard to fight Dark and Rahl, not Jagang. But this prophecy says, if Fuergrisa Ostdrauka does not lead this final battle, then the world already standing at the brink of darkness, will fall under that terrible shadow. That terrible shadow is the power of Orden unleashed by the Sisters of the Dark. They want to darken the world of life. Anne, Nathan, and Richard were preparing for the wrong battle. This is the battle he was meant to fight. Zed paced, his face creased in thought. He halted finally and turned to her. Maybe, Nietzsche, maybe. You've spent a great deal more time studying prophecy than I have. Maybe you have something. But then, maybe you don't. Prophecy, as Nathan has explained, is not subject to study the way you have just explained. Prophecy is a means of communication between prophets. It can't necessarily be studied, analyzed, or understood by those without the gift for prophecy. Just like Anne and Nathan may have jumped to conclusions without sufficient information, I think it's also too early for you to draw such conclusions. Nietzsche nodded, conceding his point. 
I hope you're right, Zed. I really do. This is not an argument I want to win. I'm only bringing it up because I think we need to consider the implications. He nodded. There is something else to consider. Richard doesn't take to prophecy. He is a creature of free will, and prophecy has a way of having to open up to accommodate him. In this case, with Dark and Rawl, maybe Dark and Rawl was a false fork. But had he won, there are prophetic roots to cover that eventuality as well. Proponents of prophecy would have pointed to them to confirm that Dark and Rawl was the true root. We would now find ourselves on one of those other branches, and this one would be false. You can find a prophecy to support just about any belief. I don't know, Nietzsche said as she ran her fingers back through her hair. Perhaps you're right. She was so tired. She needed to get some sleep. Maybe then she could think more clearly. Maybe her worry was causing her to race down false trails. There is no way we can say at this point if the copies of the Book of Counted Shadows, the one I found and the one Richard knows, are true keys or false. So, what are we going to do? she asked. Zed halted his pacing and faced her. We're going to get Richard back, and he is going to find a way to stop this threat. Nietzsche smiled. He had a way of making her feel better in the darkest of times, just the way Richard did. But I'll tell you one thing, Zed said. Before that time comes, we had better find out if the key he memorized is the true or the false key. Nietzsche closed the cover on the Book of Life and picked it up, holding it in the crook of her arm. I need to learn this whole book cover to cover. I need to find out if there is a way to do what Richard asked of me, take the boxes back out of play, or somehow annul the threat. Failing that, I had better know it inside and out, so that I can hopefully be useful to Richard in finding an answer to it all. Zed appraised her eyes. That's going to be a great deal of work. It's going to take a lot of time. A book that complex could take months to fully understand. I only hope we have that much time. I have to say, though, that I agree with you. I guess that you had better get started right away. Nietzsche slipped the book back into a pocket of her dress. I guess that I had better. There may be books here that would help. If there are any I can think of, or that are mentioned, I'll let you know. From what I've seen so far, there are technical matters I may need help with. If I get stuck, I could use the help of the first wizard. Zed smiled. You have it, my dear. She shook a finger at him. But if you come up with a way to find Richard, you had better tell me before you finish having the thought. Zed's smile widened. Agreed. What if we don't find Lord Rao? Kara asked. The other two stared at her. Thunder rumbled through the distant valley. Rain pattered steadily against the windows. We'll get him back, Nietzsche insisted, refusing to consider the unthinkable. Nothing is ever easy, Zed muttered. Chapter 54 Despite how weary she was of writing... Kalin was awestruck by the sight rising up in the distance. Past a dark flood tide of men of the Imperial Order, across the purple-gray shadows settling across the vast plain, rose an enormous plateau catching the last golden rays of the setting sun. On that plateau stood a place as vast as any city. The high outer walls glowed in the waning evening light, White marble, stucco, and stone making up the vast array of buildings in an endless variety of sizes, shapes, and heights shimmered with the departing blush of daylight. Roofs sheltered the place from the coming cold night of the dying season as if gathering it all up under protective skirts. 
It was like seeing something good, something noble, something beautiful. After all she had seen for endless weeks of travel had been grim, brooding men restless for someone upon whom to vent their vile nature. It felt to Kalin as if it were a desecration having these men in the shadow of such a place as this. She felt ashamed to be among the profane rabble gathered at the feet of such a shining accomplishment of man so proudly rising up before them. Just looking at the place for some reason made her heart sing. Though she couldn't recall ever having seen it before, she felt as if she should have. All around them were grunting men, baying mules, snorting horses, creaking wagons, and the clang of armor and weapons. The sounds of the beast come to slay all that was good. The stench was like a toxic cloud that always followed along with them to serve to remind anyone they came upon just how unwholesome these men really were. As if anyone would need the additional clue. All around Kalin rode the special guards, who for weeks now had kept a watchful eye on her. There were forty-three of them. Kalin had counted, so that she could keep track of them all. She had made it her business as they traveled to learn their faces, their habits. She knew which ones were clumsy, which were stupid, which were smart, and which were good with weapons. As a game, while riding endless day after endless day, she studied their strengths and weaknesses, planning and visualizing how she could kill each and every last one of them. So far, she had not killed any. She had decided that her best chance in the long run was to go along for now with whatever she was told to do, to be compliant, to be obedient. The men had all been warned that she belonged to Jagang, and they were not to lay a finger on her, except to keep her from escaping. Kalin wanted to blend into the monotony of daily life, to have the men guarding her become lulled into thinking of her as innocuous, harmless, even cowed, so that she became just another one of their tedious chores. She'd had a number of opportunities to kill several of the men. She never took that opportunity, no matter how easy it would have been, choosing instead to let them feel comfortable, safe, even bored with her. Such inattention to the danger she represented would one day serve her better than a useless attack that, for now, could not really accomplish anything. It would not help her escape, and would only cause Jagang to use the collar, if not his hands, to bring her pain. While he needed no excuse, she saw no purpose to giving him a good one. The only one not lulled into indifference and carelessness was Jagang himself, he did not misjudge her or her will. He seemed to enjoy watching her tactics, even tactics as uninteresting as doing nothing. Like her, he carried patience in his arsenal. He was the only one not to let his guard down for an instant. Kalin thought that he knew precisely what she was doing. She ignored him as well. Even if he knew what she was doing she reasoned that it still diminished the level of caution he could maintain when nothing ever happened. Waiting for something that never came was wearing, even if you knew it was inevitable. Even if he knew that she would eventually try something, weeks and weeks of her meek compliance would buy her the element of surprise, even if it was only a momentary surprise. That instant of advantage might be all that made the difference when the time came. Sometimes, though, she could not ignore him. When he was in a foul mood and she angered him, usually by her mere presence, not anything that she did, he would beat her bloody. Twice she had had to be healed by a sister, lest she bleed to death. When he was in one of his truly vile moods, it usually ended up being a great deal worse than a simple beating. He was a very inventive man when it came to how to abuse a woman. 
when he was in an abusive mood, not simple pain, but humiliation seemed to fascinate him. She had learned that he would not stop until he made her finally cry for one reason or another. If she did cry, it was only when she could not help it, when she fell to depths of such pain or humiliation or despair that she simply could not hold back her tears. Jagang enjoyed watching her cry then. She did not do it just to give in, to make him stop what he was doing, but only because she was at a point where she could not help herself. And that was what he liked seeing. At other times, he would bring women to his tent while Kaylin had to stay on the carpet beside the bed where she was always made to sleep as if she were his dog. He usually brought some unfortunate captive woman who was less than willing. He seemed to seek out captives who most feared his attention and then gave them a violent introduction to being a slave to the emperor and his bed. When he fell asleep, Kalin would hold the terrified woman, tell her that things would one day be better, and comfort her as best she could. He might have done it because he enjoyed such things, but that was only a side benefit. His real objective was to constantly remind Kalin of what would happen to her once her memory returned. Kalin intended it never to return. Her memory would be her undoing. Now that they had arrived at their destination, there would be more time for Jala games. Kalin imagined that there would be tournaments. She hoped that they would divert Jagang's attention from her, keep him occupied. She would have to accompany him. She was made to stay close, but that was better than being alone with him. As they arrived at the Emperor's tents, she was at first a little puzzled that the compound specifically and the camp in general was so far from their distant objective. He was so close. It seemed that it was only a matter of another hour's ride or two and they would be there. Kalin didn't ask why they had stopped short, but she soon found out when officers arrived for a nightly briefing. I want all the sisters on watch tonight, Jigang told them. This close there is no telling what sorts of wicked powers the enemy up there might send down on us. Kalin noticed that sisters Ulyssia and Armina, not far away, were relieved to overhear such orders. It meant they wouldn't be sent to entertain the men. In the long march of weeks, after being sent to the tents almost nightly as punishment for their transgressions against Jagang, they both looked to have aged years. They both had been rather attractive women, but no more. They both had lost whatever beauty they once possessed. Their eyes, heavy with dark bags, were rather hollow and distant. Sister Armina's sky-blue eyes seemed to always look startled, as if she still couldn't believe her fate. Creases had come to their faces, giving them both a heavy, drained, downcast look. They were always dirty, their hair perpetually tangled, and their clothes worn. They often showed up in the morning with lurid bruises. Kaylin didn't like to see anyone suffer, but she could not work up any sympathy for these two. Were it not for them, she would not be in the clutches of a man who was only counting the moments until she recovered her memory and he could begin in earnest to make her suffer what he had promised to be insufferable agony, both physically and mentally. He had promised her more than once that when she had her memory back, he was going to impregnate her, and she was going to bear him a child, a male, he always claimed. He always added a cryptic message about how when she had her memory back, she would then truly understand just what a monster such a male child would be to her. As far as Kalin was concerned, whatever Jagang did to those two women was not enough. Beyond what they had done to her, by hearing bits and pieces, Kalin had put together the nature of their plot and what those two had planned to do to everyone. 
That alone made it impossible to treat them too brutally. If it was Kalin's choice, though, she would simply have put them to death. Kalin held no favor with torture. She simply believed that they did not deserve to continue to live. They had forfeited their right to live by the harm they had already done to others and by what they planned to do to deprive everyone of their lives. By that measure, the entire army deserved to die. Kalin only wished that Jagang could suffer a similar fate. At least their army has fled, one of the senior officers said to Jagang as the emperor's horse was led away. Another man took Kalin's mare. The officer was missing half his left ear. It had long since healed over in a lump, becoming a distraction that was hard to ignore. Men who didn't ignore it sometimes lost an ear. They have no defenders left, another officer said. I'm sure they have gifted up there, Jagang said. But they shouldn't present an obstacle that can stop us. The reports of the scouts and spies say that the road up the side is narrow, too narrow for any kind of mass assault. There is also a drawbridge that they have raised. Bringing building materials up that road and then defending ourselves while we tried to span the chasm would be hard to do. As for the great door leading to the interior way up into the plateau, it has been closed. No one entertains any faith in breaching that door. It has stood for thousands of years against any assault. Besides, the reports from the gifted say that their powers are weakened near the palace. Jagang smiled. I have some ideas. The man missing part of his ear bowed his head. Yes, Excellency. As Jagang and his officers talked, Kalin noticed a small cluster of men in the distance riding at breakneck speed through the camp. They were coming up from behind, from the south. At every checkpoint, the men brought their horses to a skidding halt, spoke briefly to sentries, and were ushered through. Jagang had noticed the riders, too. His conversation with his officers dwindled away, and soon all of them were watching with the Emperor as the riders made it to the inner defenses and dismounted in a cloud of dust. They waited at the final ring of steel for permission to enter the Emperor's compound. Side 18, Phantom, by Terry Goodkind. Continuing on page 554. When Jagang signaled, the men were brought forward. They came with haste, despite how tired they looked. The man at their lead was a wiry fellow, older, with a hard look in his dark eyes. He saluted. Well, Jagang said, what is it that's so urgent? Excellency, cities in the old world have come under attack. Is that so? Jagang heaved an impatient sigh. It's those insurrectionists, mostly from Alturang. Haven't they been put down yet? No, Excellency, it is not insurrectionists, although they are causing trouble as well, led by one called the Blacksmith. Too many places have been attacked for it to be the doings of insurrectionists. Jagang eyed the man suspiciously. What places have come under attack? The man pulled a scroll out from inside his dusty shirt. Here is the list we have collected so far. So far, Jagang asked, arching an eyebrow as he unfurled the scroll. Yes, Excellency. The information is that there is a wave of destruction sweeping across the land. Jagang scanned the long list of places on the scroll. Kalin tried not to appear obvious as she glanced at the report out of the corner of her eye. She saw two columns of towns and cities listed. There had to be more than 35 or 40 places written on the scroll. I don't know what you mean by sweeping across the land, Jagang growled. These places are all random. They're not located in a line or cluster or one area of the old world. They're all over the place. 
The man cleared his throat. Yes, Excellency. That is the report. Some of this has to be overstated. To make his point, Jagang jabbed the paper with a fat finger. The silver rings on each finger flashed in the fading light. Takamar, for instance. Takamar has been attacked. It couldn't have been very effective for a malcontent mob of fools to attack such a place. There are troop garrisons there. It's a transfer station for supply trains. There are ample defenses in place. There are even brothers of the Fellowship of Order in charge of the place. They wouldn't have allowed a rabble to have their way in Takamar. This report most likely is overstated by nervous fools who are afraid of their own shadow. The man bowed apologetically. Excellency, Takamar was one of the places I saw with my own eyes. Well, Jagang roared, what did you see then? Out with it. The roads into the city from every direction are lined with stakes topped with charred skulls, the man began. How many skulls? Jagang waved dismissively. Dozens? As many as a hundred? Excellency, there are numbers beyond counting, and I stopped counting at several thousand without having made much headway in a full tally. The city itself is no more. No more, Jagang blinked in confusion. What do you mean, no more? Such a thing is impossible. It has been burned to the ground, Excellency. There was not a single building left standing. The fires were so intense that the lumber cannot be salvaged. The orchards all the way out into the hills were all cut down. The fields of ripe crops for miles and miles in every direction have all been burned. The ground has been salted. Nothing will ever grow there again. A once fertile place will never support anything again. It looks like the keeper himself destroyed the place. Well, where were the soldiers? What were they doing during all this? The skulls on stakes were the soldiers garrisoned there. Every last one of them, I'm afraid. Jagang cast a look at Kalin, as if she were somehow responsible for the catastrophe. His glare told her that he somehow associated the trouble with her. He crushed the paper in his fist as he returned his attention to the messenger. What about the brothers of the Order? Did they say what happened and why they weren't able to stop it? There were six brothers assigned to Takama, Excellency. They were impaled on posts placed in the middle of different roads into the city. Each had been skinned from the neck down. A cap of office was left on each man's head so that all could know who they were. The masses of people who fled the city say that the attack came at night. As terrified as they were, we weren't able to get much useful information from them, other than that the men who attacked them were soldiers of the Daharan Empire. They were all sure of that much. Every one of these people has lost their home. The attackers made no move to slaughter the escaping refugees if they offered no armed resistance, but they made it quite clear to the fleeing people that they intended to lay waste to all of the old world and anyone who supports the imperial order. The soldiers told the people that it is the order and their beliefs that has brought this strife upon them, and who will bring them and their land to ruin. The soldiers vowed that they would haunt the people of the old world into their graves, and then into the darkest corners of the underworld, if they did not give up the teachings of the order, and their belligerent ways that flowed from those teachings. Kalin only realized that she was smiling when Jagang rounded on her and backhanded her hard enough to knock her from her feet. She knew that he was going to beat her bloody that night. She didn't care. It was worth it to hear what she had just heard. She couldn't stop smiling. Chapter 55 Nietzsche pulled her cloak tighter around herself, as she leaned one shoulder up against the great stone Merlin. She peered down through the crenellation to the road far below, 
watching the four riders making their way up the mountain toward the keep. They were still quite a distance, but she thought she had a good idea of who they were. Nietzsche yawned as she looked out over the city of Adendril below and the vast carpet of forests all around. The vivid colors of autumn were beginning to fade. Looking at the trees spreading up onto the slopes of the surrounding mountains and how they so boldly heralded the change of seasons made her think about Richard. He loved the trees. Nietzsche had come to love them too because they reminded her of him. She saw the trees in a different light for other reasons as well. They marked the turn of time, the passing of seasons, the change of patterns. That were part of her world now, too, because of their connection to all the things she had been studying in the Book of Life. It was all intricately interconnected, how the power of Orden worked, and how that power functioned through its connection to the world of life. The world the seasons, the stars, the position of the moon were parts of the equation, all parts of what contributed to and governed the power of Orden. The more she studied and the more she learned, the more she felt that pulse of time and life that was all around her. She had also come to recognize with complete clarity that Richard had memorized a false key. She never made the point to Zed, it seemed unimportant for the present. It was also a difficult case to make. It wasn't so much what the Book of Life said, but how it said it. The book was in another language, and not just Haidaharan. While it was written in Haidaharan, the true language of the book was its interconnection to the power invoked through it. The formulas, spells, and procedures were only one aspect. In many ways... It reminded her of how Richard spoke so convincingly of the language of symbols and emblems. She was coming to understand what he meant by seeing it for herself all laid out in the Book of Life. She was coming to see the lines and angles in certain formulas as a language all their own. She was beginning to truly grasp what Richard meant. The Book of Life carried meaning that had forced Nietzsche to look at the world of life in a new way, in a way that very much reminded her of the way Richard had always looked at the world, through a prism of excitement, wonder, and love of life. In a way, it was a profound recognition of the precise nature of things, an appreciation of things for what they were, not for what people imagined of them. In part, that was because the book of life was not just additive, but subtractive magic, in the same way that death was part of the process of life. It dealt with the whole. For that reason, Nietzsche couldn't explain it to Zed. He didn't possess the ability to use subtractive magic. Without that ability, a constituent part of what was needed to understand the Book of Life was missing. She could explain the formulas, lay out the procedures, show him the spells but much of it he could only observe through the filter of his limited ability. While he could intellectually understand some of it, he couldn't actually perform what was involved. It was something like the difference between hearing about love, understanding the depth of such feelings, grasping how it affected people, but never having actually experienced it. Without that experience, it was only academic, sterile, until you felt the magic, you didn't know it. It was in that sense that Nietzsche had come to know that Richard had memorized a false key. She had been right before in that if the person who put the boxes in play failed to use the key properly, the boxes would be destroyed along with the one who put them in play. But it was more than that simple statement. There was the whole complex nature of the processes involved in using the boxes that demonstrated that concept in ways that the words only presented in a simplified, condensed manner. Through the mechanisms in the book, she could glimpse how the power functioned. By understanding that function on a profound level, she could see how the magic, if invoked, needed and used the key for completion. Through grasping that process, she could see how, if the key was used improperly, 
the boxes themselves were inescapably destroyed, along with the person making the fatal mistake. The magic simply would not allow such a breach to go uncompleted. It would be like tossing a rock, and without any outside influence or intervention, having it float in midair rather than fall back to the ground. It simply would not happen. In the same way, the magic of Orden had laws of its identity. By the way it functioned, by those laws of its identity, it had to destroy the boxes if the key was not used properly. The rock has to fall. When Richard used his memory of what he believed was the Book of Counted Shadows, he changed it in order to trick Darkenral into opening the wrong box. But it had only been the wrong box named in a clever simulation that seemed as if it had meaning to the Book of Life. In fact, such a book was only a shrewd fake, a false key. Had it been real and misused in such a way, the boxes would no longer exist. A false key, a clever fake, simply could not trigger the power of Orden to destroy the boxes, but the real key, if used in the fashion that Richard had used it, would have caused the entire structure of spell to collapse in on itself, taking the boxes with it. The boxes of Orden, after all, had been created for the purpose of countering the chain fire spell. To misuse the key meant that someone without the proper intention and knowledge was trying to gain access to Orden's power, in essence, tampering with the purpose for which it had been created. The Book of Life made it all too clear within the structure of the spell forms that, as a safeguard, if everything was not done correctly, namely completed with the key in the exact prescribed manner, the formulas and spells would self-destruct, not altogether unlike the way in which Richard had shut down the verification web, collapsing it to save Nietzsche. Richard had memorized a false key. That was the truth of it. What is it? came Zed's voice. Nietzsche looked back over her shoulder to see the old wizard marching across the vast rampart. She knew that she had to set aside the things she had been considering. Telling Zed about the false key now would only cause him to want to argue. Arguing with Zed would serve no purpose. Richard was the one who really needed to know that the key he possessed was false. Four riders, Nietzsche told him. Zed came to a halt at the wall. He peered down at the road and grunted to indicate that he saw them. Looks like Tom and Friedrich to me, Kara said. They must have found someone sneaking around. I don't think so, Nietzsche said. They hardly look like prisoners. I can see a glint of steel. The man is carrying weapons. Tom would have disarmed anyone he thought was a threat. Besides, the other one looks like a little girl. Rachel? Zed asked, frowning as he leaned out farther, trying to see better between the trees far down the road. It would not be many more days until those golden brown leaves were gone for the season. Do you really think it could be her? That's my guess, Nietzsche said. He turned and appraised her critically. You look terrible. Thank you, she said. Just what a woman likes to hear from a gentleman. He huffed a dismissal of his rude manners. When's the last time you got any sleep? Nietzsche yawned again. I don't know. Last summer, when I came back from the People's Palace with that book. He made a face at her rather poor attempt at humor. She didn't know why she tried to be funny with him. Zed could make people laugh just by grunting. Whenever she said anything she thought was rather amusing, people just stared at her, the way Kara was doing. How is it coming? he asked. Nietzsche knew what he meant. She pulled some hair back off her face, holding it back from the grasp of the wind. I could use your help with some star charts and angle calculations. It might speed things up if I didn't have to do those myself. I could go on to some of the other translations and problems. Zed laid a hand tenderly on her back, giving her a gentle rub that conveyed a personal comforting warmth. 
on one condition. What's that? she asked as she yawned again. You get some sleep. Nietzsche smiled as she nodded. All right, Zed. She gestured, pointing with her chin. First, I think we had better get down there to see who our guests are. They were just coming out the big door of the keep at the side entrance with the paddock when the riders came under the arched opening in the wall. Tom and Friedrich were escorting Chase and Rachel. Rachel's hair was chopped short, rather than long the way it had been, and Chase looked to be in surprisingly good health for a man who had been stabbed with the Sword of Truth. Chase! Zed shouted. You're alive! Well, it's hard to ride a horse upright when you're dead. Kara chuckled. Nietzsche glanced at her, wondering where the woman's sudden appreciation for humor had come from. Found them returning, Tom said. First people we've seen out there in months. It was good to see Rachel back, Friedrich said. The older man regarded the girl with a grin, showing how much he really meant it. Zed caught Rachel as she slipped from the saddle while Kara took the reins of the horse. My, but you're getting heavy, Zed told her. Chase rescued me, Rachel said. He was so brave you should have seen him. He killed a hundred men all by himself. A hundred? My, my, what an accomplishment. You stabbed one in the leg for me, Chase said as he swung down out of his saddle. Otherwise, I'd only have gotten ninety-nine. Rachel kicked her legs, eager to be put down. Zed, I brought something important with me. Once on the ground, she untied a leather bag hanging right behind her saddle. She brought it to the granite steps and set it down, then undid the drawstring. When she pushed back the leather covering, darkness came out into the crisp late autumn daylight. To Nietzsche, it felt like looking into the inky obscurity of Jagang's eyes. Rachel, Zed said in astonishment, where did you get this? A man, Samuel, who had Richard's sword, had it. He stabbed Chase and took me with him. Then he gave it to a witch woman named Six and to Violet, the Queen of Tamarang, though I don't think she's queen anymore. You can't believe how evil Six is. I think I can imagine, Zed told her. Having a little trouble following the story, he lifted the leather back a little for a better look inside. Staring at one of the boxes of Orden sitting on the steps before her, Nietzsche felt as if her heart were in her throat. After the weeks and weeks of study of the book that went with the boxes, to actually see one was startling. Theory was one thing, but to see the reality of what this object represented was altogether something else. I couldn't let them have it, Rachel told Zed, so when I got a chance to escape, I stole it and took it with me. Zed ruffled her chopped-off blonde hair. You did good, little one. I always knew you were special. Rachel hugged the wizard around the neck. Six made Violet draw pictures of Richard. It scared me to see what they were doing. In a cave? Zed asked. When Rachel nodded, he glanced up at Nietzsche. That explains a lot. Nietzsche took a step closer. Was Richard there? Did you see him? Rachel shook her head. No. Six left one day. When she finally came back, she told Violet that she had been bringing him back but the Imperial Order captured him. The Imperial Order, Zed said. Nietzsche tried to imagine what was worse, the witch woman having Richard in her clutches, or the Imperial Order capturing him. She guessed that what was the worst was Richard stripped of his gift, his sword, and being in the hands of the Order. Chapter 56 Kaelin pulled her cloak tighter around herself as she walked beside the Emperor, his constant, compliant companion. It was not by choice, of course, but by force, whether applied or implied. At night she slept on the carpet beside his bed, a constant reminder of where she would end up. 
During the day, she remained always at his side, like his dog on a leash. Her leash, though, was an iron collar, with which he could bring her to heel at any time. She could not imagine what would engender such hatred for her, what could have given rise to his burning need to bring punishment down on her for the sins he saw in all his enemies. Whatever she had done to earn his hatred, he deserved it. When a gust of bitter cold wind ripped through the encampment, Kalin hid the side of her face behind her cloak. Men turned their faces away from the blast of grit carried in the wind. With autumn rapidly drawing to an end, winter would soon be upon them. Kalin didn't think it was going to be at all pleasant out on the open plain around the plateau that held the people's palace, but she also knew that with this bone in his teeth, Jagang wasn't going to let it go for anything. He was nothing if not tenacious. There was supposed to be another copy of the Book of Counted Shadows hidden somewhere within that plateau, and Jagang meant to have it. Out on the Azrith Plain, the construction ground onward. It had been going on throughout the autumn, and she knew it would go on into winter, all winter if necessary, until it was complete. If, that was, the ground beneath them didn't freeze solid... Kalin suspected that he had plans if that were to happen, probably fires if needed to keep the dirt thawed. She supposed, too, that if it remained dry, the ground could still be dug even if it was freezing. There was no way to breach the great inner door into the plateau, and the road up the outside had quickly proven worthless for an attack by such vast numbers of men. Jagang had a solution to the predicament. He intended to construct a great ramped road which would allow his army to march right up to the walls of the palace atop the plateau. He told his officers that once they reached the walls, siege machines could be used to batter their way through the walls. First, though, they had to get up there. To that end, out beyond the vast encampment closer to the plateau, the army was constructing the ramp. The width of the ramp was staggering. They needed it wide for two reasons, both equally important. They needed a ramp wide enough to eventually support an assault massive enough that it couldn't be turned back by the defenders. Just as important, the plateau towered above the Azrith plain. For the ramp to reach that height, the base had to be monumental lest the whole thing collapse. They had to, in essence, build a small mountain up against the plateau in order to reach the top. Tenacious indeed. The distance they had to their goal, from where they had started, was daunting. Because of the height, it required great length so that men and equipment could eventually be marched and rolled up the roadway they were building up to the very walls of the people's palace. It seemed at first to be a crazy idea, an impossible project. But what could be accomplished with millions of men who had nothing else to do and a driven emperor who cared nothing about their well-being was nothing short of astonishing. Every moment there was light, and sometimes by torchlight, long snaking files of men either carried containers of dirt and rock to the site of the ever-growing ramp or dug up great mounds of supplies. Rock was mixed with the finer soil to make it stable. Other men had simple weighted tampers to pack the new dirt as it was dumped. Nearly all the men in camp were engaged in the enterprise. Though the task was daunting, the progress made by so many men was continual. Inexorably, the ramp continued to grow. Of course, the higher it got, the longer it was going to take, because it would require so much more material. Kalin thought it appropriate that such men would assault fine construction of marble with dirt. It befitted the philosophy of the order to grub in the dirt in order to bring down some of man's finest work. Kalin couldn't imagine how long it was going to take to complete such a project, but Jagang had no intention of abandoning his plan 
until he was successful. The end was in sight, he often reminded his officers, and he expected complete devotion and sacrifice from all for their noble purpose. He was implacable in his determination to bring down the last bastion of freedom. From the edge of the emperor's compound, as they observed the construction, Kalin saw a messenger coming in on horseback. To the south, she could see the long plume of dust rising from an approaching supply train. She had been checking on it for hours, watching it draw ever closer, and now the lead wagons were just beginning to enter camp. Jagang had been relieved to see the supply train finally arrive. An army as vast as this one required constant supplies of all sorts, but mainly food. Out on the Azrith Plain, there was nowhere for the army to scavenge food. There were no farms, no crops, no herds of livestock. It would take constant resupply from the old world to keep the army alive and building the emperor's ramp up into the sky. After dismounting, the messenger approached and waited patiently. Jagang finally signaled several officers forward along with the man who'd ridden in. The man bowed. Excellency, I come with the supplies the good people from our homeland have sent. Many sacrificed to see to it that our valiant troops have what they need to vanquish the enemy. We can use the supplies, no doubt of that. The men are all working hard, and we need to keep up their strength. Our train also brings some of the Jala Dijin teams that wish to join the tournaments, in the hopes of having the chance to one day play His Excellency's renowned team. What teams are they? Jigang asked absently, as he scanned a manifest the messenger handed him. Most are teams of our soldiers from various divisions. One is the team belonging to the commander of our supply train. To supplement his own men, he has gathered men from the New World along our journey north. He thinks that with such men from the New World on his team, he can provide quite a spectacle for His Excellency's enjoyment. Jagang nodded as he continued to read the list. It will do these heathens good to learn our ways. Jala Dijin is a good way to bring other peoples into our culture and customs. It diverts simple minds from the barren existence we all endure in this meaningless life. The man bowed. Yes, Excellency. Jagang finally finished and looked up. We've been hearing rumors. Is this team with the captives as good as I've heard? They seem to be formidable, Excellency. They have defeated teams that no one thought they could beat. At first it was thought to have been simple luck. No one still thinks it is luck. They have a point man who is said to be the best ever seen. Jagang grunted his skepticism. I have the best on my team. The man bowed in apology. Yes, Excellency, of course you are correct. What word do you bring from our homeland? The man hesitated. Excellency, I am afraid that I must report some unsettling news. As the next supply train that was to follow after ours was assembling down in the old world, it was set upon and destroyed. All the recruits who were to be sent north with the train to reinforce our army, well, I am afraid, Excellency, that they were all killed. Their heads were left on stakes beside the road. The line of stakes stretched from one town to the next. Both towns burned to the ground. A number of cities, along with forests and croplands, are burning. The fires are intense, and when the wind is right, we can smell the smoke even this far north. It is difficult to pin down exactly what is going on, except that the attacks are all reliably reported to be New World soldiers. Jagang glanced at Kalin. She suspected he was looking to see if she would smile like the last time. She didn't need to smile. She could maintain a stony face and rejoice inwardly. She felt like cheering those unknown men far away 
who were beginning to vex Jagang with the damage they were causing. Almost as bad as the damage, rumors were sweeping through the camp. The attacks in their homeland were unsettling the men, who had always considered the old world not just invulnerable to such attack, but invincible as well. As the rumors spread, they grew in weight among the men. Jigang had already executed a number of men for spreading such rumors. Since she had little interaction with the men, most didn't even see her, she didn't know if the executions quelled the rumors, but somehow she doubted it. If the rumors of such things unsettled the soldiers, Kalin could only imagine the fear beginning to grip those in the old world. While their army was away seeking conquest, she imagined that the people back there were largely defenseless. The reports are, Excellency, that these marauders are destroying everything in their path. They burn crops, kill livestock, destroy mills, break dams, ruin every sort of craft producing goods for our noble effort to spread the word of the order. Particularly hard hit are those who give support to our people by teaching them the ways of the order. Those who instill the need to sacrifice for our effort to crush the heathens to the north. Jagang was remaining calm on the outside, but Kalin, as well as the officers watching him, knew that inside he was boiling with rage. Any idea who is going after our teachers, our leaders, any particular unit of the enemy? The man bowed another apology. Excellency, I regret to report that all of our teachers and the brothers who have been murdered trying to teach the ways of the Creator and the Order, well, every one of their corpses was found to be missing a right ear. Jagang's face was red with rage. Kalin could see the muscles in his jaws and temples flex as he gritted his teeth. Do you think it could be those same men who plagued us on our way up into the Midlands, Excellency? One of the officers asked. Of course it is, Jagang roared. I want something done about this, he said, directing his orders to the officers. Do you understand? Yes, Excellency, they all said as one as they bowed their heads and kept them bowed down. I want a stop put to this nuisance. We need those supply trains to continue coming. We're close to ending this war in a great victory. We will not allow our effort to fail. Do you understand? Yes, Excellency, they all said together again, bowing deeper. Then get to it, all of you. As the men all departed to see to their orders, Jagang started marching away out of his compound. Kalin felt the shock of pain from the collar prompting her to keep up with him. Armed men, as always, fell in around Jagang as his royal escort and guard. Chapter 57 Richard watched through the bars covering the small window in the side of his iron cage as the wagon bounced through the sprawling encampment. Reuben, would you take a look at that? John Rock said. Hands gripping the bars, he was grinning like a man on holiday at what he saw. Richard glanced over at his cage mate. Quite the sight, he agreed. Think there's anyone here who can beat us? I expect we'll find out sooner or later, Richard said. I'll tell you, Reuben, I'd like to get a crack at cracking some heads on the Emperor's team. The man gave Richard a sidelong glance. Think if we beat the Emperor's team, they'll let us go home? Are you serious? The man huffed a laugh. It was a joke, Reuben. A poor one, Richard said. I suppose, John Rock said with a sigh. Still, they say the Emperor's team is the best. I'd not like to feel that whip again. Once was enough for me, too. The two of them had shared the iron cage ever since Richard had been captured back in Tamarang. John Rock had already been a captive, taken before Richard. He was a big man, a miller, 
from the southern reaches of the Midlands. Just before the supply train had moved through his little village, soldiers on lead patrol had arrived and thought that, because of his size, John Rock might make a good addition to the team. Richard didn't know John Rock's real name. He'd said everyone just called him John Rock because of his size and how hard his muscles were from carrying sacks of grain. He knew Richard as Reuben Ribnick. Even though John Rock was a fellow captive, Richard didn't think it would be safe to let anyone know his real name. John Rock had told Richard that he'd broken the arms of three of the soldiers trying to capture him before they took him down. Richard said only that they had pointed arrows at him, and so he'd given up. John Rock had appeared slightly embarrassed for what he saw as Richard's lack of metal. Despite his rather goofy, lopsided grin, which he wore often and despite his circumstances, John Rock had a quick wit and an analytical mind. He had come to like Richard, because Richard was the only one who didn't assume he was stupid and didn't treat him as such. John Rock was anything but stupid. He had eventually decided that he'd been wrong about Richard's lack of bravery and had asked to be his right wingman in the Jala games. Wingman was a rather thankless position that exposed him to charges and bruises from the opponents. John Rock saw the value in such a position because it allowed him to break the heads of men from the order, and he was cheered for doing so. Even though he was a big man, John Rock was quick, a combination that made him a perfect man for Richard's right wing. He loved being close to Richard during play, so he could see Richard vent his rage on the Jala field in a way that the other teams didn't expect. Together, the two of them had become a formidable pair on the field. It was never spoken, but they both knew that the other valued the chance to extract a little bit of revenge on those who had captured them. The camp beyond the iron bars seemed to go on endlessly. Richard was sickened to see where they were, out on the Azrith plain around the people's palace. He didn't want to look any more, and sat back down, leaning up against the other side of the box, resting a wrist over his knee as the wagon swayed and bucked through the endless horde. He was relieved that the Daharan forces were long gone, or they would have by now been annihilated for nothing. Instead, those men would by now have had enough time to make it down to the old world. They were probably already laying waste to the place. Richard hoped they stuck to the plan, fast and fierce attacks, keep separated, and hit everywhere in the old world, sparing nothing. He didn't want anyone in the old world to feel safe. There needed to be consequences to the actions that flowed from their beliefs. The men in the camp all watched the wagon train passing among them. It looked to be welcome, probably for the food it brought. Richard hoped they got their fill. Knowing the orders he had given, it was likely to be one of the last supply trains to leave the old world. Without supplies, out on the Azrath Plain, with winter about to descend upon them, Jagang's army was going to find itself unexpectedly falling on hard times. Nearly all the men they passed near to stared into Richard's cage, trying to get a glimpse of him. He expected that there were already rumors spreading through the camp about him and his Jala team. He had learned when they stopped to play teams at army posts along the way that their reputation preceded them. These men were fans of the game and looked forward to the tournaments, especially since there would no doubt be heightened interest because of the arrival of Richard's team, or Reuben's team, as it was informally known. The team really belonged to the commander with the snake face. There was little else to entertain these soldiers other than the women captives. Richard tried not to think about that because it only made him angry and there was nothing he could do about it in his cage. One day, after a particularly violent game that they had won handily, 
John Rock admitted to being confused as to why Richard would have allowed himself to so easily be captured. Richard finally told him the truth of what happened. John Rock at first didn't believe him. Richard told him to ask Snakeface some time. He did and found that Richard was telling the truth. John Rock greatly valued liberty and thought it was worth fighting for. That was when John Rock asked to be Richard's right-wing man. Where Richard had once channeled his rage through the sword of truth, he now channeled it through the Brock and the play of the Jala game. Even his own team, as much as they liked him leading them, to a degree feared him. Except John Rock. John Rock didn't fear Richard. He shared Richard's way of playing as if the game were life or death. For some of their opponents made up of Imperial Order troops who thought too much of themselves, it had been. It was not at all unusual for players, especially opponents of Richard's team, to be seriously hurt or even die during a match. One of the men on Richard's team had died during a game. He'd been hit in the head with the heavy brock when he wasn't looking, it snapped his neck. Richard remembered walking the streets of Aidendril with Kalin, watching children play Jala. He had given out official balls if they would trade in their heavy brocks for the lighter ones Richard had had made up. He didn't want them getting hurt just to play a game. Now all those children had fled Aidendril. This looks like a bad place for us to be, Reuben, John Rock said in a quiet voice as he watched the camp roll past their little window. He sounded uncharacteristically gloomy. A very bad place for us to be slaves. If you think you're a slave, then you are a slave, Richard said. John Rock stared back at Richard for a long moment. Then I'm not a slave either, Reuben. Richard nodded. Good for you, John Rock. The man went back to watching the endless camp pass before his eyes. He had probably never seen the likes of it in his life. Richard remembered his own wonder when he first left his heartland woods to discover what was beyond. Would you look at that, John Rock said in a low voice, staring out through the bar. Richard didn't feel like looking. What is it? A lot of men, soldiers, but not like the rest of the soldiers. These all look the same, better weapons, better organized, bigger. They look fierce. Everyone is making way for them. John Rock looked back over his shoulder at Richard. I bet it's the Emperor come to watch us roll by, come to see the challengers to his team come to the tournaments. From the descriptions I've heard, I bet that fellow being guarded by all those big guards in chain mail is Jagang himself. Richard went back to the small opening to have a look. He gripped the bars as he put his face close to see better as they passed close to the guards and their charge. That looks like it's probably Emperor Jagang, all right, Richard told John Rock. The Emperor was looking the other way watching some of the other Jala teams made up of Imperial Order soldiers. They weren't locked in iron boxes in wagons, of course. Jagang was watching them marching proudly in ranks, carrying banners of their team. And then he saw her. Kalen! She turned toward his voice, not knowing where it was coming from. Richard was gripping the bars hard enough to nearly bend them. Even though she wasn't far, he realized that she probably couldn't hear him over all the noise. Men all around were cheering for the parade of marching teams. Her long hair was tumbled down over her cloak. Richard thought his heart would explode it hammered so hard in his chest. Kalen! She turned more toward him. Their eyes met. He was staring right into her green eyes. When Jagang started to turn around, she immediately turned away, looking off where he was watching. He turned back with her. 
And then she was gone, hidden behind men and wagons and horses and tents, disappearing into the distance. Richard fell back against the wall, gasping. John Rock sat down beside him. Reuben, what's wrong? You look like you've seen a phantom walking among all those men. Richard could only stare his eyes wide as he panted. It was my wife. John Rock let out a hearty laugh. You mean you saw the woman you want when we win? The commander says that if we beat the emperor's team, we'd get to pick one. You see the one you want? It was her. Reuben, you look like a man who just fell in love. Richard realized that his smile felt like it might break his face. It was her. She's alive. John Rock, I wish you could see her. She's alive. She looks exactly the same. Dear spirits, it was Kalen. It was her. I think you'd best slow down your breathing, Reuben, or you're going to pass out before we have a chance to break some heads. We're going to play the Emperor's team, John Rock. We got to win a lot of games first to have that chance. Richard hardly heard the man. He laughed with glee, unable to stop himself. It was her. She's alive. Richard threw his arms around John Rock, hugging him tightly. She's alive. If you say so, Reuben. Kalen carefully controlled her breathing, trying to get her galloping heart to slow down. She couldn't understand why she was so shaken. She didn't know the man in the cage. She had only seen his face briefly as the wagon rolled past. But for some reason, it shook her down to her very soul. The second time the man yelled her name, Jagang acted like he thought he'd heard something. Kalin had turned back around so that he wouldn't suspect anything. She didn't know why that had seemed so desperately important. That wasn't true. She did know why. The man was in a cage. If he knew her, Jagang might have hurt him, even killed him. There was more to it, though. That man knew her. He had to be connected to her past, the past she wanted to forget. But when she had looked into his gray eyes, everything had changed in a heartbeat. Her numb acceptance had shattered. She no longer wanted her past to be buried. She suddenly wanted to know everything. The look in that man's eyes was so profoundly powerful, so filled with something important, something vital, that it drove home to her how important her life was. Seeing the look in his gray eyes, Kalen realized that she had to know who she was. Whatever the consequence, whatever the cost, she had to know the truth. She had to have her life back. The truth was the only way. Jagang's threats of what he would do to her might be a very real consequence, but she suddenly knew that the real danger was that he was intimidating her into abdicating her life her will, her existence, into giving herself over to his control by his threats of what he would do to her once she again knew who she was, he was dictating her life, enslaving her. If she went along with his will, then it was only because she surrendered hers. She couldn't allow herself to think that way. Her life meant more than that. She may be his captive, but she was not his slave. A slave was a state of mind. She was not a slave. She would not surrender her will to him. She would have her life back. Her life was hers alone, and she would have it back. Nothing Jagang could do, nothing he could threaten her with, could take that away from her. Kalin felt a tear of joy roll down her cheek. The man she didn't even remember had just given her the will to take her life back, the fire to live. 
It felt like the first real breath she had taken since she had lost her memory. She only wished she could thank him. Chapter 58 Nietzsche marched through the vast hall of the People's Palace, trailing Kara, Nathan, and a gaggle of guards. Every time someone called Nathan Lord Rall, it set her nerves on edge. She knew it was necessary, but in her heart the only Lord Rall was Richard. She would have given just about anything to see his gray eyes again. Being in the palace made it seem she could almost feel his presence all around her. It was the spell the palace was built around, she supposed. The palace was built in the form of a spell for the Lord Rall. Richard was the Lord Rall, at least in her mind. To be fair, she knew there were others, Kara for one, who felt the same. When she was alone with Kara, which was often, the two of them seemed to share understanding without words being needed. Both shared the same anguish. Both of them wanted Richard back. Kara stepped forward, leading them through a network of small service hallways to an iron stairway up a dark well. Reaching the top, she threw open the door. They were greeted with cold light as they stepped out onto the observation deck. Being right out at the edge of the outer wall, at the edge of the plateau, felt like standing on the edge of the world. Down below, spread like a black taint almost to the distant horizon, was the army of the Imperial Order. See what I mean, Nathan said as he stepped up beside her, pointing out the construction in the distance. It was hard to see at first, but it quickly began to make sense. You're right, she said. It does look like a ramp. Do you think they can actually build a ramp all the way up here? Nathan gazed out at the site, studying it for a moment. I don't know. But I would have to say that if Jigang is going to all the trouble of doing such a thing, it can only be because he has reason to believe that he can accomplish it. If they make it up here with a ramp that broad, Kara said, we're in trouble. More like dead, Nathan said. Nietzsche studied what the men of the order were doing and the distance to the site of the work. Nathan, you're a Rall. This place amplifies your power. You ought to be able to send some wizard's fire down there and blow that thing apart. My thought, too, he said. I suspect that they have sisters down there with shields to prevent anyone up here from doing just that. I've not probed for such defenses, and I've not tried anything yet. I want to wait until they've been at it for quite a while longer to make them feel complacent. Then, when they have some more done and they're closer, and when I finally do hit them, I'll have a better chance of doing some real damage. If I'm able to destroy it now, they won't have lost much. Better to wait until they've already put a great deal more time and work into it. Nietzsche frowned up at the tall prophet. Nathan, you are a very devious man. He smiled a raw smile. I prefer to think of myself as ingenious. Nietzsche went back to surveying the camp out beyond the site of the construction. It was just far enough away to provide their gifted with plenty of time to react to an attack. Nietzsche had spent enough time with Jagang's army to know a great deal about the way they thought. She knew the layers of defenses that Jagang's officers and gifted would place around the army, and some of those gifted were sisters of the dark. Look at that, she said, pointing. It looks like a supply train is just arriving. Nathan nodded. Winter will be here shortly. The army looks like they're not going anywhere, so they will need a lot of supplies to keep all those men alive over the winter. Nietzsche considered what could be done, finally deciding that from where they stood, very little. Well, Richard sent the army south to the old world to attack their supply trains, among other things. Let's hope they're effective and can accomplish the task 
If all those men starved to death, that would solve our problem. In the meantime, I'll devote some thought to what we might be able to do to help them die. She turned away from the depressing view of the encampment and the supply train bringing all those men what they needed to stay and lay siege to the palace. Come on, she said to Nathan. I need to get back, but why don't you show me before I leave? Nathan took them down through the palace by the smaller staff areas rather than the vast halls. It was a quick descent through the stone interior of the palace, taking them ever lower into the dark inner regions beneath the palace that were what most people never saw. There were elegant, if simple, stone halls even in these unseen places. Without elaborate decoration, they were made of polished stone in places and rich woods in others. These were the private corridors used by the Lord Rall and his staff. Nietzsche had come to the people's palace to pay a visit to the Garden of Life. After that, she had checked to see how Berdine was doing in her search for information and how Nathan was getting on. They had wanted to tell her details of their difficulties. She hadn't really wanted to take the time, but she made herself listen patiently. After having again seen the places where the boxes of Orden had been, she had been too distracted to be able to really focus on what they were telling her. This time, she saw the deserted Garden of Life differently, getting a feel for where Dark and Rawl had opened the boxes, for where they had sat. She had studied the position of the room, the amount of light, the angles to various known star charts, in addition to how the sun and moon transverse the place, and the area where the spells had been invoked. Since translating The Book of Life, Nietzsche viewed the Garden of Life in a different way. She saw it through the context of the magic of Orden, and how the room had been used. It had given her a valuable insight into the last place the boxes had been used. Such practical reference had answered some questions she'd had and confirmed some of the conclusions she'd come to. At last, Nathan reached a set of double doors with guards standing before them. She gestured, and the men opened the pair of white doors. Beyond was a wall of white stone that looked as if it had partly melted. "'Have you been in there?' she asked the prophet. "'No,' he admitted. At my age, I try to stay out of tombs as much as I can. Nietzsche stepped over the low ledge at the same time as she ducked through the low opening. Wait here, she said to Kara, who had been about to follow her in. Are you sure? This involves magic. Kara wrinkled her nose as if she had gotten a whiff of sour milk and waited outside along with the prophet. Nietzsche sent a spark of Han into a torch to the side. After all this time, it still lit. She saw then that the huge vaulted room was constructed of pink granite. The floor was white marble. On the walls all around were dozens and dozens of gold vases, each set in the wall beneath a torch. Nietzsche absently counted them. Fifty-seven. It appeared to her to be a number that had meaning. Probably the vases and torches represented the age of the man in the coffin at the center of the room. The place was troubling, and not just because it was a crypt. She trailed her fingers along the symbols cut into the granite walls just beneath the vases. The words that ran around the entire room and around the golden coffin were high to Haran. The inscriptions were instructions from a father to a son on the process of going to the underworld and returning. Quite the legacy. Such spells contained subtractive magic. That was what was causing the walls to melt. Containing them by walling the place over with special stone had slowed the process greatly, but had not halted it entirely. Well, Nathan asked, poking his head in through the melted hole. Any ideas? Nietzsche stepped out, brushing off her hands. I don't know. 
I don't think there's any eminent danger, but this involves dark things, so there's a chance I'm wrong. I think it would be best to shield it behind an invocation of threes. Nathan nodded in thought. You want to do it? Lace it with subtractive? It would be best if you did it. You're a Rahl. That would be more effective. Even if I used subtractive, this in here already has both mixed in. And it was created by a Rahl. Such power could breach any invocation I could create in here under the limitations of the protective spell of the palace. He considered only briefly. I will see to it at once. Nathan cast a look back at the crypt. Any idea what's causing this spell to burn through? Off the top of my head, I'd say it was activated by one of the boxes of Orden having been opened up in the Garden of Life. I suspect they created a sympathetic reaction of some sort. It's not yet active enough for me to tell the purpose of the subtractive element, but the words inscribed on the coffin and walls indicate that the constituent composition in there was intended to be used to aid in the acquisition of the power of Orden. So they act in a harmonic response after having been in the vicinity of that specific power. Nathan nodded in thought. All right. I'll do an invocation of threes and keep my eye on it. I have to get back. I will check back later, just to see if you've had any word from Richard, and to see how the order is getting along out there. Tell Zed that I have everything well in hand, and I have the enemy surrounded. Nietzsche smiled. I'll tell him. On her way through the vast halls of the palace, with Kara at her side, Nietzsche was lost in thought. She was unsure of what to do next. There were troubling problems descending from every direction. Most felt shadowy and ill-defined. There was no one with whom she could really discuss all the things going through her mind. Zed was a help in some of it, while Kara was good to talk to for other things. But Richard was the only one who would be able to grasp the ways in which she was beginning to understand fundamental issues. Richard, in fact, was the one to introduce her to the concept of creative magic. She still clearly remembered that talk with him one night at camp. It was one of the many defining moments with Richard. There were also things Richard needed to know. There were incidents involving him and the boxes of Orden that were troubling, to say the least. In a way, he had built a fire under ingredients that were not merely dangerous, but were beginning to bubble and boil, and could possibly combine on their own in the most insidious ways if action wasn't taken. There were prophecies involved that, not being a prophet, she didn't trust herself to understand. There were other prophecies that she was beginning to think she understood all too well and could not avoid taking into consideration. Primary among those was the prophecy that said, in the year of the cicadas, which this was, when the champion of sacrifice and suffering under the banner of both mankind and the light finally splits his swarm, which Jagang had done, thus shall be the sign that prophecy has been awakened and the final and deciding battle is upon us. Be cautioned, for all true forks and their derivatives are tangled in this mantic root. Only one trunk branches from this conjoined primal origin. This was the time, succeed or fail, all or nothing, the watershed moment that would forever set the course for the future. If Fuer Grisa Ost Drauka does not lead this final battle, then the world, already standing at the brink of darkness, will fall under that terrible shadow. That prophecy she was beginning to see was tangled in the boxes of Orden, but she couldn't quite grasp how. From time to time she felt on the brink of understanding, but she could never quite break through to it. There was something just beneath the surface of that prophecy that she knew was key. At the same time, she felt that events were cascading unrestrained, and she had to do something before those events tumbled out of control. 
With each passing day, she knew that options would continue to close for them. The Sisters of the Dark, having put the boxes in play, had already cut off their ability to use the power of Orden for its intended purpose, to counteract the ignition of the chain fire event. With chain fire contaminated by the chimes, they were rapidly losing the ability to use their gift to correct the damage. There was no telling how much longer any of them would have sufficient control of their gift necessary to be of any use in overcoming any of the obstacles they faced. At the same time, the Book of Life had come to have meaning for her that she could never have imagined. She had also studied several very obscure books Zed had found for her on Ordenic theory. They, too, had added depth to her understanding, but all of that only seemed to open other areas to bigger questions. Startled, Nietzsche halted and looked up. What was that? The bell for devotion, Kara said, looking a little puzzled at Nietzsche's reaction. Nietzsche watched people begin to gather before a nearby square with a pool in the center. The pool, with a large, dark rock set off-center, was opened to the sky. Perhaps we should go to devotion, Kara said. It sometimes helps when you're troubled, and I can tell that you are definitely troubled. Nietzsche frowned at the moored Sith, wondering how she knew that something was troubling her. She supposed that it really wasn't all that hard to tell. I don't have time to go to devotion, Nietzsche said. I have to get back and figure this out. Kara didn't look like she thought that was a good idea. She held a hand out toward the square. Thinking about Lord Rall might help. Thinking about Nathan is not going to do me any good. I don't care if everyone thinks that Nathan is the Lord Rall, Richard is Lord Rall. Kara smiled. I know, that's what I meant. She took Nietzsche by the arm, drawing her toward the pool. Come on. Nietzsche stared at the woman as she was being dragged along and then said, I suppose it couldn't hurt to stop for a short time to think about Richard. Kara nodded, looking somehow very wise at that moment. People respectfully made way for the moored Sith as she strode up to a spot near the pond. Nietzsche saw that there were fish gliding through the dark waters. Before she knew it, she was kneeling with Kara, putting her forehead to the floor. Master Rall, guide us, the crowd began chanting in one voice. Master Rall, teach us. Master Rall, protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we are sheltered. In your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are yours. Nietzsche added her voice to the others, and together they lifted to reverberate through the halls. The words Master Rall and Richard seemed indistinguishable to her. They were one in the same. Almost against her will, Nietzsche's turbulent thoughts quieted as she softly chanted the words along with everyone else. Master Rao, guide us. Master Rao, teach us. Master Rao, protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we are sheltered. In your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are yours. She lost herself in the words. The sunlight was warm on her back. The next day was the first day of winter, but inside Lord Rao's palace the sun was warm, much like up in the Garden of Life. It seemed odd in that Darken Rao and his father Panis were the Lord Rao before, making this place the seat of evil. She realized, though, that the place was only that, a place. The man was what mattered. The man made the defining difference. The man set the tone that others followed, either rightly or wrongly. In a way, the devotion was the formal statement of that concept. Master Rao, guide us. Master Rao, teach us. Master Rao, protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we are sheltered. In your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are yours. Those words reverberated in Nietzsche's mind. 
she missed Richard so much. Even though his heart belonged to someone else, she just missed seeing him, seeing his smile, talking to him. If that was all she could ever have, that was enough to sustain her, just his friendship, his value in her life, and hers in his. Just Richard being happy, being alive, being Richard. Our lives are yours. Nietzsche abruptly rose up on her knees. She understood. Puzzled, Kara frowned up at her as everyone else chanted. What's wrong? Our lives are yours. She knew what she had to do. Nietzsche stood in a rush. Come on, I have to get back to the keep. As they ran together through the halls, Nietzsche could hear the whispering sound of voices rising up together to echo reverently through the vast corridors. Master Rao, guide us. Master Rao, teach us. Master Rao, protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we are sheltered. In your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are yours. Nietzsche felt herself lost in words that suddenly had meaning for her that they had never had before. She understood how it all fit together at last and knew what she had to do. Zed rose from his chair at the desk in the little room when he saw Nietzsche standing in the doorway. The lamplight softened his familiar face. Nietzsche, you're back. How are things at the People's Palace? Nietzsche hardly heard the question. Answering it, was beyond her. Zed stepped closer, concern settling in his hazel eyes. Nietzsche? What's wrong? You look like a phantom come to haunt the halls. She had to force herself to speak. Do you trust Richard? Zed's brow drew down. What kind of question is that? Do you trust Richard with your life? Zed gestured with one arm. Of course. What's this about? Do you trust Richard with everyone's life? Zed gently gripped her arm. Nietzsche, I love that boy. Please, Zed, do you trust Richard with everyone's life? The concern in his eyes overspread his face, deepening the creases. He finally nodded. Of course I do. If there was ever anyone I would trust with my life, or the life of anyone, it would be Richard. After all, I'm the one who named him to be Seeker. Nietzsche nodded as she turned. Thank you, Zed. He lifted his robes a little as he hurried after her. Do you need some help with something, Nietzsche? No, she said. Thank you. I'm fine. Zed at last nodded, taking her word for it, and returned to the book he was studying. Nietzsche walked through the halls of the keep without seeing them. She moved as if following an invisible glowing line to her destination, the way Richard said he could follow the glowing lines of a spell form. Where are we going? Kara asked, rushing to follow behind. Do you trust Richard? Trust him with your life? Of course, Kara said, without an instant of hesitation. Nietzsche nodded as she continued on. She passed corridors, intersections, rooms, and stairs without really seeing them. In a daze of purpose, she finally reached the hardened area of the keep and the grand room where the verification web had nearly taken her life. She would have died had it not been for Richard, he insisted on finding a way to save her when no one else believed it could be done. She trusted Richard with her life, and her life was very precious to her, thanks to him. At the double doors, Nietzsche turned to Kara. I need to be alone. But I... This involves magic. Oh, Kara said. Well, all right then. I'll just wait out here in the hall in case you need anything. Thank you, Kara. You're a good friend. 
I never had any real friends, friends really worth having, until Lord Rao came along. Nietzsche smiled a little. I never had anything worth living for until Richard came along. Nietzsche closed the double doors. Behind her, the two-story windows flickered with lightning. Nietzsche didn't know if she had ever been in that room when there wasn't a storm. Now the whole world was caught in a storm. When the lightning flashed, the room lit with the harsh glare. There was one thing in the room, however, that did not register the touch of even such intense light. It waited like death itself. Nietzsche laid the Book of Life open on the table before the inky black box of Orden sitting in the center of the table. It seemed that every time the lightning tried to ignite, that black box swallowed the light before it could really get started. Staring at it was like looking into forever. Nietzsche invoked the first spell calling forth darkness to match the impossible blackness of the grim box sitting before her. She reminded herself that, like the people's palace, it was the person who defined it. With a thunderclap of power filling the room, the door was barred. No one could enter. The containment field of the windows no longer mattered. She had conjured something more powerful. The room was silent and pitch black, Nietzsche's vision came from the powers she had called forth. She spoke the words written on the next page, invoking the next spell that opened the pathway for the governing formulas. She used a sliver of subtractive magic to void a razor-thin piece of flesh at the tip of her finger and used the blood that began to ooze to begin drawing the diagrams needed before the box of Orden. As more blood ran from the open wound, she drew a containment field around the box itself. It was something like the field of the room, but on a much more intense scale. Without being contained first, such power as was liberated from the box of Orden could unintentionally breach the veil, but in a way that would kill only the person attempting what Nietzsche was attempting. Almost not needing to read the book that she had been studying for what seemed half her life, she went on to the equations involving the time of year, the first day of winter. Once that was completed, she drew the two opposing symbols and the joint of the apex from the proper charts in blood. It went on, one intense formula after another for the next hour, with calculations bringing the resultant layer of magic forth to be folded into the next step. Each node in the book required that only the appropriate level of power be applied. At each spot, Nietzsche let it flow forth without reservation. There was no other way. As the night wore on, the lines of the spell built around the box in some ways, like the chain fire verification web, with lines that glowed green. But others were a pure white, while yet others were constructed of subtractive elements, and they were blacker than black, looking like nothing so much as voids in the world where the lines belonged, like slits looking into the underworld. When Nietzsche completed the last incantation, she finally heard the whisper of Orden itself, confirmation that she had done everything properly. Yet it was not so much a voice as a force that formed the concept in her mind. The power is open, it whispered through the darkness, in words that felt like ice cracking. I call upon this time, this place, this world, to turn with this play of the boxes of Orden. Name the player. Nietzsche placed her hands on the dead black box before her. The player is Richard Rall, she said. Heed his will. Do his bidding if he proves worthy. Kill him if he does not. Destroy us all if he fails us. It is done. 
From this moment forward, The Power of Orden is in play by Richard Rahl. Prophecy said, If where Grisa Ost Drauka does not lead this final battle, then the world, already standing at the brink of darkness, will fall under that terrible shadow. Nietzsche had come to realize that if Richard was to win, he must be the one leading them in this final battle. The only way to lead was for him to have the boxes in play. In that way, he truly would be the fulfillment of prophecy, Fuer Grisa Ost Drauka, the bringer of death. Prophecy said that they had to follow Richard, but it was more than prophecy. Prophecy only expressed the formality of what Nietzsche knew, that Richard embodied the values that promoted life. They weren't really following prophecy. Prophecy was following Richard. This was the ultimate following of Richard, following him in what he did with the boxes of Orden, in what he did with life and death itself. This was the ultimate test of who he was, who he would be, who he would become. Richard himself had named the terms of the engagement when he spoke to the Daharan troops, telling them how the war would be fought from now on, all or nothing. This could be no different. It now truly was all or nothing. Ulyssia and her sisters of the dark had likewise opened the gateway to the power of Orden. The struggle was now truly in balance. If Nietzsche was right about Richard, and she knew she was, then two forces now properly were engaged in the struggle that would decide it all. If where Grisa Ost Drauka does not lead this final battle, then the world already standing at the brink of darkness will fall under that terrible shadow. They had to trust in Richard in that struggle. For that reason, Nietzsche had to put the boxes of Orden into play in Richard's name, the Sisters of the Dark no longer were the exclusive arbiters of the power of Orden. In that sense, Nietzsche had just put Richard into play, giving him the ability to win this struggle. Without what she had just done, he could not win, much less survive. Nietzsche seemed to drift in a world apart. When she finally opened her eyes, the storm had ended. The first rays of light were just touching the windows. It was dawn on the first day of winter. Richard had one year to open the correct box. Everyone's life was now in his hands. Nietzsche trusted Richard with her life. She had just entrusted everyone's life to him. If she couldn't trust Richard, then life wasn't worth living. Be sure to look for the next and concluding book in the Sword of Truth series. End of Phantom, The Sword of Truth, Book 10, by Terry Goodkind.